Because of the support of these agencies and institutions, uh, make it the program that brought me here. Uh, the, the initiative called King Reef and Rivok, uh, who also supported the uh, funded the symposium. Milejek, La Région Occitanie, and Iade, all uh, supporting us for for promoting this event. I would like to give special thanks for Make It. Uh, Make It is a program from the University of Montpellier that brought me here to develop uh, an experimental project together with my host, David Carrasco. And uh, due to this uh, project being funded, we are here, uh, able, um, we were able to promote this event. So thank you, Make It, for this great opportunity to spend these five months in Montpellier, which has been lovely. And then I would like to also thank IRD at Nivejik, uh, the unit of IRD uh, where, where, where I work, I'm working in IRD. It's very complex to, to, to say who it belongs because it belongs to many agencies. Uh, thank you very much, Frederic, for, for being always available. It's been a great pleasure to share this time in, with, with the Nivejik team. I have some announcements for you today. Uh, first, and very important, we need that all speakers bring their presentations, their slides to the front desk in the, post, uh, in the coffee and lunch breaks so that we make sure that we will start our activities in time. Um, we um, will record this symposium to make uh, this available for people in other time zones. We have around 98, I think, participants that are watching or are going to watch this symposium from abroad. And uh, we are considering that this is a, a good idea so that they can watch the talks in, in proper daylight hours. So if you have an issue with this and you don't want your presentation to be recorded, please let us know uh, beforehand. Uh, the slides need to be delivered to the front desk, so we cannot use another computer. We need uh, you to bring your slides in a pen drive and to transfer them to this computer. Uh, this is a PC, so please use PPT or PDF formats so that we don't have formatting issues. Um, we have given you badges so that the intention is to facilitate uh, recognition and, and exchanges. But uh, we ask you to give them back at the end of the event so that we can reuse them in future events. And uh, for poster authors, please ignore this. You need to bring your posters and give them to the, I mean, in the corner outside so that uh, they will be hanged for you. And last but not least, uh, there are still a few, very few slots for the get together because there were some last minute cancellations that we were expecting to participate in the uh, social get together tomorrow in the evening. So if you did not register and you still think that you want to register, please do so as soon as possible. The program starts today with, uh, well, this uh, welcome talk, and then we will have session one, which is focusing on the Anthropocene uh, and the effects, the impacts it has uh, on diverse aspects of vector behavior and insect behavior in general. Uh, this will include talks by Vincent Corbel, Magali Poffi, and Florence Fournet. Then we will have a coffee break and go get to session two, uh, which is about mosquito non blood feeding as a target for uh, behavior manipulation, with talks by Thierry Lefebvre, uh, uh, Rick Eginel, and Sharon Hill. And then we will have lunch outside in the corridor, uh, which will be offered uh, during uh, an hour and a half. And then in the afternoon, we will meet again here for uh, the session number three, which is uh, uh, dedicated, will be dedicated to host related targets for behavior manipulation with talks by Marieke Despard. I hope, I hope I'm pronouncing the name, your names properly, Craig Montel and Paul Garrity. Then a coffee break, and then session number three continues with 
talks by Niels Verhulst, Manuela Carnaghi, and Romina Barroso. And then we will have the poster session at the end of the first day, and there will be a reception and some drinks and snacks to, to promote uh, yeah, a social gathering. Tomorrow, we will have, um, uh, we will start also start at nine. Well, also, we will start at nine uh, uh, with uh, session number four. Uh, dedicated to vector control and features that modulate that vector behavior. And this will include talks by Carlo Constantini, Aman Omondi, and Liz Roy. And this is a change in the uh, schedule. And we had to do that because we had, uh, this week, we had four last minute cancellations, uh, three of which though, will be presented virtually. Uh, so we had to change this schedule so that the presenters can give their talks in daylight hours in their home country because they all they are all from the United States of America. So they will these talks will be uh, concentrated at the end of the event. The second session of tomorrow, session number five, will be focused on male behavior. So it's entitled "Behavioral Targets for Vector Manipulation: Males Matter." And it is, uh, it is including talks by Nadia Melo, Lionel Fouget, and myself, uh, Marcelo Lorenzo. And then we will have an earlier lunch tomorrow uh, at 12. And then at 1.30, we will start with the, uh, thank you, with the um, session number six, which is dedicated to repellents. Uh, so we, this session will have talks by Nicoletta Faraone, David Carrasco and Chris Potter, who will not make it here. I mean, he, he did not make it here, so he will present virtually. And then a coffee break, and then uh, a session dedicated to oviposition as a target for behavior manipulation with talks by Eviata Sal Shalom, Catherine Mosquera, and Gideon Wasserberg, who will also present his talk virtually because he couldn't make it to Montpellier. And then we will finish with a, uh, a talk that is uh, focused on the corporate experience. So it will be Agenor Mafraneto, also presenting virtually from California. Um, he will speak about the development of commercially viable semi-chemical tools and strategies. He is the president of ISCA Technologies, and he will share with us his experience with uh, transforming knowledge and behavior into products that can help uh, control pests. And then we will close the event with a debate on behavior, vector control, and the world health perspective with, uh, particip with the participation of Jiro and Spitzen and Didier Fontenay. So that's the program. Then we invite all of you to join us tomorrow at the end of the day to take the tram and go to the medieval district and have some drinks together. We invite you to, to have an apéro at a uh, uh, wine tasting a bar in downtown Montpellier. And now I will give the word, pass the word to Patrick Caron, who is the director of Make It. The one we have to adapt. This is about uh, adaptation and resilience. I'm quite sure you will talk about uh, the whole day. Well, I will not be, be too much long because I know that you did not come to listen to me and to listen to institutional issues, but just to share some very short information with you, or very short thoughts uh, with you. Uh, first of all, welcome, as I said, we are very happy to, to have you. Make It is an institute of advanced studies, and we had the privilege and honor to welcome and to host uh, Marcelo for five months and very usually when uh, we welcome and call someone like Marcelo, the visiting scientist, we ask her or him to organize uh, an event during his or her stay here. This is one of our general rules. It's not just necessary to, to make uh, the buzz or advertisement, but no, the reason is that <coughs> Uh, it's very common now, you know, that uh, visiting scientists can move from one university to another one, but we, don't, we just don't want to have them in a, in a bubble. Uh, and uh, on, on the contrary, we want them 
to take advantage of the, their stay here. So Marcelo from Brazil to, to Montpellier to uh, connect, to organize a connection that could uh, then uh, be generate new initiatives, new projects. This is the intention of such a, an event to, to make sure that first of all, <clears throat> Marcelo is not just with a group of uh, visiting scientists, but embedded in the Montpellier landscape. So thanks to, to me, Bejek, and uh, to the mixed research unit for, for doing that. Thanks to uh, the team, uh, the team Reeve, and, and uh, I'm quite sure you will know, for those who do not yet know about what is Mivejek and, and uh, Reeve and Rivok, I'm quite sure you will have time to discuss. So I will not do that now. But uh, the, the first assumption is to have visiting scientists like uh, Marcelo, but to make sure that they are inserted in the Montpellier landscape and in the same time they take advantage of this stay here to connect. And this is exactly what it is about, uh, what it is about today. The second assumption of uh, the, the Make It Montpellier Advanced Knowledge Institute for Transition is the fact that at the level of Montpellier, well, if you ask a, a, a French professor or researcher to explain the, the way the French landscape is organized, he will begin to say, oh, that's very complicated. Uh, it's as complicated as having 365 cheese in, in the country. So I will not do that now. It's <laughs> cheesy for tonight, but it's for tasting, not necessarily for understanding everything. But uh, what what uh, uh, we we have here in Montpellier is 16 institutions since 2017 coming together and trying to work together. Be there schools, universities, or research institutions. And this is what MUSE, you saw the logo, is about. Mm -hmm. MUSE is Montpellier University of Excellence. So it's, a, it's um, an alliance of 16 institutions led by the University of Montpellier. And the specificity of that, it has to, to, to deal with three interconnected society challenges. Feed, protect, care. So agriculture, food, environment, and health. And what uh, Marcelo is suggesting and this event is exactly at the, at the crossroad of those challenges. So I know that people working with mosquitoes or with vectors usually think that vectors and mosquitoes are the same, which is the most important in life and in the world. It happens with all disciplines, it happens with all, all topics. I, I, I perfectly do understand that. But what is important here is to connect what you are working with on mosquitoes uh, and, and, uh, and vector-borne diseases with those three challenges. And, and this is what news is about, what make it is about, and what is uh, the idea of such uh, such a symposium and such events. And the third assumption, so number one is uh, about uh, connecting between researchers. Number two is about embedding mosquitoes and vector borne disease in the society challenges. Number three is uh, an assumption made by Make It, Montpellier Advanced Knowledge Institute and Transition, that we do not know and we oppose most of the knowledge. So it's not an event, such an event is not just to present what you already know, it's especially to challenge what you don't know. What are the controversies? What are the knowledge frontiers for the future? Uh, and uh, and this is what it is mainly about, with the assumption of the institute that looking at controversies is the best way to support decision making, and bringing together divergent views is the best way to uh, look at the future and the uncertainty of the future, like moving from one theater to the to the other one. Uh, 
So with <coughs> those three assumptions, uh, I, I really regret I can't stay with you because I saw some titles and it, it looks very exciting. This week is quite a busy one in Montpellier because you all know you will face that. We we have uh, we we will all go on vacations and uh, and there is a board meeting of the university today that is the CIRAD and we're meeting about uh, five lots of events. I wish I could stay with you and listen to and um, attend this exciting program. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you, uh, Fred. Thank you, Didier, for all the support. And thank you also to the making team who made it possible. So, Marianne here and uh, Brenda and Tara. I don't know if she will come, but thank you to them to make it possible. I, I really hope you will enjoy it here <laughs> and in, in the medieval part at the Apple time. Thank you so much for coming. Hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, well, again, Eric Rascal, the, the chair of this session. I'm very, very happy to have you all here and those uh, that are behind the screen as well. Uh, it's a pleasure to me, uh, or for me, to introduce uh, the first speaker of the, of the day, one of this impression. Uh, his name is Marcel Cobel. He works at the Research, uh, research Institute of Sustainable development uh, here at the unit of Novacek, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the importance of mosquitoes in public health. This is on So remember, it goes 20 minutes. It should be working. Can you, can you check this? Yes. Uh, and the yes. laser is working. We have, we have to agree about the uh, lights. Do you think the light is? Oh, I don't know if the ladder is working well, actually. Yeah, you know which one? Okay, good morning to everyone. This one? Okay, so my name is Jensen Corbel, I'm a research professor at IED, as David said. I'm also uh, coordinating the Wind Network, which is network aiming to track and combat insecticide resistance in vectors of emerging arboviruses. And I'm very pleased to be with you today. We'd like to thank, uh, of course, Marcello, David, for giving, giving me the opportunity to make a talk on insecticide resistance, especially to talk about the challenge and prospects for the control of these insecticide resistance mosquito vectors. That's causing an increasing public health uh, problem. Okay. We have to share it via Zoom so that people All right. can follow. No problem. Okay, uh, so as I am first presenter, I think important to remind that mosquito is not just an animal. Actually, it is the world's deadliest animals in, on Earth. Uh, as you know, because it's transmitting a lot of pathogens to humans and is responsible for more than 700,000 deaths every year. And actually, that guy, just this Hanopheles uh, mosquitoes, is responsible for more than 600,000 deaths just by transmitting five different species of plasmodium to the humans. And as you can see uh, here, it's a map that has been developed by the Wind Network showing the global overlap distributions of mosquito-borne diseases on Earth. Uh, and uh, you can see here on the map from near no transmission or autochthonous transmission to the seven diseases that can be transmitted by mosquitoes that on Earth, 80% of the world is at risk of one, at least one or more mosquito transmitted diseases. And it's reached 50% of the world if we include two, at least two mosquito borne diseases. So uh, you also understand with this, uh, these maps that uh, vector control play a pivotal step in the prevention and control of mosquito borne diseases because, of course, it's a tool that can be deployed in multiple settings and to target multiple uh, diseases transmitted by mosquitoes. So briefly, as you know, there is key uh, vector control tools that are recommended by WHO for the fight against mosquitoes, including many LNNs, indoor residual spraying, larviciding, or spray spray. And uh, the problem that first we face is the very limited number of chemical classes that can be used uh, against mosquitoes. And most, uh, the, the second challenge is most of the insecticide use share the same mode of action. I 
GPT, for example, target the sodium channel in mosquitoes that are used in different kinds of application. Organophosphate and carbamates target the acetyl cholinist erases, also same mode of actions. Uh, Yeah, uh, okay, so uh, we also have IGR, we also have some toxin coming from the bacterium, but more or less the problem, one problem is very few mode of action. So the issue with vector control and chemical based vector control intervention, there is fewer investments in new chemistries. And why is the problem? That's the vector control markets represent a very low profit, very low investments returns compared to the agricultural pests, for example, if we take here, the, the, the market for crop protections is about $50 billion, while the top control represents only $1 billion. So we don't have new insecticide. Most of the insecticide we have are repurposed insecticide that's coming from agriculture. And so the consequence has been a strongly reduction of number of US and EU research-based companies in uh, investing in the development of chemistry. So, uh, in conclusion, it's very simple. The problem is more and more insecticide resistance uh, mosquito species and less and less new insecticides uh, for the control. So, this consequence, this use of the same insecticide for decades, of course, has contributed to the development of mosquitoes that is now recognized as an important uh, problem for the prevention of um, um, mosquito borne disease. And there is clearly a need to uh, develop some insecticide resistance breaking action. Just uh, to overlap the dynamic of insecticide resistance for people that are not very familiar with resistance. In 2000, in Anopheles mosquito, you can see here in red, the presence of resistance uh, species at that time. Why uh, yellow points is recent suspected, while green is susceptible population. You can see just in five year times, 10 year times, 15, the increasing number of reports of insecticide resistance in Anopheles mosquito. And we have now resistance to insecticide found in at least 84 countries with ongoing transmissions. And you can see that most of the resistance population are in Africa, where the burden of malaria is also the highest. If we make a parallel with the Aedes mosquito that transmits arborvirus diseases, the same problem. In 2000, very few reports of resistance. And with the time, you can see very strong increase of insecticide resistance that is now present in about 60 countries, mainly in, South, in Latin America and Southeast Asia, where also the burden of arborvirus is also the strongest. So this, of course, is a problem of public health, but it also shows that the mosquitoes are uh, facing an increasing, uh, increasing selection pressure by insecticide, but not only. So clearly, Resistance in terms now of genetics, what is what we call genetic uh, resistance, is any change in an insect that will increase its ability to withstand uh, or to overcome the effect of one or more insecticides. So that means a mosquito has something that is different than the others, like for example, this one, a mosquito with a red mess that will be able to survive in a specific environments while the other one will die. Okay, so it's clearly a genetic irritability trait. That with the mosquito that is resistant will survive and then will reproduce until it will be dominant in the population. For example, if we take this resistance mosquito, it can come in population by a genetic mutation, a mutation, or by migration in the population. If you use insecticide, what will happen? Then little by little, you will have generation by generation the mosquito that will survive until it becomes of course, uh, dominant in the population. However, it's a bit more complex than that because there is actually some biological genetics and operational factors that can favor the selection of resistance or impairing the selection of resistance. For example, in red is all factors playing a role in the selection. We don't see really well the, this figure, I'm sorry, but it's clearly that resistance will evolve more quickly with short generation time, high fecundity, if the resistance is dominant, monogenic, and if there is also a genetic flow because resistance will also be able to spread more in new population. There are also some factors impairing selection of resistance, long generation, time, low fecundity of the population, if the gene has a high fitness cost, uh, if the gene is multigenic, resistance is multigenic, and this has, there are some genetic constraints. It's a case of the acetylcholinesterase in a mosquito that's necessary 
double mutation to get the resistance. So this is some, an example. Uh, in terms also very important operational factors, of course, the use of insecticide will contribute to increased section pressure. Why, if we establish insecticide resistance strategy, we can try to counteract this kind of problem. Just to understand now, in terms of uh, physiological aspect of insecticide work, as you know, insecticide before killing an insect need to penetrate, uh, to go in contact with the insect, penetrates into the body. Then, before it can reach uh, the, uh, the target, it needs to escape with the detoxification and excretion system until it can reach to the target site and then kill the insect. So, resistance will come to any mechanism that will be able to block one of these actions. First one, you, you know it well in this, in this room, is the behavioral resistance, where mosquitoes will escape the contact with insecticide. And as you know, we have increasing evidence uh, of behavioral resistance, that the mosquito will change the horse feeding, beating pattern after introduction of vector control tools, especially LLINs. Even we don't really know the mechanism behind it's something that will be discussed during this meeting. There is also increased cuticular resistance, where a mosquito is able to change the composition or the fitness of the cuticle, then resisting to insecticide. And we also have more and more examples about uh, critical resistance, for example, in uh, uh, Gambier, where there is an increased uh, fitness due uh, to a higher content of hydrocarbon in the cuticle due to this overexpression, for example, of some gene, particular protein, or P450s. Uh, very important mechanism of resistance, increased detoxification due to different kinds of enzymes. There is more than 300 different genes, uh, P450s, esterases, and GST that scan uh, detoxify the insecticide. Some are also known to sequester the insecticide, some mutation as transferase, for example. And last but not least, change the mutation in the gene coding for the target of the insecticide. So you can see that it's quite complex and all of these genes can be present um, in the same mosquito, so a very, very high level of resistance. Something that is probably of importance we don't see the title actually, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, here is a uh, the, the, the selection question. Clearly, you can see here all the environmental factors that can contribute to increase the level of insecticide resistance in mosquitoes. Of course, the use of insecticides for agriculture and vector control, and now more evidence of domestic use, is clearly the, the first selection pressure, increasing the level of resistance by increasing the detoxification and target site, uh, target site uh, uh, mutation in the mosquito. However, you can see that the, there are other uh, factors that also contribute to increased resistance. Of course, <laughs> natural xenobiotics, you know, uh, plants uh, uh, can release allochemicals, some plant toxin, uh, alkaloids, terpenoids, that share similar properties that some insecticide and the pyrethroid are known to also impact on the detoxification system. Uh, we also know that the pollutants or xenobiotic fine environment, we'll see some examples, are also uh, interfering and stimulating uh, the induction of detoxification gene that can also detoxify the insecticide. So this is also a problem. And the microbiome, I think we'll have some presentation as well, is known to clearly impact also on the, the phenotype and, and um, the resistance system. We know, for example, that infection with some Wolbachia microsporidae can increase the susceptibility of the mosquito to insecticide, for example. But in, in the other hand, some bacteria in the, the, the gut of the mosquito uh, are able to metabolize the insecticide. And we have example in Anopheles albumanus in Latin America, where the more resistance mosquitoes have higher bacteria able to detoxify organophosphorite. So also very complex in terms of, of selection pressure. And I wanted to just give some example uh, about the impact of xenobiotics. Historically, uh, in Africa, we know that the highest level of resistance in malaria vector were found in um, um, in, in area of uh, where agriculture is present. And clearly, there were, for example, here in Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina, there was a very good correlation about the frequency of KDR allelic frequency and resistance to parietary and the cotton production area here. And for just to give you an example, one year of use of insecticide for the cotton uh, crop protection represents 15 years of insecticide use during the open circles control program in Africa. So you can see that it's really huge. Uh, actually, 
or insecticide, but you're not in all things, herbicides, fungicides used as part of insecticide crop protection are known to impact on the detoxification process. For example, there is a re really recent study show that when you make a pre-exposure of the mosquito larvae to an agricultural chemical mixture of subletal, uh, those of an agricultural mixture used in Côte d'Ivoire, you will increase the tolerance of mosquito to Clotalidin, which is insecticide used in pubic health, and to a lesser extent delta -nitri. And when you do that, uh, you also see a, a strong increase of the, uh, some gene involved in detoxification of the insecticide uh, compared to the mosquito, the same population that are not being pre exposed to uh, this uh, mixture. So clearly, exposure to agricultural chemical mixture increase a certain number of genes. And here in this case, it was 80. Uh, cuticular protein that were more expressed uh, after this kind of exposure. Something interesting in Africa, so we have seen that Anopheles zombie were able to breed, to rear in really polluted area, for example, in, a, in petroleum spillage, uh, which is quite really abnormal for this kind of mosquito that like in really clear water. And uh, we clearly see that this mosquito collected in this kind of breeding cell were also highly resistant to parietry. They have also a really strong detoxification system. And when we bring back this mosquito in the lab, uh, and we compare with uh, our this resistance mosquito to laboratory susceptible strain, we show that only these high resistance uh, mosquitoes were able to lay eggs in polluted and oil uh, drilling site, and only resistance mosquitoes were able to survive in this kind of thing. So there's clearly a cross induction of uh, some detoxification gene that xenobiotics that also help mosquitoes to survive. And finally, just as a final example, not only insecticide, not only oil, but different kinds of pollutants, like for example, EV metals, but also we have atrazine and <coughs> so that, are known to increase the tolerance of the mosquito to insecticide using pubic health. So clearly, uh, there is really uh, this problem of, uh, of uh, cross induction of of detoxification gene by both insecticide and all pollutants. Just a word on uh, the impact, also on resistance. What is the, the impact? I think the, stri the most striking example of the impact, and especially epidemiological e evidence uh, of uh, malaria control failure due to parietal resistance is coming from Africa, especially in this region. Uh, you can see that historically, DDT has been used for years uh, for controlling uh, malaria uh, in these countries. But starting from uh, 1996, they switched to parachutes for the for malaria control. And starting from this point, they start seeing strong increase of uh, of malaria cases. And uh, clearly, at that stage, they decided to change to revert back to uh, DDT for higher rates, of course, mm -hmm. the residual spraying. And then they observed 90 percent reduction of malaria cases. So this was the first and clear example that when they have resistance. Uh, especially in this mosquito, the face, uh, Funestus uh, was resistant to parietary. You can get uh, vector control failure. Uh, actually, this, we don't have uh, any example of vector of, 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 of uh, epidemiological failure due to LLIN so far. But all the randomized control trials that were conducted in Africa and in India didn't clearly show that resistance can um, prevent the protection conferred by mosquito nets so far. Uh, for dengue and arbovirus disease, is also not very clear. There is no epidemiological evidence for arbovirus, but there is some really a surprising relationship between insecticide resistance, vector control failure, and outbreaks. For example, in Zika in Brazil during the epidemic of Zika in 2016, it was quite surprising to see that the case where we had a really a higher microcephaly incidence in the northeast was also the area where the mosquito were the highest, uh, uh, showed the highest resistance to the PMFO that was used um, at that time for mosquito control. Same example in Italy, you know that there's uh, two outbreaks of chikungunya in 2017 seven and 2017, uh, with 200 total cases in this region of Emilia Romana and 500 cases here in Lazio. And surprisingly, it's also the area where uh, the Albides albopictus is also resistant to parietric due to carrier mutation. So we don't know if it is the resistance causing this or if because of cases you use more and more insecticide for control. But clearly, 
this show that every time you uh, have um, uh, some resistance, uh, this can be a problem. Just to say that beyond epidemiological impact, we have a lot, a lot of examples where resistance can impact on, uh, on the most on ontological control. <laughs> for example, evidence for reducing uh, personal protection of LNIN, reducing duration of larval treatment, reducing the insecticide activity of peripheral spray spray, for this control. It can shorten the duration of insecticide residual application, reduce also the efficacy of phosphorus. So this is just some example that uh, that's when you have resistance, the entomological impact is uh, is reduced uh, for the control. Something now important to finish this presentation to understand is clearly that resistance can be managed if action is taken early. And and the problem is that in the past, uh, we always wait the last moment when we have very high level of resistance that we decided to do something which is probably too late. And why it's too late is probably because of this kind of theory of the, ty of the, the, typing, the typing points. As you know, how it's work at the beginning when the resistance is present at a very uh, low frequency, you cannot detect it in the population, and the resistance will, will um, develop at each generation, but since it's very low, for example, one in 10 millions, you cannot detect it and it does not, not pose any problem of, for vector control. But after several kind of um, generation, of course, the frequency is increasing. You can now start detected, detected by the molecular techniques we have. We can detect uh, the resistance and probably, uh, and we know that if we do nothing, starting from here, the resistance may increase if we don't do anything. And it's normally clearly the time to implement some higher M in order to prevent further spread of resistance before it is there. If not, what's going on? We arrive to a typing point, which is actually a point where resistance we know from here can increase extremely rapidly in the population. For example, if a gene is present at 2% only, here and it's doubling at generation, in only six generation, it may be fixed in the population. Of course, we will be able to detect it, but it will be too late to do anything once the gene is fixed in the population. So this is just uh, to, to highlight that the, the IRM is really important to do at early stage. So what to do to prevent uh, the spread? Actually, uh, there is no really magic bullets. Uh, the first things to do probably, and that has been done, is the rational use of existing insecticide. And what has been used so far is to use the uh, uh, insecticide with unrelated mode of action in different space or in time. In using rotation, we alternate the insecticide, we switch every year the insecticide. It can be a mosaic, we put the insecticide in different places, it can be a mixture where we do two insecticides in one combination uh, uh, to try to slow down the, uh, the evolution of resistance. But actually, there are really few examples or uh, really a success story in terms of insecticide resistance management. One which is really well known is the OCP program, where the rotation of seven insecticides of different mode of action could maintain the susceptibility of similar nausea in West Africa. And that was really clearly an example that when we do something at early stage, this can work. Very few examples in mosquitoes, to be honest, of success story. The only big trial that has been done was in Mexico, even of Alimanus, and they just showed that when they use the rotation of insecticide of OP, carbamate, and parachuride, the evolution of parachuride, uh, they could just slow down the evolution of parachuride resistance compared to a mosaic or to the single use of insecticide. But it is, uh, to me, the, the very few examples we have of, uh, of uh, IRM in, in the field. Uh, just, I think I will finish on, on this slide. Uh, beyond the use of insecticide, of course, as you know, there is a lot of new vector control uh, products in the back, actually, and, and there are the double vector evaluation to be deployed in the field. And as part of WIN, we have tried to develop a review to try to assess beyond the public health impact of each tools and beyond, uh, of course, the strengths and weaknesses of, of each tool, try to see the impact that each kind of these kind of strategies can have on anticipate action on resistance mitigation. 
And actually, we put some uh, score H with high impacts for resistance management, where D is dependent on the model action. So just to finish on that one, uh, what is new? It's not really new, but actually, you just have to know that there is new insecticide coming in the market, or use of combination uh, of insecticide on that, for example, mixing with <coughs> synergies, or mixing with profilapy, which is a key roller, show uh, in the field uh, to uh, really prevent, um, uh, to control malaria in different settings, and offer some prospect, because now we also use tubes, uh, we can also use different kinds of chemical or toxic uh, agents as part of this kind of, of material, which was not the case uh, before. There's also development of uh, attractive to toxic sugar bed that also can use different kind of compounds that can, can put on nets. And of course, I will go very faster. Uh, <laughs> uh, genetic control using new technology, redone technique, the release of insecticide and then the gene, gene drive, and all the bacteria are uh, representing promising strategies because, of course, we will not use anymore the insecticide. Um, and then that's why uh, this kind of tools are of interest for, for us. Uh, okay, uh, so I think I'm going to be something. Yes, yes, yes we, we have all the way. So, so um, um, sorry for being a bit, a bit uh, long. Uh, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, thank you, Vigal. Do you have any questions? Okay. Well, I will start back. Oh, there is one question in the, in the... Yeah, there was a... Yeah, first I will... Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, give you the opportunity to have. There is one there. Yeah. <laughs> on your first slide, showed the spread of resistance. How much of that is really spread of resistance? How much is that laboratory starting to work with resistance? And how much is depending on laboratory starting working on the system? Yes, if you look at your first map, there was huge box with no resistance, but most of Africa there was no mission. Yeah, of course, when the resistance increases, it's first increasing report. Well, I say increasing the report of resistance. Compared to the 2000, uh, of course, more and more labs and people have uh, worked on resistance. So. Once you work on resistance, you're more, more important. So resistance may be here before, too, uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then you will even see it because the one has, has been working on it. But we also know when we are working in this area where we could find susceptible population, as you remember, only in Africa, where we you know, five years after, uh, this population that was susceptible is now resistant. So it's, it's evolving very, very, very quickly. So this both increasing reports and increasing, uh, <coughs> yes, uh, maybe you said it, and I, I miss it, but you said this uh, rotation strategy didn't, uh, I mean, there, you have no many examples that it worked in the mosquito. Is it because it was not implemented in the field, or is it is it because it didn't work? Did they try and it didn't work, or is it because they didn't try? No, I think both. Uh, very few, uh, as we say, a lot, we have a lot of very small scale study. <coughs> Combining insecticide with mixture or, or making this can show something. I mean, it's not about us, we combine different insecticide and we show that the resistance also uh, is evolving slowly than compared to the product alone. At large scale, there's very few things, very few things. Mexico trial will last for, uh, I think, five to seven years. So it's where we can have more, more uh, than data uh, uh, with uh, lots of samples. So I don't know why they do it. So very few, very few example. Probably it's more constrained, uh, more constrained to do it. You know, when you are you have need to rotate three insecticide, and you need to buy three insecticide for program. I'm talking, so it's it's more expensive also. Uh, so some insecticide also have been re redrawn, uh, so that you cannot use as uh, we, we we used to do a lot of insecticide with different more actions. There's been a reduction of the possible insecticide to use. So, Probably more than or uh, cost constraint, yeah. so it's already why they didn't do much this kind of problem. And last thing, sorry, it's also complicated. All uh, all studies that we have done for malaria and everything uh, is really complicated to demonstrate uh, resistance management strategy. Why? Because resistance is really evolving very fast, quickly, uh, on time and in space. So when you start something, uh, you have the resistance fluctuating. Different of the cluster, 
And so to attribute also uh, uh, the, uh, the impact of one strategy on risk of management is really complicated. And so because you know it's fluctuating, so attributing something is really <clears throat> Thank you very much, Hansa. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we don't have more time for questions. Perhaps uh, those that have been virtually could be, could be asked uh, later on. Um, now it's uh, also a pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker, Magali Fi from the French National Center of Research, CNRS in Montpellier. That when we asked her to present something, she was like, but I'm not a vector person. But I'm pretty, or we were pretty, pretty sure that uh, her topic will interest uh, many vector people. So thank you, Ali. Yes. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So actually, I'm not going to talk about uh, vector disease, but about pollen uh, vector here and about the effect of uh, air pollution and more particularly ozone pollution on the chemical communication between plant and pollinator. So this is the result of different projects that have been financed by uh, different uh, organisms, including Montpellier uh, University of Excellence. And there are different groups involved in, in this project including work, uh, groups that work in atmospheric chemistry and uh, biosynthesis of uh, uh, volatile organic compounds in plants. Mm -hmm. Yes, is actually a key component of biodiversity, so involving uh, actually insects of almost uh, uh, all the groups. And in fact, more than 85% of the world angiosperm and 75% um, and of major crops rely on animal po po pollination. However, this uh, very crucial uh, service for the nature and, the, and our society is created by uh, many different uh, factors uh, since the beginning of the uh, industrial time. Uh, and among them, air pollution is one of the most stressful for, for this interaction. In fact, in the due to human activity, uh, many primary pollutants are released in the atmosphere and more particularly in the troposphere. And these different uh, pollutants can, present, can represent important pressure uh, on the, the ecosystems. But these uh, primary pollutants are also precursor of secondary pollutants that can be even more stressful for the organisms. And among them, ozone that is produced uh, uh, by the reaction of this primary pollutant with the volatile organic compounds emitted by plants, but also by human, and nitrogen oxide and UV is also uh, uh, one of the major pollutants in rural area next to the uh, big city. And due to its very high oxidative potential, it could have important impact on human health including uh, respiratory problems in humans, but also on vegetation, 
including necrosis on the leaves and photosynthesis um, problem in plants. And uh, um, based on different studies that have been conducted in human and, and vegetation, the threshold above which ozone could represent a problem for human health or vegetation has been set it up. However, this ratio does do not take into account the effect that ozone can have on the ecosystem functioning. And in these uh, ecosystems, often volatile organic compounds represent important signal to mediate in the interaction between species, and particularly between plants and, and pollinators. And this is the case for specialist interaction, but also generalist interaction. So in the, uh, in, the, in the current project, we try to investigate the impact of ozone pollution on the chemical communication between plants and, and pollination, between plant and, and pollinators. In fact, uh, ozone can have important impact on the emission of volatile organic compounds by plants because uh, to defend themselves against the oxidative stresses, plants are going to change the VOC that they emitted, and there are these VOCs are often uh, yes, responsible for, for uh, interaction with, with pollinator. But also, uh, when they are emitted in the atmosphere, these VOCs can react with ozone, and the reaction occurs at different times, depending on the structure of the molecule. So some compounds are going to react very quickly and others not. This can have consequences on the composition of the chemical uh, signal around the plant and on the proportion of the different VOCs that we're going to have in the signal. So here's the, well, you can see the name of the compound. So this is different monoterpene and cisquiterpenes proportion in the mix around the plants. And you can see all this change with when you increase ozone concentration. You can see that some are going to uh, be uh, at a very um, low uh, lifetime and other longer. So this change in proportion could impact the attraction of pollinators. Also, ozone could have important impact on the pollinator overall physiology, <coughs> but and also affect more directly uh, insect uh, uh, olfaction. So we try to dissect the effect of ozone concentration on each type of this uh, chemical uh, communication between plants and pollinators. We work in the Mediterranean region uh, because it's one of the most polluted uh, region in. Uh, uh, of ozone in, uh, in work due to human activity and the very important um, uh, sunlight, especially in, uh, in summer. And we work with different interactions, ranging from very specialized interaction. So for example, the one that you have in the Mediterranean fixed species, because Carica, and a more generalist interaction, like for example, the one that you have with the uh, lavandula and the honeybees. So here I'm only gonna talk about the interaction, the results that we have on this lavandula and the plants and the anonymous. So if you're not very familiar with ozone, so uh, ozone is actually a pollutant, like uh, <coughs> contrary to CO2, that you have more homogeneous uh, concentration. You have uh, the concentration of ozone is very variable in space and time. So here, for example, is a map presenting the ozone concentration, the maximum concentration during one day in the French uh, Mediterranean region. And uh, so it's going from blue to, to red. And uh, as you can see, like a few kilometers from each other, ozone concentration could be very different. Also, during the day, it, it fluctuates a lot with the peak of uh, concentration, usually uh, during uh, uh, in summer, uh, during midday. So here you can see the, maybe it's better to, uh, to make more of that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so with the mean ozone uh, concentration in the summer, it's about 25 ppd. So we have maximum annual of about 120, and the uh, big maximum uh, uh, concentration that we reached in the last 20 years was 206 ppd. <laughs> Uh, so, um, first we try to simulate also the uh, um, episodes in control condition and expose plants to uh, ozone concentration. So the work that I presented here, it's work from my former PhD student, uh, Candice Dubuisson. So what we did here, we have a pair of plants that we enclosed in the system. One was exposed to zero ppb of ozone, the control and the other to the maximum uh, 
a concentration that was recorded in the, in the French Mediterranean region. And we enter uh, air in the system, collect the volatile organic compounds at the axis of the system, and analyze by GCNS. And the experiment goes as following. So first, we enclose the plant. We did an odor collection the, the following morning. Then we start the ozone system, and we did two a collection of odor, one three hours after exposition, one five after the exposition. So here, in the, in the, in, with the setup, you could, if any, if there is an effect on ozone, we will detect an effect on the emission of VOCs, but also the reaction of ozone in the chamber with the compound. So to get rid of that, we stuffed the ozone in the system, waited that all the ozone uh, is uh, empty from the chamber, and did another odor collection. And with that, we hope to see the effect of ozone on, on the emission by the plant. So these are the results. So it's quite complex uh, picture. But what we represented here is just a multivariate analysis, represented the relative proportion of the different compounds that were uh, emitted and that were present in the chamber for the controls and for the exposed uh, plant. So we see uh, an effect of the time, so with difference in the morning and, and the afternoon. But anyway, uh, we also see that uh, the plants that were never ozonated are the VOC that group all together. And that is significantly different from the VOCs of the plants that were exposed to ozone at three and five hours after exposition. However, when we stopped the ozone in the system, the VOC that were collected grouped together with the plants that were never ozonated. So probably the defect that we have here is due to the reaction of VOCs in the chamber uh, with, the, with the ozone. And if we look at the compounds that are uh, linked to these uh, different groups, we saw some of the major uh, uh, VOCs that are emitted by the lavandula plants, and we see that new compounds are being here in the chambers. So to really uh, check uh, if the effect that we found was really due to the reaction of, of the VOCs with ozone, we conducted another experiment where we this time exposed only the VOCs <coughs> to ozone. And to do that, we use a reactor uh, that uh, where we put uh, the um, uh, VOCs that were presented, uh, uh, that were emitted by the lavandula plant, and we expose these VOCs to different ozone concentration and analyze them what we have in this reactor. And once again, here we have a clear difference in the control uh, samples compared to the one that were uh, uh, ozonated for the VOCs. And we find again the same compounds that are uh, linked to this. Uh, to this changing, so which the main compounds emitted by the, lav the lavender plant this decreased when we start uh, the ozone in the system. So to give you a bit of an idea of what it looks like, so this is the proportion of the VOCs that are emitted by the lavender plant that is not ozonated, and here in red you can see uh, the proportion of the new proportion of VOC after we started the ozone. So ozone actually degraded differentially the VOC, that was what we are expecting, and changed the relative proportion of the VOC in, uh, in the chambers. Then we conduct other experiments where we this time expose the pollinators to uh, uh, increase concentration of ozone. And this work uh, is the uh, result of my postdoc that you cannot really see space here, but uh, of Fabien Denard. So what we did this time, so as I said, we exposed the pollinators uh, to ozone, and we uh, so collected uh, honeybees at the uh, entrance of the on the hives. We um, um, put them in the in tube, put them in the incubator overnight, and after that, we exposed them for one hour to different ozone concentration. And then we conducted different tests, uh, some uh, with two different uh, protocols. So some um, straight away after the exposition. And other, we waited two hours rest because we thought maybe after uh, some time rest there, they're able to recover from, from the oxidative stress. And uh, what we tested here is that if the ozone exposition affect the learning ability of this uh, honeybee. And to do that, we use a classical uh, method that is uh, used to test this in, in honeybees. So we use the proboscis extension reflex where you teach to uh, honeybees to associate it uh, a reward here, sugar water, with, um, with the, some odors. And you expect when you offer them these different odors that they uh, think that they would receive some, uh, some sugar and they extend their purposes. So 
the experiment goes as the following. So first you have an order that uh, normally you expose your bees to this order. They are not supposed to extend the proboscis because it's not associated yet to, to an order, to a reward. Then you associate this order to a reward. And you did, you did that several times with different trials. And you expect that slowly at, after a different trial, they will start only with the order and no sugar, extend the proboscis and associate this order to, to the sugar reward. And like that, you test their learning ability. <coughs> so what we have here, so these are the uh, uh, learning curves for these uh, different bees with two different orders that we tested here. And you can see the learning uh, curves for the different ozone concentration. What we find here is that uh, ozone at ATP PB for this compound, eucalyptol, significantly uh, the exposition of ozone alters this olfactory uh, learning for these bees, but we didn't uh, see this effect for the other ozone concentration, even if they were higher. Then what we test is the memories of the bee. Do they remember uh, uh, to, that this order is associated to sugar or not? And with that, we also test this, this, their discrimination ability. In fact, when bees forage outside and they search for a reward, they are supposed to be able to discriminate different orders. So here, if they learn properly and they remember properly the order that they learn, if you give them this order, and uh, you present another order, they should uh, extend only the proboscis the, with the order that was associated to the reward, not to the other one. <laughs> However, if the discrimination is not good, then they should uh, have a problem discriminating these two orders, and they will uh, extend also uh, the proboscis with the, the order that is not associated to, to the reward. And this is uh, the result that we have here. So these are the proportion of Bs that uh, responded to the order that were taught to, to learn, so for this, this compound and also for this one. And as you can see here, there is an effect of ozone uh, um, exposure, so at ATP PB, for the bees uh, that were uh, uh, learned to, to, to associate uh, eucalyptal with, uh, with sugar. But what we can see, as also expected, the response to the learned order is better than the new order. However, we have a, a very important proportion of bees that were exposed to 120 ppb and 200 ppb that respond uh, uh, strongly uh, to the new order. So that have problem actually to discriminate the uh, different uh, orders. So we find uh, this result, so this is a bit of the summary that I just presented for one hour after exposition, but if the bees rest for two hours, we actually do not find recovery. Actually, it's even worse. We could see that the learning ability are, are even worse, and they are not really able to recover after the stress of, of one hour. And we find this also for the other compounds. So we find similar results for the other compounds, although there are some small differences between these two compounds, but the, the overall response is, is quite similar. Last thing that we tested is that it, the effect that we see is partly due to a problem in the detection of this VOC by the antenna. The, the antenna is the first, um, uh, is the first step of uh, detection of VOCs in insects. So what we did here, we had the same protocol for the, for the bees. But we test uh, if uh, us using electron tonography recording, um, if the response of the antenna was uh, different or not after the ozone exposition. So here you see the amplitude of the responses for the EEG for bees uh, that were exposed to these uh, different compounds and that have a different ozone exposure. And you can see that just after the ozone expo exposition, uh, the, um, the responses of the antenna of the bees significantly decrease in most cases. But two hours after, after the rest, actually, uh, we have a different uh, effect. In this time, the uh, responses of the antenna increase. So uh, to, to summarize a bit uh, our results, so uh, what we find with the sh uh, experimental short uh, exposure to ozone epiza, that here, we do not uh, see an effect on the emission of UCs by the plant, or ever just 
directly after the exposition. Maybe it's possible that several days after following this uh, exposition, you have uh, an effect. But what we see, and this is the measure effect here, is that the VOCs that are around the plants are affected uh, by this, uh, by this uh, uh, exposition. We also find a strong alteration of the detection of the VOC by pollinator, and we find that this is partly due to an effect on the uh, antenna of, of the insect. And we find a similar result uh, in other systems that I didn't have time to show here, and we show that this uh, effect actually alter pollinator attraction. So an important message here is that there is strong possibility to disrupt plant pollinator interaction during an ozone episode. What we are uh, investigating here, so we are completing some of the experiments with honeybees, but also we are interested in uh, testing because uh, we showed here result of um, exposition to a short time, uh, peak of ozone, but there is also chronic exposure uh, of this uh, uh, insect. And we wanted to see if the chronic exposition also has a similar or, or different effect. We try uh, also to determine the effect that this could have on pollination, so on plant uh, reproductive success, success, but also on, on pollinators. And we also currently investigating the mechanism of ac action of this ozone on the VOC biosynthesis in plants, but also on insect uh, olfactory system. Uh, and with that, I would like to thank uh, so my group, the, the different people that were involved in here, our collaborators, and our funding sources, and also Marcelo and, and David for inviting me uh, to present uh, some of uh, my work, even if I'm not working on it. Um, thank you for your presentation, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, the exposure to all the, of the plants in ozone, have you considered the type of chemical reaction that is occurring? Uh, and um, maybe I was, I was thinking looking at the plant in your presentation, if you use a some terpenoids that are radio labeled and you follow how they are transformed? Yes, uh, you mean? Like, did, what type of reaction is occurring? Like, if you specifically know that, for example, uh, geranium is converted to geranium, so there's an oxidation and that, that is changing. That yeah, usually, usually ozone reacts with the double bonds. This is yeah. what happens. So there are some work in the uh, in the atmospheric chemistry in kinetic that uh, monitor actually how some compounds change with ozone, and you could. No, some because you also have to consider that you have the degradation products, the degradation product that uh, occur. But this, you have this information for some compounds, mm -hmm. but not uh, not all of them. It's just some, and it's not so easy also to to do this kind of experiment. And also, it's not so easy to identify the new the new compounds. But there are some data about the last lifetime of different compounds of uh, some compounds with ozone. Mm -hmm. that are really the, the fact that eighty ppm has an effect, but then higher concentration doesn't. It's quite interesting to see what well, it's the critical concentration of the change in yes. the change. Yes, yes. This is uh, this is this is actually what we are trying to do with different plants uh, uh, to see when is the uh, especially what, another system that okay, it's in my system, but I didn't present so much. The the system with the, the fig wasps, where that we know exactly the compound are used by the pollinator. So we specifically follow the, those ones, and we have an idea when they change or, or not. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for my question, thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, so you said uh, you checked it with also different species, yeah. right? But uh, I just want to. No, we have uh, uh, so far we only have tried with Eminotera. That's the thing. It's different uh, species, but we didn't uh, try others. But this would be with the plant at, at some point. But I expect that we find this uh, this effect on, on actually many many most insects, actually. no matter the order. Uh, kind of a follow up question on that because of course, uh, honeybees are highly specialized uh, insects that can learn very well. In so I could imagine that a lot of insects don't have that ability to adapt it. Uh, what do you think about that? So, if you think it's an enormous amount of quality. Yeah. 
So this is a very interesting question. So actually, again, in the CIGWAS, this is my model. They're specialists, they don't learn. So here, when you expose them, then at, at starting at 200 PPE, they are not attracted anymore by the by the by the order. This is something that we are trying to set up with my colleague uh, uh, Marie's uh, van der Plank. She specializes in bees, but in white bees, and we're trying to test depending on the ecology of the bees uh, and the different traits to see how sensitive. Uh, it's easier to also try with the similar kind of group, but with some differences in different traits to try to have an idea how sensitive you could be depending on your ecology to uh, to this project. Have you looked at uh, populations from different areas that would have different levels of ozone to see if they've adapted? This is a uh, this is the plan actually. Uh, with uh, one of my colleagues, in, I work here also a lot in China. With my one of my colleagues in China, in the region of Guangzhou, we just uh, we just planning to do that because they have. Uh, I mean, we we go at uh, two hundred ppbs in China. They have peaks at six hundred ppbs. When I saw my result, I was like, wow. So we I would, would like to see, especially for the insect, you expect with the to see some kind of or uh, selection or some possible uh, acclimatization, adaptation. I don't know, but you see, it's possible. This is something that we are trying to do also. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very fast. What do you think it can happen for vector and vector control? Uh, this ozone pollution and so pollution. there it's there are different effects. So there there could be as we see, and I, I, I suspect that this is the case for most insects that you have an effect on the insect insect themselves. So it could change their behavior, it could be uh, reduce attraction, or maybe due to a stress, they can start to be more uh, I don't know, by tomorrow, or you could create something like that. But also, because of the oxidative potential, you could see uh, oxidation of some of the uh, um, um, chemicals that are used to uh, to, find that, to use to, yeah, to uh, repulse for this kind of thing. They also react with double bond. So if you have double bond in your molecule, it's going to react and change uh, what... Uh, what, uh, what it has done. Actually, there, there, there was a, a project in, um, in the Germany where they were testing with the pest insect that we we're using uh, a pheromones to control, and they were trying to see if there is some effect of pollutants because the pollutants are reacting with the pheromones that we're using, and this could have an effect on the, on the, on the monitoring of, of, of this insect. We have one last question. Yeah, one, one question from the Zoom. Can you explain why there might be a greater effect of ozone at the lower concentration? This is a actually interesting uh, result. And we have, uh, so there could be different things. This happens, uh, this is uh, as named, I forgot actually, of course, that you could have an effect of low concentration and not that higher. So what we are doing is we are checking the uh, overall uh, uh, oxidative damage uh, on the and on the insect, and we try to see if there is difference and the antioxidant uh, responses. It's also possible because uh, insects are also able somehow to manage this oxidative stress by having an antioxidant response. So it's possible that the antioxidant response only occurs at, at a certain. Uh, Concentration of exposition. So probably at 80 ppb is not enough, but just so you have an effect, and maybe higher concentration triggers the anti antioxidant response of the insect. This could be a, an explanation. Thank you very much, Ali. We have to move on. The next thing is Sarah from the um, yeah, Research Institute, uh, Sustainable Development. Uh, we've seen uh, so far problems uh, with insecticides, general things in general. Now we have a little bit of hope, or I actually don't know what it is. Uh, so, so, figures, we're always going to talk about uh, green cities. 
which we hope is the near future. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to share with you the not the uh, results, but the uh, question about uh, the impact of uh, green cities on vector borne diseases for human, animals, and plants. We live now in a urban world. Uh, since 2007, urban people have exceeded rural people. And uh, 70% of uh, the world population is expected to be urban in 2050. But the urbanization process is uh, very varying uh, according to states. <coughs> Africa, for example, is the less urbanized continent, but variation occurred also in the time. And Africa, for Africa, urbanization <coughs> began later. But it is where the urban growth will be the greatest for the future. Because of this variation in the urbanization process, there is a lot of disparities between cities. But there are also disparities within cities, leading to inequalities, particularly health inequalities. And here you see differences in life expectancy at birth for women in three large South American cities, ranging up to 10 years, for example, for Santiago. So cities face multiple challenges. They are dense, heterogeneous, and open environments, and complex is the best word to describe them. Because of uh, modifying, uh, modifying land use and uh, because of uh, various levels of urban planning, cities uh, induce uh, environmental uh, disruption, uh, resulting in pollution, flooding, extreme heat, and biodiversity loss. The international organization calls for urban action to make cities healthier. One of the sustainable development goals target cities that need to be inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And one of the approaches identified to reach this goal uh, lies on nature-based solutions. There is a large panel of nature-based solutions. You can have uh, urban forests, uh, parks, street trees, green roof and walls, green strips, green corridors, community gardens, and so on. A lot of studies show that uh, greening cities impact positively the well-being of human and animals. Uh, it could be a uh, reduction in stress, uh, opportunity to physical activity that may decrease some diseases like uh, hypertension or obesity. You can also see a reduction in respiratory diseases, even if uh, uh, some results show that uh, the, 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 the impact of the green cities may depend on the size of the city, the size of the, the, the population age, and the, the, the scale of the survey. Because uh, greening cities have an action on the restoration of the biodiversity, we can ask if uh, uh, greening cities may have an impact on vector bomb diseases and vector. Uh, the, the slide shows some uh, study we found with a quick search uh, in the literature uh, recently. 
And uh, we can extract some information, for example, for anopheles and malaria. Uh, some uh, studies uh, show that uh, ontological inoculation rates are higher close to urban agricultural sites than in urban sites without agricultural areas. But specific crop system and specific agricultural practice may increase the risk of malaria in urban setting. Agriculture areas provide resting sites for adults more than breeding sites for larvae of anopheles. For Aedes in Delhi, uh, it can be uh, shown that uh, the adult density of Aedes aegypti is significantly lower in parks compared with the residential areas, but the density of Aedes albopictus was significantly higher in the parks. And uh, one study showed that there were more dengue cases in urban Iceland where vegetation is scarce. So, Greening City may have a positive impact on dengue, perhaps. For ticks and tick borne diseases, uh, we can say that the tick densities decrease from the periphery to the city center. Green corridors allow circulation of hosts, uh, for example, deer and then increase the probability of tick bites for humans. And also density of infected ticks decrease with urbanization, but increase its connectivity uh, in the green corridors, for example. Uh, there was an outbreak of uh, leishmaniasis in Madrid in 2009, and uh, it can be said that the outbreak was linked to the creation of new urban parks at the periphery of the cities. Because of the introduction of the new reservoir on the urban sector, and then it can be concluded that the urbanization of fresh maniasis, the, to the urbanization of fresh maniasis in this focus. Sorry. For uh, vector borne disease in Canada, uh, we didn't find any publication uh, on this subject. But um, the experts are very uh, worried about this question because they identify ornamental plants infected by a bacteria, Zilella fastidiosa, inside the cities. And uh, we can ask for the possible spread to surrounding crops, for example, the yards uh, in the region of Montpellier. Um, so, um, I can say that uh, we haven't no uh, real um, conclusion to, to, to propose for the question about uh, green cities and impact on vector borne diseases. <coughs> but uh, the, the, the issue is very important. Uh, recently, we had an heat wave, and the French government uh, launched uh, a, a 500 million euro plan for the green city. And we have to to have responses to, to give to the policy maker for what kind of uh, greening uh, cities we want, what kind of nature based solution we can uh, give. And uh, I don't know if you know this, uh, this example uh, of the vertical forest of Chengdu in uh, China. It's a group of uh, eight buildings, totally uh, green. And, uh, the, the, the old building uh, were invaded by mosquitoes, and uh, all the, the, the inhabitants of the building uh, left their flat because of the increasing mosquitoes. So we have to be very cautious with the, the, the nature based solution we can uh, give to the, to the heat wave, for example. So uh, we, we think really that green cities should be promoted to make city healthier. But as the urban environment is complex, as its functioning is still poorly understood, particularly with regard to the situation of pathogens and vectors, we need uh, more evidence uh, to, to have a, a better conclusion. And uh, we think that uh, interdisciplinary cross sectoral approach is necessary with also the participation of the city dwellers to give their perception 
We are starting uh, a project uh, with uh, the cities of uh, Montpellier and Toulouse uh, to try to address this, uh, this issue, and also the project Vecto Ash, uh, in which uh, some of you are involved. I think. And then uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to, to give you some uh, results in the next future. Thank you very much. Yeah, we, we need ideas more than questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, mean, I, I, I have some um, it was pretty striking the picture in China with all the plants. Uh, do you know what type of plants are there? Because I guess uh, if you pick the plants, there will be volatile that being attracted to mosquitoes. It's kind of it can be right. So I don't know. Uh, I see there is a tree, there is a little tree, but I don't know exactly uh, what kind of plant. Uh, don't you think that green effect increases the population? I think to the another state to create breeding sites. Uh, probably. Uh, so that you have to say you can attract mosquitoes from where? So, so then you have to breathe them. As there is a plant at the whole uh, yeah. level, uh, probably uh, yeah, the you have some somewhere in the case it's spread. Uh, yeah. there, there is a project in the way of such a uh, vertical forest, but um, they, they think about uh, the, the possibility of the larval uh, breeding site, so they are very cautious about uh, the water. But uh, but when the people are in their flat, uh, it's difficult to know what they do. So uh, so it's uh, difficult to, to, to have a uh, <coughs> view of the, the project. And another point is that with increasing heat, more people have their cooling system. I've been staying in an apartment in thirty second floor of Dubai. There's a lot of heaters because of the Condensed water from this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Interesting. So, about the green cities, it's a lot of the farms. But I think it's also, you need to give it time, right? Because mosquitoes are a pioneer species, so they inhabit you know, this area maybe first into some new, new habitat. But we also need, you know, the entire biodiversity, so we need. Time to also get the, you know, the natural enemies in. Mm -hmm. So if we measure this and these people are leaving, oh, there's so many mosquitoes, so it's not working. So we should also look at the complete system again. So let's give it time and then we will look at all aspects in a one health context. Sharon and then Didi. One of my colleagues is working on uh, this sort of part, part, uh, vertical horticulture in Bangladesh. And they had been having very good experiences. People were taking it up, and they were doing the balcony horticulture and so on. Um, and about two years ago, they gave this announced about vertical horticulture. And within one year, people stopped doing Like it, it went from wonderful to almost no one doing it. And they couldn't directly connect it because no one was actually looking at the mosquitoes, but they were the, the, the word of mouth that made people buzz that it's all about vertical, this idea of vertical farming. So, I mean, I don't think it's just trees that I think we really have to think about the whole picture when we start thinking about this. And um, the other thing was that people higher up. The, the coming from Dubai and, and being on the 35th floor, they were also recognizing that as well. That people much higher up the buildings were, were being affected by it. Well, I think we have to be very cautious and we can really see the, the, the nature of the solution. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, if you check the comments, it is not only vector, uh, which it is a vector of the first of course. Uh, 
and so we bring the cities may equip some uh, plants and animals into the cities we have seen here, but it will be herbs and what kind of cities and curates in the papers and so on. So it is something a bit more complicated, it is not only better, but it's also host and pathogens introduced at the same time. And for example, for plants, and uh, we have plenty of examples, but we don't we do not do the consequences yet. But we have plenty of examples of plants introduced in cities, exotic or, or from the region, with, mm -hmm. like, without, without insecticides, so it is uh, no treatment. And, and then some farmers are, 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 are very expressed that. So we have to, 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 to work not only within the city and have that amount of support, but also with different. Uh, more complicated and more mm -hmm. oh, you have so to try to introduce of like the the idea the we are I think we are the beginning of the of the question also uh, having plants that are Natural uh, animals <coughs> that you mix in uh, uh, plants and they help us uh, natural animals. I would like to remind people that are behind the, the screens uh, in the Zoom that we don't take uh, like uh, all our questions. If you want to question anything, just write it down and uh, we'll, we'll read it for you. So, I guess we need coffee. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much for the video. Hi everyone. So actually I'm from yeah, so I need to be on that side because the camera is here. Oh yeah, so I'm from the CNRS and not the IS, but it's all right. <laughs> uh, so I'm a CNRS researcher in the Nivejek lab in Montpellier. And today I'm going to talk about some poorly understood and quite protected aspects of uh, mosquito biology, uh, which are their ecological functions. So basically, what are mosquitoes good for? Um, and more specifically, I will be talking about their possible contribution to pollination. So Vincent this morning already uh, pointed that out, that vector control is really a central tool in the fight against many mosquito-borne diseases, such as Malaria, dengue, uh, Zika, and just as one example, it is currently estimated that 79% of the 663 million averted malaria cases between 2000 and 2015 were due to uh, vector control. So mostly it was uh, impunitive insecticidal bed nets, but also IRS, so the mineral in spray. But we also have some uh, new alternative tools being developed. Uh, so for instance, here, uh, combining the irradiated sterile with the Volvacca incompatible techniques has recently been shown to suppress locally some uh, populations of Aedes aboticus in China. In addition, we also have some uh, genetically modified mosquitoes uh, that have been quite successfully used in parts of Brazil or India. And we also have some uh, current ongoing trials of gene drive technology to suppress anophilus. Uh, populations in the fight against malaria. Vector control can also be used uh, as part of uh, severe reasons, and perhaps the most emblematic example is the widespread use of the uh, larvicidal DTI in wetlands to fight abundant and annoying uh, mosquito species with very strong economic, touristic, uh, and social implications. So yes, clearly, mosquito control uh, provides many benefits, including <coughs> health, health benefits, including economic benefits. But mosquito control also uh, rises, also poses some uh, significant uh, questions, ethical, ecological questions. And of, of uh, perhaps the most important questions are uh, the possibility that there are some adverse ecological consequences of reducing mosquito population. And to quantify those consequences, we really need to better understand the ecological roles, the ecological functions of mosquitoes. So there has been some uh, recent evidence from the literature that we have compiled, that we have summarized in the recent 
some uh, working papers here. So some recent evidence from diverse mosquito species suggesting that uh, reduced mosquito density can actually have a negative impact on food webs, so effect on predator population dynamic, for example, effect on prey populations too, with very strong implication in terms of uh, decomposition of waste material, uh, water purification, impact on inter- and intraspecific competition, obviously, and also perhaps uh, some effects on plant reproduction. So just a very quick example here. This is a snapshot dietary analysis of this bird. So the Western bluebirds, this is in um, California vine white, uh, vineyard, sorry. And they showed that uh, eyeless mosquitoes were by far the most common item recovered uh, in the, in the mid-gut content of this uh, bluebird species. Right, but today I will rather focus on uh, the possible effects of mosquitoes and their possible roles in terms of uh, plant reproduction. So clearly the importance of mosquitoes to global pollination is really unclear. Uh, we do know that some mosquito species are actually, are actually some uh, quite specific pollinators of some plant species. So we have very nice examples here. So this study showed that this is the, uh, the odor of a given species of orchids that mediates a unique mutualism pollination system between eyeless mosquitoes, including eyeless IGT and uh, this uh, species of orchids. But clearly, this is interesting, but it doesn't really tell us much about uh, the importance of mosquitoes in terms of global pollination, right? There is this another study here. Uh, this is quite interesting too. They worked on the tansy flowers and they found that Culex pipiens, uh, the common house mosquitoes, was an effective pollinator of uh, that plant. And the authors went further by suggesting that uh, these results here could be extrapolated to other species, to other plant species within the Aster family, the Aster acid. So just a little focus on that study here. So the, the author here uh, did two treatments, the cross-pollination and the blood control. So in the cross-pollination treatment, they had like 60 mosquitoes, both, fem both females and both males, kept for three days in a bag. So this is the bag here, and it enclosed uh, the flowers of a living potted tansy here and two cutted flowers from other individuals. And uh, the control treatment was exactly the same, but the mosquitoes were absent. And here are the results. They found uh, that seed production here, so this is the seed set on the y-axis, was much higher in the mosquito treatment than in the blood treatment, suggesting that yes, QX pipians could be an effective pollinator. And along with those uh, experimental results, the authors also uh, provided some nice field observations showing that uh, these mosquito species do visit this flower uh, in the field in natural conditions. However, in this experiment, there was no positive controls. So it could be quite interesting to compare uh, the pollination provided by mosquitoes to that provided by other well-known, more uh, generalist pollinators such as bees or uh, flies. And so this is what we have undertaken here using the same species as the study I just mentioned previously. So the pollination, we compare the pollination of uh, the tansy flowers by the Culex pipiens mosquitoes, Culex pipiens molluscus here, in comparison with that provided by uh, the blue fly, Otophormia terragumae, which feeds on nectar and which is uh, also widely used uh, for, um, as a general pollinator, uh, pollinators of uh, several species within the Aster family. And we also looked at the pollination of Brassicarapa, so a totally different species uh, within the family uh, Brassicaceae, and this is a self-incompatible plant species. And we looked at the pollination of that species by Culex pipiens and Ides albopictus in comparison again with the blue flies. So very briefly, we used a wild Culex pipiens collected as larval stages in sewage ponds uh, around uh, Montpellier. We brought them back uh, to the insectary uh, to complete development. We used um, some uh, flies uh, purchased in fishing shops or as maggots. We brought them back into insectary too and uh, kept them in the lab until uh, adult emergence. We used uh, laboratory reared Ides uh, albopictus. So this is the Montpellier strain established in uh, 2016. And finally, for the plants, uh, they were grown in greenhouse to prevent contamination, so to prevent pre-test contamination, so to prevent the contact with other uh, external possible uh, pollinators. 
So our uh, behavior I say was like this. So we use two mesocosms of uh, two cubic meter uh, at the ecotron of Montpellier. So those are two large climatic chamber, outdoor climatic chamber where you can uh, control humidity and temperature. And in each of our two uh, mesocosms, we've set it up four large cages. So those are uh, mosquito cages, so one meter um, cages, four of them in each of the two mesocosms, and each containing two potted alive uh, tansy flowers. So in two cages in each uh, mesocosms, we released 60 mosquitoes, including males and females, for two days. And in the two other cages, we released 20 flies, the blue flies, for two days too. Uh, each potted tansy had uh, two treatments, so the tests are just the flowers that are exposed to the uh, pollinators, so either the mosquito, either the fly or the flies. And we had some uh, blunt control here, so the internal control that consists in the flowers uh, covered with a mesh pollinator exclusion by. And so these two-day assays with two major cousins was repeated four times at different periods. At the end of the two days assays, uh, we retrieve the insect, we record insect survival, we also look at the pollen distribution on insect body parts from 10 randomly selected individuals from each cage, uh, 5 males, 5 females. And finally, what we do is remember the test flowers, so those that were exposed to the insect uh, are enclosed with uh, mesh bags to prevent post-assay uh, contamination, and they are placed in the field here for several weeks until uh, fruit maturation. Following uh, fruit maturation, so we collect the fruits and the seed sets. So the, the, the production of seeds was derived from uh, semi-automatic counting from pictures like that. Uh, pictures taken on about three control fruits. So remember the one that were uh, covered up uh, with uh, mesh uh, extrusion bags and five test fruits from each plant. And uh, simply the seed set was the number of seeds out of the total number of ovules, so fertilized plus unfertilized ovules. All right, so this is the result for the survival of the insect uh, during the two days period in the, in the cages. So the survival was pretty good. About 91% of the flies uh, survived, and uh, we had 93% survival. We have a bit of variation among the different rounds, so the replicates, the four replicates I, I mentioned earlier. So this slide here shows the, the pollen distribution for flies here above and at the bottom is for the mosquitoes. So this is the pollen carrier, so the proportion of individual carrying at least one pollen grain on each of the body parts. And as you can see here for the flies, almost all the flies uh, carry at least one pollen grain, a very um, high load. And uh, the, the pollen grain uh, uh, reached highest load for the abdomen, for the legs and for the thoracic. There was no effect of sex. I, I forgot to mention that the red bars are for the female flies, while the blue bars are for the, the male flies. Mm. Regarding the mosquitoes, so the pollen carriage was much lower than for the flies. It was about 25% of the mosquitoes that carried at least one pollen grain on each of the, uh, their body parts. And the pollen um, load was uh, much uh, lower than for the flies too, is about 10 grains for each of the body parts. So this is the, the main uh, result for the seed set. So for the seed set, uh, what we can see here is the, 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 the red boxes are for the control. So remember the one that are uh, prevented from contact with the insects while the test were the exposed flowers. So what we have here is that pollination increased following exposure to flies here, but not to mosquitoes. So our results suggest that in fact, perhaps uh, in all conditions, Culex uh, picans is a poor pollinator of that plant. And so this does not confirm a uh, previous result, the, the study I, I mentioned earlier. All right, so we've performed this exact same experiments, but with uh, Brassica rapa. And because of uh, the self-incompatibility system in that plant, we, uh, we did not put only two, but four uh, individual plants. So this is the survival. As for the tansy flower, the survival was pretty good. Uh, about 80% in the flies and more uh, a better survival uh, for the mosquitoes. So 93% for the iris and 97% for the for the culex. So this slide here uh, is a bit busy, but the important points are that the flies are always loaded with pollen. Uh, so here it was 100% for each body part and uh, a, a lot of pollen on, on the abdom abdomen, uh, legs, and thoracic. So this confirm uh, the previous result of the distancing. 
For the QLEX, it was about the same that for the TANSI, we had about 15, between 15 and 20 percent of the QLEX PPNs that had um, at least one pollen grain on each of the body parts and about 10 pollen grains on each of these body parts in terms of load. But what was very surprising here is that we found no pollen at all, not a single pollen grain on the ILS elbow pictures. So let's see if this uh, translates in terms of uh, effective pollination. So this is the fruit set. The fruit set is the fruit number out of the total number of flowers. So we count the number of flowers available and the number of fruits at the end. And so here, um, this is for the, 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 the red bars are for the control and the blue bar for the test again. And we see that uh, our uh, negative control worked well because there is almost no fruits for the, for the control. But the fruit set uh, provided by the fly was um, much higher than for the control and also significantly higher than that provided by the QX features. For the ILS, so surprisingly, there was some fruit uh, sets uh, and it was about the same as for the, the flies. Uh, the, the, a similar trend, but uh, the, the, the difference here, the difference here is less uh, striking than for here. All right, so in terms of seed sets, so the actual number of grains in each of those fruits, so there was almost no viable seeds for the control. Even those here, so those fruits that were produced here, they did not produce any seeds actually. Those were uh, empty fruits as well. And so we found that both Culex and Ives provided uh, equivalent pollination to, to the flies. So in spite of the absence of pollen on their body, Ives and Bopictus does cause fruit and seed production. So we are currently setting up an experiment looking at possible uh, hygienic behavior in this basis, so maybe uh, the, the ibis albopictus has some ability to, to wipe off uh, pollen from the body, and when we, we look under the vinyl, we, we cannot observe any pollen. All right, so uh, as a conclusion here, so together our results suggest that mosquitoes are poor pollinators of tansy flowers compared to flies, but that they pollinate brassica equally well. Although we did not find any pollen grains on ibis albopictus, fruit and seed sets were equivalent to that of flies and perhaps uh, we will test the existence of such hygienic behavior. So what I did not mention is that we also looked at the, the fructose positivity during the two days assay. So we did some, we ran some uh, cold monotron tests and we confirmed that both Ides albopictus and Culex mosquitoes were positive. So the, the results of the cold monotron test turned out to be positive, suggesting that yes, the mosquito do indeed take uh, nectar during the two day test. But what I'd like to emphasize here is that we went a bit blind on the choice of uh, those plants. We have absolutely no idea in the vicinity of Lombardy or in the Mediterranean region if Culex pipiens or Ives albopictus are actually using uh, those plants in nature. So what we would like to do here is uh, to do things a bit uh, differently, is first identify in nature what are the plant species that are used by those mosquitoes. And for that, uh, DNA barcoding uh, seems to be the right techniques to do. So collecting mosquitoes <laughs> and try to identify which species are used in, the, uh, in nature. And then from here, uh, try to confirm with experiments like that if mosquitoes do contribute to the pollination of the species identified uh, through uh, DNA barcoding. All right, so biodiversity is often uh, represented like that. It's a simple collection addition of species. But what does really matter is not uh, this connection here, but really the interaction, the network of interaction between these species. Mm -hmm. And mosquitoes seem to have weak links with other community, community members. They are neither the only resource for their predators, they are not the only consumer of their prey. And it turns out that a similar functional redundancy might also characterize the role of mosquitoes as pollinators. So they are not the only pollinators, except a few exceptions, like I showed you with the orchid, with uh, specific mutualisms going on. And as such, if the ecological roles of mosquitoes are redundant with other organisms, then there might be a legitimate ecological argument supporting their suppression or elimination, especially if they are invasive alien species like Ides albopictus. However, I'd like to, uh, to uh, I think a lot of caution is actually warranted here because we have some uh, recent uh, theoretical work, this is not the only one, there are several studies going out in the literature nowadays showing that even if you remove a weak node, so mosquitoes are actually weak node, even if you remove a weak node from a, a network of interaction like that, uh, it can result in collapse in biodiversity loss. So 
I think it's important to better characterize the role of uh, the ecological loss of vectors to, uh, to try to anticipate, anticipate uh, biodiversity loss. And I'd like to finish just by saying that mosquito control is important, of course, but compared with the effort devoted to evaluating the efficacy of such tools, there are very, very, very few environmental impact assessments. And I think it's important when you evaluate the efficacy of your tools to also along uh, this evaluation to run some environmental impact assessment. And I thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you, uh, the key initiative news, risk and vector. So we share actually a sponsor. So the Kim Reef here uh, supported uh, this event. So, and in addition to support, so they support not only a symposium like this one, but also some uh, pilot research program like I just showed you. So thank you very much, Kim Reef. And I also would like to, 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 to thank all the members that helped a lot because, yeah, this is a heavy and very tenuous experiment. Uh, counting uh, seeds is not that fun. And so thank you very much for all your helps. Thank you to the OP, Ecotron, ISM, and uh, Seth. Thank you very much. So we have questions. So, um, isn't it also an important point that in, excuse me, can you remove the mask? Yeah. Yes. Uh, is it also isn't it also an important point that in environments like California, where I'm from, 80s Egyptis first came to California in 2013. So if you are successful in removing that species from the state, you're returning the uh, ecological environment to what it was before. So even if it's a weak node. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I fully agree, and that's why I, I, I emphasize this word here, um, especially the are invasive alien species. But you never know if, uh, for example, I don't know the other situation in California, but imagine that Aedes aegypti came in 2013 in California and took the niche, the ecological niche of other mosquito species, competitive exclusion, for example, and you do not longer have these mosquitoes. And then you remove Aedes, but the niche is empty. And you, not, you lose you, 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 you lose something in the in the community that might be useful for predators or for prey. You see what I, what I mean. And something we never uh, mentioned is that perhaps there are some ecological benefits of those invasive alien species here. <coughs> so perhaps Iris AGT provides something to the predators to the food webs of the California. It's controversial, right? <laughs> it is. I, I'm not convinced. Yeah. <laughs> so perhaps it won't do anything, but you never know until you quantify this. So my argument here is really I'm arguing in favor of a better quantification. I'm not telling that removing mosquitoes will have bad effect or positive effect. We just don't know because there are no studies about that. So but we really need to quantify this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> You focused on the adult stage. Absolutely. Uh, I think I saw a film on, on TV where they showed that the lava stage is eradicating that impact on fish populations most of our catch. Yeah, so most of the work you, you write me. Uh, there are a lot of works on um, on lava stages, and this is most of the work available is um, for example in Kamak, so nearby yes. here. Uh, the spread of BTI, I think it's here, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So most of the work here are conducted on novel stages. So the effects on predators and the trophic chain. Uh, so in Kamak, they found that uh, when, you, um, when you, you, you spread BTI, it not only kills the mosquitoes, but also the cubonons, which is another species, uh, very frequent and abundant species. And then they observed that uh, there are a lot of consequences on uh, birds. So the birds community is crashing down when you spread the BTI. So they are, I think the, 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 the publication is by uh, Brigitte Poulin at Kama, and it's been published in, um, in 2009, I believe. And they had like four sites that were untreated and four sites treated in the same, uh, region, same, same vicinity. And uh, the treated site had less uh, amount of uh, fledgings and adult birds compared to the untreated sites. But you think it's mostly due to the effect on the pyramids or not? I don't know. I don't know. The relative importance of mosquitoes and pyramids. I, I, I would be tempted to say it's more pyramids, because they are more abundant. Yeah. 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 Y
that I don't know. I, I know there are some uh, similar work in Germany too, ongoing. Yeah. I, I realize that not all mosquitoes will be identical, but do you have a sense, has there been an analysis of what fraction of mosquitoes in various locations are actual vectors? Because a lot of the genetic methods are intended to be species specific. Yeah, so we know that there are about 3,500 species, uh, described species of mosquitoes, but only uh, a few hundred are actually vectors. So we are not talking about removing all the mosquitoes. Um, and of course, if you ask me, uh, should we uh, remove uh, Anopheles gangi, the, the, the most dangerous vectors of malaria, I would say yes, of course. But for all the mosquitoes, non-vector uh, mosquitoes, I think the, the question is not valid. I was just wondering what percentage of biomass mosquitoes. Oh, oh I'm sorry, yeah, I didn't get it. So it's a very good question, and we know that it varies uh, spatially, but also temporally. So, for example, this study here, sorry, this one here, it's a snapshot, just yeah. a given time point. So maybe if you come back a few months later, maybe it's zero percent, and it relies on other praise. So it's very important to quantify, but spatial, uh, spatially and also temporally, I fully agree with you. A good point, yeah. I forgot to mention that. Huh. It might be a very silly question, right? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the fact that mosquitoes wipe their bodies, so you don't actually find them. We don't know, actually. It's, or, a, it's an hypothesis. The fact that you don't find pollen yeah. on mosquitoes, but somehow mosquitoes are really pollinators, right? So, my, my question is in your cages, the flowers were quite close to each other. Absolutely. I'm wondering, could you comment on how, like, distance that mosquitoes could be good pollinators if they're actually somehow passive pollinators and not active pollinators? Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think we should set up a specific experiment to test for that mm -hmm. to tease apart what the passive and active effects. Pretty good point. And maybe just buzzing around and moving the flowers and uh, the pollen just is waned. Or even if it's in climatic chambers, you never know, there can be some uh, air uh, current taking the pollen out from one hand and bringing it to the other. So that's it's, it's, it's very curious that yeah. you actually don't find any pollen on them, but they are somehow transported. But the pollen. control is negative. So that's a good point to yeah. think about it. Okay, thank you, Chapin. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see the mouse. Where's the mouse? Can you go? Yeah, you can go. I can see the mouse. First of all, I'd like to thank Marcelo and David for the invitation. Hi to you. I've seen some of you before. I look forward to making the acquaintance with the rest of you. So, um, as you may see on the title here, uh, I changed it. I had a bigger plans for my presentation, uh, given that I was supposed to give a 45 minute talk from the beginning, so I shortened it. <laughs> uh, so, I will talk about the small subject of selection and dissemination of flowering plants for the seed sector mosquitoes. So, it's a project that we've been working on for the last couple of years, and it's time to reveal what we come up to. Um, so, the 
emphasis will be on how do they actually select and discriminate and how can we actually use this. So mosquitoes are faced with problems uh, like us, like any other organisms that they need to select uh, and they need to discriminate in order to survive and reproduce. So for a mosquito, uh, we know now for a hundred years that uh, they're attracted to, to our odors. Uh, 1922 uh, was described that they're attracted to carbon dioxide in our exhaled breath. And now we're starting slowly to understand how mosquitoes are actually able to detect us and able to discriminate us from other animals. We've done some work on the uh, egg laying preference of Anopheles mosquitoes, uh, showing that they really like, where do we have them? There. That they uh, like to uh, lay their eggs in pools of water that's close to crops like maize and, and uh, sugar cane because these plants shed their pollen and that, that those pollen are really good nutrients for the mosquitoes. So there is a, a cause and effect there. We've also done some uh, landscape analysis where we've shown that mosquitoes will select plants like the bananas or the mace plants for resting behavior. Uh, so we're getting closer uh, to understand why mosquitoes are doing what they're doing, how they're doing it, but we're still not really there. And this is really required in order for us to develop new tools for vector control. Uh, not least due to the increased resistance to uh, insecticides that's being used indoors with the behavioral resistance making the mosquitoes move back in the landscape. So we need to find new ways of, of uh, controlling the vectors when they're outside. So my uh, talk here is about one potential resource. Sharon will join me after, where we hopefully will convince you that these this approach is actually working. We can actually use, uh, in this case, odors in order to, to uh, control or surveil these insects. Focus of today is these flowers. Um, before going there, is, uh, we'd like to highlight another thing that we're also interested in is when do they display these behaviors? So we know that behaviors are not uh, static. We know that they're highly dynamic. They will uh, go for a resource whenever they're capable of handling the nutrients that they need for that particular moment. And I guess the best known uh, resource would be the blood, which the females will require um, to develop their eggs. But I would claim that of the many resources that are available, the, the one that we know least of is the floral resources. Uh, there's uh, work done by Woody Foster, great work, um, but no one has really attempted uh, to do any systematic analysis of the uh, odors emitted by flowers. Uh, we are really interested in, in this behavior because mosquitoes should, according to behavioral observations, both in the lab and in the field, uh, be attracted to these resources because they need the carbohydrates to get energy for survival as well as, as production. So I will take you through uh, our data and what we came up with and uh, happy to take any comments that you have afterwards. So um, these are pictures of 30 flowering plants commonly found in the field sites of Ethiopia where we work. But you will also recognize a number of these plants as quite common. If you work in Tanzania, uh, Kenya, also Burkina Faso, we see several of these. You can walk around here in Montpellier and you can also find a lot of these ornamental plants. Uh, we selected these because they're quite commonly found in the peridomestic areas of the villages that we're working in. Uh, and we did not have a clue about whether or not these were going to be attractive or not. We just wanted to have a large uh, selection of plants to choose among to see if we're able to address the question at hand. So what we started off with was to go out in the field. We did the dynamic headspace collections from these plants. We went back to Sweden uh, to do very simple white tube assays. 
where we provide mosquitoes a choice between the headspace volatile of individual plants and the solvent control. At the beginning, we were planning only to uh, assess the response of Anopheles arabiensis, the major vector in Ethiopia, and Anopheles calusi, a major vector in Burkina Faso. But at the end, we ended up with testing also of Aedes for comparative uh, reasons. So, uh, this rather complex uh, slide here shows the hierarchical response to the four volumes. And what is quite interesting here is that, irrespective of the species, so we would expect them to not lose radiances and collusive to display very similar responses due to their close relatedness. But we were not really expecting that these would respond very similarly to these four volumes. But if we take an example like here, Senna is the most attractive species for the Anopheles, but it's also quite attractive for Aedes. We can take a, one of the aversive species, Parthenium, which is repellent for all three species. And if we can take a look at each species and find very similar um, responses. There are, of course, differences across species as well. Um, so this was done by flying individual uh, mosquitoes, 30 mosquitoes for each plant. 2,700 mosquitoes later, this was the mm -hmm. um, The next thing we did, uh, since we were really interested in the mechanism, was to take our uh, headspace collections, do ga uh, combine gas chromatography and electroantennagram detection analysis to see which compounds in these quite rather complex odors will mosquitoes respond to. And we also used combined uh, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry to identify the compounds and also at the end quantify uh, the compounds released from these flowers. And in this case, we, we collected from five different individual plants so that we can also look at the variation across species. And again, we did that for all three species. Uh, this, if for those of you not familiar with this technique, we get the chromatogram, would be like this, where we can separate the individual individual components in a rather complex extract. Each uh, peak here on the chromatogram signifies one compound. We can record the electrical activity from the antenna, and uh, wherever we see deflection and depolarization, here it means that. The mosquitoes are able to detect that particular component. So, what we can see from this simple figure is that the response to most of the compounds is conserved across all three species. Not, well, for me, it was uh, interesting to see that Aedes is, is responding uh, to the compounds in a very similar fashion to, to the Anopheles considering the separation over millions of years. Um, to simplify this, uh, we made heat plots where the color here signifies the amplitude of response. And then we repeat this for all 30 species of plants, for three mosquitoes, three biological replicates, and 270 recordings later, this is what we get. Uh, so we've got on the top the plant species. It's not necessary that you need to see it. We have the three mosquito species. And what you can see that in most cases that the response to individual components is very conserved. There are differences. You can see in some cases that the Philonopolis species respond to this compound and not Aedes. Sometimes you have Aedes responding to a single component. But in general, the response is very consistent. Um, so what kind of compounds are we looking at? Um, so, which is one of our uh, goals is to characterize the odor space, the detected odor space on the scales. Um, and up until now, we haven't really found a lot of resources admitting terpenoids. So it was nice to see that we have quite a high number and diversity of terpenoids. 
We also have benzenoids, and not too many of these fatty acid derivatives that we find in many other resources. Um, so you can see the representation then, especially of the terpenoids and the benzenoids here in, in green, and in the red shades, you can find the fatty acid derivatives. The, the size of the circles represent the amplitude of response. Uh, so also realizing and let you know that GCED is not a quantitative uh, method, so you should not take read too much into this. So what can we do with the information that we have obtained? Well, we can look at olfactory differentiation. We can see how will uh, mosquitoes be able to encode odors from an individual uh, plant and discriminate it uh, from another one. And with this multi-dimensional scaling analysis, we can clearly see that mosquitoes, in this case it is FIPPAC, have a neural capacity to differentiate one plant from another, just based on the neural response. We can look at all species. Uh, we can see that the response in general is quite concerned. <coughs> we have some species like up here, uh, where the response, the neural response is very concerned, restricted, and all three species will respond more or less identical to this, uh, these odors. But you have other cases where you have a response in, in two species, in this case, the two anopheles species sitting up here, but Aedas will be down here. So, all of that um, showing us that mosquitoes most likely will use combinatorial coding for dis uh, discriminating flowers. So, um, what factors would con uh, constrain the discrimination of, of floral volatiles? So we did some very simple uh, statistics. We looked at the frequency of bioactive compounds in uh, the odor collections that we made. Uh, we saw that in attractive plants, those are on the left side on these figures, you will see a higher uh, frequency of some compounds, but you have a higher frequency of uh, other compounds in aversive plants. And this is true for all three species. Another factor that we also know is important for discrimination is ratio or release rate, as we used to work with, uh, in that we have some species that will admit a lot of these <coughs> compounds compared to, uh, well, in, if they're attractive, but in, if they're aversive, they will have a different release rate. So, in order to understand the mechanism by which mosquitoes will be able to discriminate one plant from another, what we started off with was to create a synthetic blend of, of these uh, odors. That was a chimeric blend that does not uh, mimic anything that is found in nature. So we based it on, on the statistics. We picked that six compounds uh, that mosquitoes are able to pick. They are frequently abundant in the attractive plants. We also looked at the release rate of these compounds, and we made up a, a synthetic blend that we were hoping to attract the mosquitoes, and yes, they did. So we were able to show in the lab that this six-component blend is able to attract mosquitoes of all three species in a dose-dependent manner. What I don't show here is that we also took this six-component blend and we did a two-choice assay, and um, we allowed the mosquitoes to choose between this synthetic blend and the most uh, attractive headspace extra, and there was no difference. So we were able to show that uh, the response to the six-component blend mimics the response to this uh, the real odor. What else can we do? So we can test the hypothesis here. What happens if we change the ratio of individual components in this six component blend? We know that the ratio can change depending on the plant. So in, in this case, we will have a, a low ratio of this compound here, uh, if they're attractive, but have a, a 
if we have a higher ratio of this component in a, in a versus plant, it makes the plant or the response be negative. And the same thing here that we may have a compound with a low uh, release rate in a versus plant, but a high uh, ratio in the attractive plant. So we tested this, and this is uh, one result that we obtained. So this is the response to the synthetic blend. We change one of the components 50%, nothing happens. We uh, increase it by 100% and we see a universal response. And uh, we see that for another component as well. Now we can try it for the other two species um, and see a very similar effect. We have some species specific differences showing that some of the species actually have a tolerance to this, uh, this change. One thing that I forgot here uh, was that we did not only test it on the females, we also tested the six component blend on males to show the same effect. Then uh, another thing we can do is to change the composition. So what would happen if we would take a compound that is present in one of the adversity plants, so it's a species specific compound, and add it to this attractive plant. If we do that, if we test first of the, the, the six component blend, and then we add one component, uh, or another component, we see that this addition of a single component is uh, eliciting a aversive response. Again, showing that we're able to uh, change the behavioral response by just changing one factor. So, what have we shown? Um, we've shown that attraction of mosquitoes to fall others is conserved across even distantly related species. Uh, we are able to show that a six component synthetic blend is sufficient to elect, uh, elicit attraction and also mimics the response of mosquitoes to their preferred host plants. Now, we can also conclude that mosquitoes discriminate among floral odors based on combinatorial uh, coding, which is dependent on both the composition of the blend as well as the ratio of the bioactive compounds. This is where we currently stand. We have a number of other projects either uh, in line of writing up where we show an age-dependent effect that uh, mosquitoes will change the behavioral response to floral odors depending on odors. But the uh, age, uh, we are about to identify the molecular mechanism uh, regulating this. Um, we're on our way to identify the receptors to, to these compounds through a big screening of receptors of both Anopheles gluzi and Aedes aegypti, trying to link not only the four odors, but all of the 140 bioactive compounds that we identified so far, coming from <laughs> flowers, coming from different host species, to other position sites and, uh, and other resources that mosquitoes are using. And we're making our way into the brain of Aedes aegypti to come even closer to the mechanism underlying discrimination. <coughs> Where we're also going is up into the field, which was not difficult in the times of COVID. Um, but we managed last year to uh, get our six components into the field, both in. in Ethiopia here outside of Arba Minch in southern Ethiopia, but also here in Bobo Dielaso in Burkina Faso, where we set up some very simple uh, field experiments where we conducted dose response uh, analysis. Uh, this is the results from Ethiopia where we are able to show a very nice dose response analysis. This is uh, an experiment done in an area where we have a very low population of mosquitoes. Uh, but we're still able to show that we're able uh, to attract and capture mosquitoes uh, using this odor. And then thanks much to uh, TV, we were able to set up an experiment in Burkina Faso in an area where the population size is significantly higher. 
And again, we were able to uh, reproduce the results that we did uh, collected in Ethiopia, showing that we're able to collect not only females, but also males. And what I'm not showing you here is that among the females, we get a range of uh, different physiological states, including host seeking, blood fit, as well as gravity. And the really nice thing with this odor blend is that we do not need carbon dioxide. So mm -hmm. it's a very versatile uh, tool to use in uh, areas like uh, Africa. Um, the individual components are not very expensive. So we can uh, manufacture this uh, odor quite cheaply. And the formulation uh, of this uh, blend could be done in a very similar fashion as we have done uh, for the next, you can see the next talk, uh, where we can use a polymer to release the, the blend over a very long time period. Uh, even though we used traps uh, in these uh, areas here, we're also seeing that we could use other devices in order to develop more efficient, attractive toxic sugar base. Thumbs up. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. So it looks like um, the four different diagnoses are conserved response across a uh, kilometer uh, distance. Most of those are very I was wondering whether it could instead be. Convergent traps. I mean, if you do have um, performance preference ratio, if most people just go to the flowers that provide best fitness, then so did you um, look at the performance preference relationship? How the most people preferring the plant that provide them the best fitness? We haven't done that. We know uh, some of the plants that we're including here, uh, Woody Foster has looked at. Uh, sugar content of the plants. Uh, and there, he, well, we can see that the, the results that we get behaviorally is correlating with what he obtains. But he was only including six of the species. Yeah, I think six species that we also included. But we did not have the manpower to, to look at uh, fitness effects of all of these three species of plants. Anna, uh, if you come back just to the further side, uh, did you test a uh, more conventional trap? I would like to have a comparison of the numbers of the things that you could uh, track with the CC for instance. No, we did not. Okay. <laughs> you know, this uh, push pull. Combination has been discussed for many years, and you have IRAs on the A line as pushing the skills away, and it's certain them up some. But, but the problem has always been around, and you say these are these both these can be incorporated both because they're cheap, but how cheap are they? And, and it's even it cost around two dollars per year to create to prevent to protect the person. Mm -hmm. And, and and to get funding, and that is all malaria control is not funding. You yep. need to be at that level on the basis. Yep. Where are you? Um, so the amount of, of chemicals that we need for the lures uh, is not a lot. Because the release rate that we're talking about is nanogram levels per minute. Oh, of course. Uh, so the costs we haven't calculated uh, right now. I think. Uh, the current cost for the, the lure that we used in what in the study that will be presented by Sharon, they're about five euros each, uh, and they will last for at least four weeks. So the cost is, of course, higher, but we uh, do not know exactly how many lures that we would need. So we would need to have uh, conduct more landscape analysis to understand where do we place the traps, how many traps do we need to get the most efficiency. Um, I do not believe that you need to put traps throughout a village, but maybe at the 
the periphery of the village to get the most effect. Yes, a uh, great presentation. I have two questions. First one about mechanism. What do we know about the arteries that are now involved in the attraction? It's the same one, different uh, receptors involved, combination or very specific ones uh, according to the molecules. And second one, do we, what do we know about the, the, the concentration response? I mean, do you see some attractiveness for some concentration, but an opposite response based on, on the concentration you put on? Uh, and you know that's change. Okay. So, uh, first question. Uh, so, we're, as I said, we're trying to identify the receptors for these uh, 90 plus odors that we have identified. We have, when Aman was in my lab during his postdoc time, we have actually identified receptors for one of these flowers. And we can see that they are highly selected uh, to some of the compounds. There are some receptors that will be more broadly tuned, but in most cases, they are narrowly tuned to individual components. Response to your, well, you can see here, um, this is the typical behavior that we, we get if we uh, do a dose response analysis that there is always an, an optimum. We see that in the lab, we see it in the field. If we go above this dose, there will be a, a version. The uh, way that we uh, release the ball of this odor blend is through a weak test sensor, which allows us con to control, uh, first of all, maintain the ratios, uh, but also to control the release rate. So we have a good understanding of, of what actually comes out of, of our vein. We have one question for the mutual participants. So do you know or think the other preferences mosquitoes show will be shared or concert in other insects? Yes, one thing I didn't say uh, here by catch zero. No, no honeybees, no nothing. I think we got six flies or something uh, in, uh, in the traps in, in Burkina Faso. Very good. And in uh, Ethiopia, we had random insects uh, coming in in very low numbers, less than 10 in total. Can you explain that? Why? I think uh, it's about the unique code that we identified. Uh, the mosquitoes appears to have well, there are two explanations. Either mosquitoes have uh, evolved a unique way of deciphering floral odors uh, or that the traps that we're using would prevent other insects to enter which i doubt because uh, we in other experiments we have actually been able to collect other species of insects why, why do you think the high concentrations trigger aversion rather than contractions and <laughs> uh, this is a common uh, observation that we have that they really don't like the higher concentrations. I think it just smells too bad for them. Um, if you want to go in deeper into that, if you want to look at the neural coding, that it's likely uh, caused by projection neurons innovating the tunnel lobe that will send a, uh, the signal to the lateral frontal cerebrum, which will signal aversion, which has been shown in, in other insects as well. Well, we have to move on. Thank you, Rita. Hello, our next speaker, Sharon, is also from uh, the Swedish University of Agriculture and Science in Sweden. Okay, so you heard from Rickert, who uh, has been talking to you about floral, floral odors and floral resources. Um, and we've known for a long time that floral uh, that flowers and plants have been a resource for mosquitoes. And 
perhaps a little tongue in cheek, uh, I'm now going to talk about another resource that up until now we haven't really explored as something that mosquitoes can use in order to be uh, another or supplemental resource for them. So malaria mosquitoes take the piss, little tongue in cheek there, um, acquisition and utilization of cattle urine as a potential nutrient resource. You've seen this picture before, um, and Rickard did a very nice job of, of taking you through all the different parts of the life cycle and where we are currently looking um, for this selection and discrimination of resources. But one of the things he didn't point at, and I'm going to point at now, is this lovely little yellow puddle. Um, most of us have been around in rural environments where there are tons of mosquitoes and also tons of cattle and other uh, barnyard animals who are giving lots of you know urine-like odor <laughs> into the environment. Um, and in this case, uh, originally we, when we were looking at this, we thought about um, cows and cattle, they, we know that they're a host, um, mosquitoes feed on them. Maybe that the, the, these mosquitoes are queuing in on urine as a potential indicator of where the host is in the environment. So it's a, a potential you know, host location cue. And that's where we sort of started with this idea. Um, however, <laughs> as we went on, um, we needed to think a little bit carefully about the ecology of the mosquitoes that we're looking at, and we're currently looking at the Anopheles mosquitoes. So these are the ones that are uh, among those that transmit malaria. And Anopheles mosquitoes, it's been shown that they emerge as undernourished, uh, undernourished adults. They, they really need a boost of energy when they, when they emerge. Um, they have low tenoral reserves of lipids, of proteins, and of carbohydrates. Um, these adult females, when they are emerging, they actually use up 50% of the protein that they have accumulated while they've been larvae. So they're already massively down when they, when they come out um, as, as uh, young adults. We're also looking at the fact that they are not that good. I mean, yes, they use blood to, to be their major source for protein to create eggs, but they're not that good at using it, surprisingly. Um, they're only using about 80% of that meal in order to generate the needed protein for oogenesis. Uh, sorry, they're only using 20%, they're excreting 80% <laughs> um, And then we have also, of course, that, that uh, you can compensate, um, the, the mosquitoes here can compensate by using carbohydrates in order to uh, make up for this inability of theirs to, to really work with, with, the, uh, with the protein. So earlier studies, before, before we go on to this, earlier studies were showing that, yeah, this idea of mosquitoes following cattle urine is, is real. They, they can show it. They can attract these mosquitoes in, uh, in the wild. Um, to, they would attract them to the cow odor itself here. So wet blanket wrapped around the cow for an hour, then put in a trap. Um, then they had urine here, um, fresh or aged urine. They had a, an empty resting box, just a box sitting. And they also did the human landing catches. And when we look at the results from this, you can, you can very clearly see that when urine was presented, the mosquitoes went to it. Um, and they went to it very much like they were going towards uh, a host. So again, we thought, hey, this is, this is good. This is following what we think, all right. Um, but, we started asking those questions and we started to think maybe it's a little more complicated than that. So are mosquitoes actually using the, this as a resource, as a, as a nutrient resource? Um, so this is the outline of the talk. We're going to talk about, yes, the, there is actual, uh, actual information now that we have that shows they are using it. They are acquiring it and they have the ability to make use of this nitrogenous uh, compound, at least urea. Um, they are allocating this nutrients to different goals in host seeking and in gravid mosquitoes. Um, they are allocating them to flight, to survival, and to reproduction. We have the attraction of both host seeking and blood fed mosquitoes to the urine, to, to the fresh and to aged cow urine. 
And we talk about aged cattle urine because one of the other things that we know, um, sensei fly is very attractive to aged, aged cattle urine. So this was another thing. Oh, maybe we have a, a conservation here somehow. Okay. Um, identification of the synthetic odor blends. Very much as Rickard has just described for the plants, we went in looking um, to identify a synthetic odor blend that could potentially attract these post-seeking and blood-fed and gravel mosquitoes. Um, and again, in the absence of CO2, because we all know if you've been out in the field and you've been trying to collect mosquitoes, uh, and you go out with these big CO2 canisters or you have to have CO2 uh, dry ice with you. And it can be very um, uh, difficult. It's much easier if you don't need the extra CO2. So we started by asking the questions, do they use it? Do, do mosquitoes actually imbibe um, uh, urea and, and in, or, sorry, urine and its main component, urea? <laughs> And so when we gave them the opportunity to, find, to, to, to try and see, what we found was that they were imbibing urine pretty much at the same rate that they would imbibe water. Um, if you check against sucrose, of course, they're imbibing much more sucrose. This is for the host seeking, and this is for the, the blood fed, um, three days after blood meal. And if you do the same thing with urea, you can, you can see that uh, there is a dose dependency for this, this uh, imbibement of urea, and that they do have, it seems, some kind of preference for the amount that they're taking in. But when we looked at that a little more carefully, we, we looked at the concentration of the diet they were taking in and the amount, the volume that they took in. And we found that it, it, it's a, a correlation, a log correlation. So as you increase the uh, concentration, you increase the amount of the diet that they actually take in in a logarithmic fashion. So then we know they use it. So now what are they doing with it? So we're gonna talk about survival, psychomotility, and reproduction. So here with survival, we're looking at um, a situation here where we've uh, fed the mosquitoes on the uh, different urines, and then we've allowed them to live out the rest of their days. And what we see is that for sugar, we're feeding on sugar, they last as the normal sort of length of time, maximum time of 28. Then when we're looking at the uh, urine, we're finding that the el most elderly urine, the most aged urine, is the one that seems to be providing them with the longest lifespan. And if you look down at the bottom, 72 hours is really not a good time. <laughs> they don't do well. And we started looking into the literature, what's happening at 72 hours. And at 72 hours, cow urine is pretty much chock-a-block full of toxic bacteria. As the communities are changing over time, 72 hours is when you really have very uh, aggressively toxic bacteria in the urine. Um, so that's, that, that correlated with what we were finding. And when we went over and we started looking at the urea, what we found was as you increased the amount of urea uh, that they were taking in, you increased the, uh, the longevity. They increased how long they could, they could live. So then we decided uh, to do something fun. We decided to tether a mosquito to a twirly egg here um, and let the mosquitoes fly. And what we wanted to know here was if you give them urine, are they going to use that, that extra urine, that supplementary meal of urine? Are they going to use it in uh, generating more flight activity? Um, and so were they going to fly longer distances? Were they going to fly more bouts? So this, these were our questions. And for each color you'll see in sucrose, this is the distance that they flew um, during the time that we had. This is over the day. Um, and this is the number of bouts they were flying at that time. And where you see the gray bar, that's uh, scotophase. And next is uh, the daytime hours. So with sucrose, we find that around the end of scouted phase into daytime hours, they were very active um, and they had more flight bouts during those times. Something that we would expect. With fresh urine, we found that around that change, that crepuscular time, that change between dawn and dusk, we found that there was 
or sorry, uh, that time between uh, at dusk. No, at dawn. <laughs> sorry, pardon me. Um, we found that with fresh urine, they were more active, and they so not only were they more active, they were flying more. But if you look down along the different uh, kinds of urine or the different ages of urine that we have, we see quite different patterns. So obviously the mosquitoes are actually responding in a different way to the urine that is present for them. Um, and certainly when you look at this 72 hours, this time that you know should be quite toxic for them, um, you see that maybe if they have taken it in, they get really active um, and they fly a lot. Um, and we also see this happening around uh, 106, uh, the, the one week mark. And this we think is that they are starting to do major search. Um, either this is not a good resource for them or really this is toxic, I need to get away from here. Um, so this is, this is the idea between these two sort of time points. <clears throat> now, we did that with host seeking. You can see with gravid, whoops, sorry. With gravid, um, the patterns change. There's a lot more of this spread out activity, uh, less kind of uh, narrowed in on individual times of day. And when we add in uh, looking at the urea, you can also see that for most of the doses of urea, you see an increased amount of activity and an increased amount of movement, um, both and both and both uh, distance uh, for the host seeking and for the gravid. Uh, again, the the activity spreads out over the day. So here we decided to ask the question about um, are they using, could they possibly be using pools of urine or, or urine cues um, as oviposition uh, stimulus? And when we did that, we found pretty much no. They, they didn't do that. They didn't, uh, they didn't seem to change their uh, behavior when it came to finding the urine. Uh, it was quite similar to water. However, what we did find was that um, the number of eggs that they were laying changed. And urine that was about 24 hours old uh, was quite a good age for them. And under the conditions where they were fed on 24 hour urine, uh, they were laying larger eggs. The same thing for urea. As we increased the amount of urea, they were increasing the, the number of eggs that they were laying. We also have an increase in egg size around the same time and around the same concentration of urea. And we have an increase in the size of the larvae as well, as would be expected. So the take home message for this part, we have host seeking and blood feeding, uh, Anopheles arabiensis are actively feeding on, uh, or will actively feed on urine and urea, and they regulate that, that uptake. Um, Host-seeking females are allocating the, nu the nutrients to increase the flight activity um, and to lower and, and, and to a lower extent to increase survival. Blood-fed mosquitoes are predominantly allocating those nutrients to the reproductive parameters, less so um, to the mobility, and that is also increasing the, uh, the number of eggs, the size of eggs, and the larvae. <coughs> so then... How do they do it? How do they find the urine in the environment? And you will, I think, recognize um, some of this information. So here are uh, the different pots of urine that are being aged for different amounts of time. And once they've been aged for the correct amount of time, we did odor collections from this. And we used um, a flight tunnel assay in order to assess the proportion of the mosquitoes that were attracted to the different, um, the different concentration or the different ages of the urine from fresh to one week old. And we found that fresh and 24 hours were the most attractive. And that was um, true for host seeking. For gravid, it appeared that they were um, quite active anyway. So it was difficult for us to assess whether or not there was uh, an effect of uh, the odor, the urine odor compared to the controls. Um, then we went in, and as Rickard described before, we did this GCEAD. And in doing GCEAD, um, I'm presenting it a little bit differently, but it's quite, quite the same uh, set of information. 
Along here, this is the compounds um, that were found in the FID or in the GC traces. And this is the response of the EAG to fresh and then 24, 72, and uh, one week aged urine. And we found that we did have some consistent peaks that, that went all the way through um, that were biologically active. But as you increased from fresh to 24 to 72 to one week, the number of bioactive compounds reduced. So the number of compounds that the mosquitoes were physiologically responding to reduced. So in uh, the fresh and in the 24 hour, we had higher numbers compared to those later on. And then we took these extracts uh, that we had and we uh, tested, sorry, we took these um, synthetic blends that we've made, um, the way that Richard talked about those uh, that we made for the floral blend. In this case, we used all of the um, compounds that you see here that were identified. We put them together in the ratios that, that came off the GC. And we looked to see whether or not we had behavioral response, and we did have behavioral response, particularly to the 24-hour blend um, for the host seeking. We took this into the field. Uh, we, went in, we went to Ethiopia, um, to the center of Ethiopia. We took it into the field, and we asked the question to the, to the mosquitoes, what do you think? And in this case, we were using the 24-hour blend. The, the one that did best. And what was very nice to see is the mosquitoes said, yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so Arabiensis and Culex were responding to the blends. Um, and we had in Arabiensis, who's seeking recently blood fed and rabid mosquitoes were all uh, preferentially coming to uh, the urine beta traps, or the urine odor beta traps. So the take home message here is that Host seeking blood fed and rabbit are attracted to the odor of this 24 hour aged urine that we can take it into the field. This is independent of CO2, hooray, hooray. Um, and that this is reflecting, this attraction is reflecting um, this need for supplemental <laughs> fat, uh, acquiring and, and, and uh, allocating these nitrogenous compounds to, the, to uh, mosquito metabolism <coughs> and reproduction. Scaling it up. So we got uh, adventurous. <laughs> we decided we now have a blend that we can use that is not uh, CO2 dependent. Let's go into the field and let's set up an intervention experiment. So the first year we went in, we chose two villages in rural Ethiopia, separated by um, several kilometers, more than, more than 30, I believe, kilometers from each other, um, and separated in the landscape. So they're kind of uh, rural islands. You can see here, um, this is the one village, and this one goes along this way here. So this is the second village. They're roughly the same number of houses, same number of people. They do the same kind of farming. Um, so we tried to keep as close to a similar kind of lifestyle between the villages as possible. And what we did was in the first year, we just surveyed. So we just put out traps, one tra you know, a, a set of traps every month um, to collect mosquitoes, see what did we have in the area and how much and what was that seasonal variation in the mosquitoes. Um, and so what we can see, I think quite nicely, is that um, we have similar conditions between both the villages, um, where the blue village here is our intervention village, that's the next year, uh, and MAGA here is the control village. And around short rains, and then again at the long rains, we have this increase in uh, in uh, number of mosquitoes. And that was for traps indoors and for uh, indoor collections. We also collected outdoors. I have that data, but I'm, I'm not showing it here. It's also quite similar between the two. We then also went in and assessed the uh, malaria prevalence in the village. And when we did that, we found again between the two villages, it's very, very similar. That we had the increase in the long rains and in the short rains for the malaria. Um, and of course it was reduced in the dry period. So then it comes to the intervention year. And in the intervention year, what we do is uh, we set out for every third house um, in the village, we set out these traps. Um, 
And the, these are uh, the Nietzsche pseudotraps. And we set them out and uh, hung these lures that Rickard was talking about. So we used the 24 hour blend, we infused these um, polymers, the polymer beads, with the blend, mixed them together in the ratios that we needed, and we had four, four weeks worth of scent that was consistent and, and had a consistent release rate. So it was quite nice. You put them out, leave them, right, for, for four weeks. We powered them with the solar cells that you can see um, at the top here. And we did this in the one village. That was our intervention village. So we also have that control village, the other village, where we're going to watch now in the intervention year what's happening between those two villages. And it was a good idea that we did because in the year that we started uh, to do this work, we had a malaria epidemic in the area, in the region. Um, so here, we have our intervention village of Ulu. We still see that there is an increase um, in, over the long rains in Ulu. Uh, however, it's nothing compared to that that happened in the intervention village. And we can see that both for the trapping indoors and for the uh, sorry, for the, for the um, collections, the spray collections indoors. And what we found was we had a 58.4% reduction rate, um, and we had an 80% reduction rate in um, the IHSD and the IRB. So here we thought, mm, I think we're having an effect on the vectors, but you never know. You can really knock down a vector population and still not affect the disease transmission in the area. So we had to go back and look at the disease transmission. And what we found was that, yes, we still had this increase in the intervention village. This is a blue here. In the intervention village, there still was an increase over the long rains and the short rains. But when you compare that to the increase that we found uh, in the control village, um, the difference here was there was a rate of 21% in the control village of malaria. Uh, prevalence, and we were down to 6% in the intervention village. So we did actually have an effect on uh, on the disease itself by, by controlling, just doing effectively a mass trapping experiment. So what are we taking away from this? Yes, mosquitoes do take the piss. <laughs> um, they use it. It's the nitrogenous compounds, we believe, that they are using. Um, and they are using them to increase their flight mobility, their survival, and reproduction, and this is state-dependent. Um, the need, need for these nitrogenous compounds is reflected in the fact that they actively search for it, um, and that they have a detection method to use to do this, and the, the really nice part is we can exploit it, and we think we've demonstrated quite clearly that we can exploit this, uh, this kind of technology for mass trapping. Um, and have an actual effect on the malaria or the disease transmission in the area. And with that, I would like to acknowledge um, a few people here. Rickard, you've already met, and is in the room up there. Um, we have Mangistu, who the first half of this study, uh, which has just been published a few weeks ago, uh, he was the PhD student who did that work. Yared is the PhD student who did the work on the intervention. And Hapti is the professor at Addis Ababa University who uh, was the on-site supervisor there. Joran is our chemist. And one person who's not on this, but he is in the room who's part of this study is Richard Hopkins at the back there. Um, please, if you're interested in this, also talk to Richard. <laughs> um, he, he was a big part in the design and the discussions around especially the landscape aspects um, to this study. And with that, I will point, of course, at our founder and then say thank you. And uh, very nice talk. So now we all need to start using urine in our mosquito rearing. Uh, but um, so my question would be um, so bacteria also. Play a big role in um, the production of opportunities for other mosquito species. So, have you tried to identify the bacteria or sterilize the, the, the cow urine to see uh, 
which false which bacteria causes? Um, we didn't look for which bacteria it was. We did when we were struggling because, of course, we didn't think it was going to be an open position Q. We really did. Um, so we, we did try at that time to heat sterilize uh, the urine and try again to see if we could find any difference between urine and heat sterilized urine. But we really didn't. We didn't see anything. Um, but so in, in, in terms of um, the cues, the odor cues, uh, we know that they're attractive. But in terms of the actual bacteria themselves, we, we didn't see that uh, effect for the position. I'd love to know what bacteria it is. Um, you can go out and you can look in the literature and see what bacteria are commonly found in cow urine. Uh, but we didn't do it for, for this. We did talk to our neighbors who uh, do a lot of microbial work. <laughs> Uh, and they looked at us and went, do you have at least one postdoc and a PhD student to work on this? So we kind of thought we don't, we don't have those resources. Hi, Sharon. Hi. You give me a renewed reason to piece in my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> um, your presentation uh, raised a question um, that I'd like to share with you. Did you try to see you given uh, the choice to pick up your feet or to navigate to a blood or, or urine or something? Yeah, like we, did, we didn't give them the opportunity for blood. We did for sugar. Um, yeah, and one experiment that we keep talking about doing that we've never actually done is to lace the sugar with urine. Not because we think that's in any way um, ecological, but it's the idea of if we give them a driver that they really like and then we add another driver to that. Does it do anything? It's more of a question of you know, trying to figure out the mechanism. But ecologically, I mean, they're not going to come in contact with the urine and the sugar at the same time, or the urine and the blood. At the same but in time. terms of feeding preference, imagine you use a hemodex system and you need to sugar between blood and urine. Do you, do you think about that? Well, there's an interest. Uh, <laughs> did we do that? We, we, we didn't, no, we didn't do the blood and the urine, no. Um, I would suspect that they would go for the blood every time. My own personal experience with this, I, I, I would think that they would. Um, this is probably a supplementary feeding system that they have. Um, it's a lot less risky to feed on urine than it would be to feed on blood, especially if you're going for that second meal. Uh, we know that mosquitoes, if they don't feel that they have had enough of a proteinaceous blood meal, they will go back for another one. And if, if this increasing the egg number, increasing the size of the eggs, if urine can substitute for that, maybe it would be interested to look at blood and urine with mosquitoes who have had a first, but interrupted blood meal, and then see what they do. I'd be really keen to see what happened then. Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Just um, maybe a sweet question, but uh, did you observe any uh, larvae uh, in the urine the breeding site, for example, first. And imagine uh, if the concentration would be more adequate, if you have a less concentration of urine, do you think this could be a suitable breeding site for larvae? Do they may not need taking some instruments from that? Did you try just to see if it could be suitable? For yeah. Larvae? We didn't see larvae um, in the in the urine, but then we also didn't, you know, our urine was sort of yeah. covered and, and you know, kept carefully so that nothing really got into it. Um, again, we, we know that they're probably not choosing, actively choosing those areas. But we also know, I mean, cows pee everywhere. I mean, and definitely they go down for a wash, for a drink, for whatever. Um, you're going to have urine in, in those areas. So I, it would not surprise me if there was a lot of cattle urine in places where the mosquitoes are breeding. Uh, but I don't think it's a determining factor. I'm sorry, but we have to start here because we are one of them. Thank you, Tara. Hope you enjoyed lunch and a smoke for those who like that. Uh, so we'll have three talks uh, in this session. And the first one is from Marie de Stop. I'm looking forward to hearing this. Uh, dark room uh, right after lunch. Uh, I will start with a small disclaimer first. 
Um, I'm still analyzing my results, so don't expect too much uh, details. Yeah, at this point. Um, so, uh, as all of you probably know, mosquitoes uh, find hosts in different ways. Uh, well, using long range, mid range, and short range cues, but I guess there will be lots of talk about the data, so I will not dwell on that too much. Um, everyone knows that uh, mosquitoes find some people more attractive to others. Um, and of course, the question keeps arriving why is this the case? Um, Niels for Girls, who is also in the audience, has shown that people that are poorly attracted to mosquitoes have a very, um, oh, sorry, people that are highly attracted to mosquitoes have a uh, very high bacterial density on their skin. And they also have a um, lower bacterial diversity, um, which explains that, uh, well, which partly explains some differences in attractiveness to, um, to humans. But we know several other factors and like bacterial composition. Um, and other things, why people differ in uh, attractiveness, or well, the how, because why it's still unknown. Why is it that uh, mosquitoes find some people more attractive to others? Uh, and maybe is there an evolutionary reason why some people are more attractive to mosquitoes than others? Um, well, it's just a quick joke, obviously, but uh, I think there may be some truth in it. Um, if you look at the modern nose death hypothesis, uh, it means that mosquitoes would find the best host that is most optimal for their offspring um, for reproduction. So that would make uh, the human blood composition a very important factor to further begin to find and see why we humans differ uh, in attractiveness to mosquitoes. Uh, how would this work? Um, as you can see, here we have like a, a skin overview. Over here we have bacteria, viruses, fungi, everything from the skin microbiome, uh, all these bacteria produce specific uh, metabolites, uh, volatiles that can be uh, either attractive to mosquitoes or they can also produce like antimicrobial peptides that stop pathogen invasion. So it's both ways, right? And, um, skin, it both defends against pathogens, but it also facilitates the growth of uh, commensal bacteria. Um, and this is all part of homeostatic uh, immunity. Um, and well, part of this homeostatic immunity also shows that Staphylococcus epidermidis, uh, a bacteria on the skin of which we know that it can be attracted to mosquitoes, um, the colonization of the bacteria on your skin induces increased levels of interleukin 1 alpha, which in turn promotes the um, cytokine production by T cells, uh, which uh, leads to host defense and skin inflammation. So I think there is so much going on on your skin that could explain. Um, or that could give us some more deeper reasoning why uh, some people are more attracted to mosquitoes than others. Um, and then one could also wonder, does the human skin directly influence mosquito blood feeding if they take up a meal? How uh, important is our skin uh, in this interaction? Um, well, very uh, quickly, some of my project. Um, as you know, skin microbiota produce certain volatiles that promote attraction to mosquitoes or not. Um, and I think that blood composition could play a role in this. So uh, blood composition determines your skin microbiome, which the volatile that directly. Um, and then my bigger research question is what is the relationship between human attractiveness to anopheles colutsa mosquitoes and mosquito egg production? Um, uh, well, so we think, I think, but that um, if you are more attracted to mosquitoes, Mosquitoes had a higher reproductive success after they had uh, feeding on your blood. Um, so the questions are, um, how does human blood composition affect attractiveness to mosquitoes? Uh, how does human blood composition affect uh, mosquito egg production? Uh, and how does this affect uh, skin bacterial composition and skin polyplasts that are produced? Um, building further upon the work that Niels did before. Um, to find out all of this, I started a study with the participants. We had 49 men that participated. Uh, they were all adults. Um, they were healthy, which meant they had no medicine intake, no skin conditions, and were not overly sensitive to mosquito bites. They, had, they didn't smoke. 
their body mass index was lower than 25, and all the participants visited for four times with five week intervals um, to make sure that uh, we had different mosquitoes each time. Uh, the trial went on from October 2020 to March 2021. Uh, and for every visit, the uh, participants were asked 48 hours beforehand not to use any skin product anymore, only shower uh, by using a special shower gel, which did not have any perfumes. Uh, and then for 24 hours beforehand, to not stop, uh, to not shower at all, uh, not to drink any alcohol, not to eat any garlic, onion, or chili uh, products, and also not to eat any banana or citrus fruit, because we know some of these are uh, correlated with the traffic to mosquitoes. Um, then, during every visit, first blood of the participants was collected, uh, and later on I will use this, or I have used this, to test the immune response and look at cytokine production after adding specific um, pathogenic stimuli. Um, we will also check the blood metabolome of the uh, blood and test uh, albumin and glucose uh, concentrations. But um, apart from the blood collection, we also used it for um, the feeding of monoclonal foods and mosquitoes. We did this both in vivo and in vitro. Um, in vivo, just holding your arm <laughs> on a bucket with 20 mosquitoes in there, and in vitro, using a hematech dog here. Uh, again, with um, 20 mosquitoes in there. Um, the mosquitoes had 15 minutes to feed, and then the arm was taken off, and we would uh, continue. Uh, seeing how this would um, develop. Uh, and we looked at this in vivo versus in vitro to see if there was any skin effect of this feeding. Um, afterwards, we collected uh, all the mosquitoes that fed blood. Um, we put every mosquito in a small cuvette uh, and took a picture from above so we could actually measure their wing length, but also their abdomen size later on to see uh, how much blood they ingested. Um, this is quite a lot of mosquitoes that we had in total. Uh, we had almost 6,000 photos of uh, mosquito uh, abdomens. Um, every mosquito afterward was put in a um, opposition tube, just a 50 ml tube, with filter paper at the bottom to water in there uh, as a like opposition uh, tube. We had some um, cotton wool with sugar where they could feed on, and we monitored the mosquito uh, every day to see in daylight and and if they still live. Um, if the mosquito laid eggs, we took a picture, so we could count the number of eggs later on, uh, and we checked the survival, as I already told you, uh, and this also uh, accumulated quite a lot of photos of this. Um, apart from the uh, blood collection and mosquito feeding, we also collected um, cotton pads that were stored or worn by a volunteer overnight on an island plaster on their feet. Uh, to collect uh, volatiles, and um, with these volatiles, we want to um, test uh, how attractive uh, every participant was. Uh, for this, we used a uh, triple dual choice ultrathermometer. Some of you probably may know this, but uh, very quickly um, over here, we released mosquitoes. The mosquitoes can then fly towards either side uh, of the trapping device. Um, we had an air current coming in from here, just uh, with air, filled air, so no other odors. Uh, and we also include CO2 as a um, post seeking response. Um, the dual, triple dual choice olfactometer is just three uh, olfactometers right on top of each other, so we could uh, test more uh, mosquitoes in one go. Um, every time we release uh, 30 mosquitoes from this point. The mosquitoes had 15 minutes to find uh, a host. And then they could choose uh, between the tracking devices. Um, and we wanted to do this by testing the relative attractiveness to mosquitoes. So we tested every human sample with uh, against the standard of 0.025% ammonia, um, which is known to be mildly attractive to mosquitoes. Um, and then I calculated the relative attractiveness as the number of mosquitoes in the trapping device divided by the total number of mosquitoes that flew out of the release stage. I can already offer, show you a small glimpse of what you have to come. So we have 49 participants in total that visited for four times. Uh, these are very preliminary data. 
uh, but I still want to share something. Uh, and uh, I have no true statistics yet uh, because there are so many other factors to be taken into account, and I really want to make sure that the things that I do present are really you know, well, or, well, true. Obviously. Um, so, correct from the development size of these type of things. Uh, to start, over here we have uh, a box plot of all the participants and the number of eggs that were laid per mosquito. You can see that there's quite a difference. Uh, over here, the lowest is around 60, and I think the highest is slightly above 100 on average. Um, but you can also see that there is very large variation um, in the number of eggs that the mosquito laid per person as well. Um, so, in that regard, I think it's good that every human came back four times for the mosquito feeding to make sure that there is not um, a weak effect of the mosquito. Um, if we look at the feeding method that was used, you can see that the number of eggs per mosquito, well, it didn't really seem to differ, did it? Um, this was in vivo and this was in vitro feeding, uh, which is actually quite interesting because I expected that with the um, in vivo feeding, people would probably maybe move slightly more or maybe mosquitoes would be attracted more to the um, skin uh, of the humans itself compared to just um, a membrane in the individual feeding. Um, but this apparently for a number of eggs did not matter. Um, but this is not with the blood size incorporated yet, which uh, I think may, um, may slightly change. So we'll have to see and uh, wait until the further analysis. Um, I also quickly tested if blood type influenced on the side at laying. Um, over here, you can see the number of people uh, with each blood type. Uh, well, obviously, blood type AB was quite low because it's, not, it's quite rare. But unfortunately, we also did not have many people with blood type B in our uh, population. Um, still, I think you cannot really see a very large variation uh, in the number of blood type, uh, mean number of eggs laid per mosquito. Uh, which is quite interesting because last year a paper by Canada came out that showed that not the Stevens I made more eggs on blood type B and that people with blood type B were also more attractive to this kind of mosquito. So uh, this either shows that there is a very large difference in um, how anophilus salutsi or anophilus suspensi um, has the whole host thinking mechanism, or um, maybe it is a difference in methods that they're being. Use, but uh, we will dive into that a bit more later on. Um, if we look at the relative attractiveness data that I gathered, you can see that there's quite some variation as well. Um, and I also incorporated a blend. This was just a cotton pad that was not uh, kept on well, any human, but it was stored in a uh, class there. And everything, what we did, uh, we also tested it in the uh, olfactometer against the um, standard. And interestingly, I think it's a bit higher than I realized or than I uh, anticipated it would be, but you can still see that it's lower uh, than the humans. Uh, so in that way, uh, we did something right. Um, and now, of course, the question arises, um, how does right attractiveness correlate with the number of eggs that mosquitoes produce every visit? Um, that is the figure I guess I'm we'll be waiting on. <laughs> it's not very, very uh, clear yet. So I guess <laughs> we'll have to see uh, with further analysis if I can make sense of these data. But so far, uh, it doesn't look very promising. Um, I have to say that this is um, uh, in this figure. I um, separated every visit from every human. So uh, sometimes people were a bit more attracted from one visit to another. Uh, and okay, so it's a bit um, spiraled that way. Uh, so I guess we will have to. Uh, see uh, later on it's really uh, if there is a correlation uh, after all. Um, to quickly discuss some things, uh, my next step, uh, next step will be to complete my statistical analysis. Uh, we also incorporate a statistician um, to make sure that we're doing everything correctly. Uh, and I will continue with the other analysis as well of data that I gather. Uh, the size of contradiction numbers, the people too bad that I am also looking at the blood mats below and the uh, skin wall and also bacteria as well. Um, and I think something that already comes up, uh, if you look at my, my trial outline, um, I've used quite a nested design with four visits, um, 
all the uh, participants, or as I slightly begin to wonder now, is this really the best way? Uh, wouldn't things have been, well, at least statistically speaking, way easier if I just had 200 people that only visited one time, for instance, uh, and then you can do easier statistics on them. But then it would be more difficult to um, correct for maybe mosquito um, ag numbers, um, if that matter for me. So uh, I think it's something good to keep in mind. Um, if you always really need a, a complicated sign, it can be simpler as well. Um, I guess the, the final results will show how I will think about the whole situation. <coughs> um, as for take home messages, uh, and this is still ongoing, uh, why some people are more attracted to not this good side than others. Uh, but it seems that at least in my study, that side doesn't explain any of the variations. So, what does? Um, if you have to add uh, count lots of extra pictures, please contact me. Uh, I've tried to find loads of ways to make it go uh, automatically, but this was way harder than I realized. But in the end, um, I came up, or someone developed a small program for me that wasn't counted automatically, but at least you could count them without thinking, which really uh, made things easier. So please uh, don't count them by hand if you ever have to just <laughs> contact me. Uh, and stay tuned for more information later on. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants that participated in the study and my supervisors, uh, Sandra Kumlaat, Bill Kondon, uh, Niels Verhulst, and Theo Joste, uh, and the uh, Lab Foundation, which makes sure that I could come uh, to this uh, seminar. Uh, and thanks to Marcelo and David for letting me uh, present all of this. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, it is in the pipeline. Like I have the data, but I haven't analyzed it yet. But yes, I am definitely depending on these are the things that are the easiest for us to uh, yes, all that to that. Yeah, I have a <coughs> I have a question, perhaps. Yeah. Um, about, uh, what about the source of mosquitoes? I'd like to list this. Are the source. These? Yes, uh, these are all not the solution side from the uh, smart local strain that we were at from 1987. From 1987? Yes, so they worked at Northern Water for yeah, quite some time already. Yeah. Do you think that perhaps you can find any variation or striking results because uh, they've been in the previous for so long? It could definitely be the case, yeah. I think if you also look at the difference between in vivo and in vitro, uh, I would expect yeah, a bigger true. difference over there, but these mosquito uh, generations have been fed uh, well on human arms until I think 10 years ago, maybe a bit yeah. longer. Okay. Um, but then uh, we switched to uh, to do that feeding. But, uh, yeah, this of course may have been. Why did you refuse uh, only made? Yeah. yeah, that's a question that always comes up. Um, actually, I really wanted to include the uh, females. Uh, but in the end, because, well, I mean, there's only so much, many mosquitoes you, that you can um, count at once, uh, so many humans that you can um, ask for the study, the study uh, because we wanted to have like a slightly lower variation, and because we uh, know that uh, women uh, really vary in their odor profile due to the menstrual cycle, uh, in the end, it was chosen to only look at males for now. Uh, I really hope to have time to do a side project to look at um, effects of uh, attractiveness of women at different points in their menstrual cycle. Uh, but unfortunately, there was no time for that anymore. But maybe, uh, hopefully, some other time. A suggestion to you when you compare between mosquitoes, you should include probably the size of the mosquitoes. You already have that from the Yes, yes. So that is what uh, the button size and the wing lengths. Uh, I monitored all of that. Yeah. Um, I have not, I have kind of like half of the pictures now. Uh, but yes, I will incorporate that in mm -hmm. final analysis for sure. Okay. Who was the question? Why only now? Yes. <laughs> we have a similar project where we only included women. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, I have questions about, um, I mean, what's going on in other species, for example, in zoophagic mosquitoes? Do we know if there are some cow in Europe that are more attractive 
It's been very effective 
with some agricultural pests like the California medfly has been controlled very effectively. Um, there is a fitness cost from the irradiation that's used to generate the sterile males. And also a problem is that the males don't compete adequately with the indigenous males remaining. And I'll show you that even if they had normal <coughs> mating drive or courtship drive, that that wouldn't be enough for this strategy to be very effective. So just to start out, our solutions are to engineer genetically sterile males and also to see if it's possible to engineer males with increased mating drive so they can outcompete the indigenous males. So uh, for the first goal, for making the sterile males, uh, what we did was we targeted the Aedes aegypti homolog Drosophila uh, beta-2 T gene or beta tubulin gene uh, because this gene in Drosophila is required specifically for male fertility. It's expressed just in the sperm. And the 80s homolog is 94% identical. So we knocked out uh, the gene uh, using uh, CRISPR-Cas9. And what I'm showing you here is that it did render the uh, males uh, completely sterile. So if you take the beta-2T males and combine with the females, you can see that there's no progeny as, compo as compared to the wild type animals. And the females are, are unaffected. And the reason is, is because as in Drosophila, oh, the first thing I should tell you is that these sterile males have no fitness function other than being sterile. They're, they're healthy in every way that we've examined, uh, which is the main reason to use it over the uh, irradiation. Now, the reason that they're sterile is, there, is that it's required for sperm production, and that's shown here. And these are seminal vesicles uh, that um, are uh, filled with uh, sperm. Um, and you can see uh, when we release them, there are lots of sperm, they're modal, but uh, the seminal vesicles uh, in the beta uh, 2T uh, males are completely empty. So, um, these males are effective in suppressing the population. We did experiments where we used different ratios of these males against uh, 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 the um, three, uh, three uh, uh, females. And you can see when you have a 15-fold excess of these males over the females, you get a suppression uh, down to about 20%. Now, you might think 20% isn't good enough, but in the SIT approach, you do as many as 20 consecutive releases. So 0 0.2 times 0 0.2, 20 fold in principle would be very effective. Now, one thing uh, that we found is that to get a 50% uh, suppression, you have to have on average 5.6 beta 2 uh, T males uh, for every female. As it turns out, uh, as opposed to what we thought before, where it's just one uh, male, a sterile male that has to mate, uh, with the females to render them sterile. Actually, they have to make many, many times uh, to render these uh, females sterile. And that's why you have to add uh, such a big excess. So now, one of the prime limitations of SIT is insufficient male mating drive. And that's illustrated in this fat curl plot. And uh, what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the number of releases. Typically, you do 20 releases, sometimes less. And what's shown on the x-axis is percent mating competitiveness. And 100% mating, oh yeah, 20 releases, and 100% mating competitiveness uh, is not very effective. In this uh, factorial plot, the low uh, blue uh, shades indicate a low probability of success. And as the uh, colors get darker and darker, the probability of success goes up. And the point is that even if you have 100% uh, um, uh, probability uh, of, uh, of mating uh, competition, normal mating, and in an experiment where you release a million males against 20,000 indigenous females, the probability of success of SIT is just below the threshold. <laughs> now, if you, if you just double this, you can see that now you're starting to get into the dark blue areas, and if you triple it, the likelihood of success is really, really high. Now, the question is, is it possible to increase the courtship drive? You might think, well, um, if you can increase it, why wouldn't nature actually have selected a 
for the males with the Mayas uh, courtship tribe. And um, our thought was, well, maybe there, there should be a fitness of that, but perhaps it's really minor. And since these are sterile males, that minor fitness effect wouldn't be uh, multiplied over many generations. Because after all, even if you had a 0.1% fitness effect over generations, that gene would be lost. And we thought it might be conceptually possible to increase uh, male courtship drive because there are a number of behaviors that put the brakes on male courtship drive, such as the need to eat. And so if an animal, if a male, is, is starved, that promotes feeding, and that suppresses courtship drive. However, if they are food satiated, that will inhibit feeding, and there are no breaks uh, then on courtship drive, and the animals uh, will court. And uh, also, the idea is that if you can get a mutant that increases courtship drive, that is, in this theoretical sense, is less sensitive to starvation than perhaps even if they're hungry, they will court rather than uh, not court and, and eat. Now, there are other attributes that put the brakes on male courtship drive. Obviously, the need to sleep. You can't court when you're uh, sleeping. And of course, mating happens at certain times over the circadian rhythm than others. So uh, we decided to do a screen. And we did a screen in Drosophila because it's easier to do genetics in Drosophila than in Aedes aegypti. And what we did was we focused on G protein coupled receptors that were receptors for neuromodulators, because neuromodulators affect complex behaviors. And we focused only on genes that are have homologs in 80s, and there are 88 <coughs> of these uh, G protein coupled receptors. And we did a competition assay that's illustrated here, where we had one wild type female, and we allowed it to mate with a wild type male or one of these uh, mutant males. And we, then we just looked to see which one won. We had different markers uh, in each. And when we did this, we found there was one winner only. There was only one out of the 88 genes. It is a receptor for something called DH44, which I'll tell you what that is in a second. And we found that there was this whopping uh, five-fold uh, increase in, in uh, mating success over uh, wild type, as shown here at the bottom. These are two wild type strains that obviously don't outcompete each other. So it turns out that uh, the receptor is for DH44 that, based on work in other labs, is nor normally promotes speeding, this hormone does, and it's also required for circadian rhythmicity and rest activity cycles. And these are exactly the kinds of behaviors that we predicted might be affected if we were able to find a gene that increased the uh, courtship drive. And within the resolution of our analysis in the laboratory, we don't see a fitness effect. For these mutants in the DH44R1, there has to be, otherwise it would be selected for, but it's, it must be subtle. Um, and again, uh, these are, are the kinds of behaviors that normally uh, put the brakes on courtship drive that are less sensitive in the DH44 mutant. Now, in Aedes aegypti, there are two DH44R1 homologs. One is called R11. In R12, they have similar levels of identity to the uh, Aedes, uh, to the Drosophila gene. Uh, we used CRISPR-Cas9 to knock them both out. And we found one of them um, had an increase, not nearly as big as in, as in Drosophila, but it increased the uh, courtship uh, competition uh, uh, 100, uh, to about 150%. These are preliminary data. And the even 150% uh, would be uh, quite helpful because you can see that even with normal or 100% mating drive, you're below the threshold for success based on this modeling. If this modeling is correct, but 150% would start getting you into this uh, darker area to increase the likelihood of success. What I'd like to now talk to you about is what we're really interested in is understanding uh, the mechanisms that Aedes aegypti used to find us uh, uh, human hosts. Now, I think everyone here knows that uh, really when they detect the CO2, the 5% CO2 coming out of our breath, it's not a great directional cue. They become much more active. And they start paying attention to other cues, uh, such as uh, visual cues. 
that they can sense at about five to 10 meters. Their visual acuity, by the way, is not that great. Then uh, they also can sense human odors, and some of them can be sensed even at distances greater than five meters. Some of them are very volatile. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, odors are not necessarily great directional cues because if the person is moving, by the time the order gets to them, uh, they can't find them, and if there's a wind, it's not a great directional cue. Come back to that thought. Uh, now, when they get really close, I think you're going to uh, hear uh, about you can hear about this topic from uh, Paul. Um, they detect body heat from con convection, and then when they land on you, they're detecting on volumes. Now, uh, vision uh, at a molecular level has been uh, largely ignored, and we wondered whether it would be possible to engineer 80s aegypti that weren't blind but weren't able to see their human host. So that would be illustrated here where the CO2 is coming out of uh, this uh, host's uh, mouth, 5%, 80s aegypti now is increasing their visual attention to the human. Can we make 80s aegypti that can't see the human host? And uh, we did a couple of type of assays. Uh, this is an, an assay in a wind tunnel. And the 80s aegypti, uh, they prefer, by the way, if you're wearing black clothing, they're much more attractive to uh, these mosquitoes than if you're wearing white uh, clothing. Um, and there's obviously no human in the wind tunnel, but because their visual acuity isn't that great, they do prefer the black spot over the white spot. And I'm showing you here the trajectories of, of a mosquito that's just downwind of the black spot. And so you can see the preference for the dark spot or the uh, white spot is, is fairly robust. And there are, uh, 10 oxygen genes or rhodopsin genes, these are light receptors in 80s aegypti. The most abundant one is uh, OP1, and we thought we would knock it out. And we knocked it out, it had no, it didn't result in any decrease in the percent of time that these mosquitoes spent near the black spot. Now, we wondered if there was some genetic redundancy because OP2 is highly related to OP1. So we knocked out OP2, and again, there was no effect. But now, when we made a double mutant between OP1 and OP2, it turned out that these mosquitoes were unable to differentiate between the black spot and the white spot. But these animals aren't blind. Uh, first, um, they are normally 80s aegypti, control 80s aegypti, are phototactic. They prefer the light side over the dark side. And you can see that these double mutants have no difference in their light preference. We also uh, did an optimotor test, and um, animals from uh, flies to humans will have an optimotor response where you have these uh, vertical uh, uh, movements of, of stripes in a drum. A human will kind of track their head like this, and a mosquito will walk into the direction of these drums. And although there was a decrease in their optimotor response, they still had a robust optimotor response. So they're not blind, but basically, uh, we think that this is making these mosquitoes uh, so that people are invisible to them and, uh, and they're much, would be uh, much less successful in, in finding us. Now, the last thing I want to tell you about, and it's the thing I'm most excited to tell you about today, is a new cue that we discovered that 80s Egypti used for finding us. And the reason that we wanted to see if there was another cue is because uh, these cues, none of these cues are great directional cues. CO2 is, can be a directional cue to some extent and mostly just makes them active. But again, if there's a wind or if you're moving, it's not a great directional cue. Vision is a pretty good directional cue, but their visual acuity isn't that great. Uh, again, human odors, same problem as with CO2. And these are stimuli that only help them fi find it, a human if they're really close already. So is there another cue? And we wondered if mosquitoes can sense infrared. Because after all, our skin temperature is about 34, about 34 degrees. And we then put out black body radiation of about 10 to 12 micrometers. Now, so we wondered if they were able to detect that. But if they could detect infrared, that raises two problems. First, uh, there was a paper published a few years ago that said infrared isn't a uh, sense that mosquitoes use, but we thought they did it wrong because they only looked at infrared. They didn't look at infrared in combination with other cues. And then if we do find infrared as a cue, it raises a conceptual problem 
because it, it's so low energy that there's no known protein that could possibly be active by IR. What would be the mechanism? So I'll address both of those points. All right. So what we did was we put a bunch of mosquitoes in a, a small cage like this, and then uh, we attached uh, their two sides. Once, uh, once so both sides are exposed to CO2 and human odor, and only this uh, once a uh, second side is exposed to 34 degree temperature from the Peltier device, and we set it back uh, so that it doesn't heat uh, that side of the cage. We also put some, some saran here, so there's no convection heat. So certainly not conduction, it's not touching it. There's no convection heat. And uh, lo and behold, uh, we found that when we use a, a, a thermometer that was sensitive to a hundredth of a degree, we cannot detect any difference in temperature. So again, this side CO2 and human odor, this side CO2 human odor and infrared, and we start doing some tracking. And that's what's shown uh, here. Uh, this is a script that we wrote to track these animals in real time. If the mosquito lands on one side or the other and flies away, we don't count it. We're counting blood seeking uh, ability where they're looking for a vein. And obviously there's no vein here, but you can see that if they land and they start moving along this uh, side or that side, uh, that it's tracked with the green. So there's a lot more uh, blood seeking uh, at, on the right side versus the left side. And this is, quanti uh, this is quantified here after um, a couple of minutes. And, um, and, and the, so the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, they're more attracted to infrared and, uh, and then uh, we want to get into the mechanism. But the first thing I want to show you is that if you only expose these mosquitoes to one sense, like just CO2, just infrared, or just odor, that the host seeking activity, the blood uh, seeking activity is close to zero. So yes, we can repeat the experiment that infrared alone is not enough. Now, if you combine in this assay, just CO2 and infrared, very little host seeking activity, combine infrared and odor, again, very little. Now, if you combine human odor and, uh, uh, and CO2, uh, you get about 10% uh, host seeking activity. But now, if you combine all three, you can get, it really doubles. You can get up to about 20% host seeking activity. Again, infrared is a new sense. Now, the question is what is the mechanism? And to answer this, I want you to think about the sun for a minute. Uh, the surface of the sun is about 6,000 degrees centigrade. And that heat, is then converted into electromagnetic radiation. And that electromagnetic radiation, uh, radiation when it's going through the 93 million miles of space, is not heating up space. It's when this electromagnetic radiation hits the water droplets uh, in our atmosphere, it heats up, and, uh, and that will, in turn, heat up the Earth. So keep this in mind. What's happening is you have heat converted into electromagnetic waves, and then the electro electromagnetic waves are getting converted back into heat. Why do I tell you this? Um, is you think the same thing is happening for infrared detection. Skin temperature is converted into infrared radiation, and then we think the infrared radiation is then heating up the lymph, the liquid, around the uh, dendrites, of a sensillum at the end of these antenna, because at the end of these antenna, there is a sensillum that's known to be heat activated. So question is, if there is, if this mechanism is correct, there should be a heat activated channel that is expressed in, in, in these neurons at the end of the antenna. So is there a temperature sensor? And uh, some years ago, uh, from our early work on Drosophila vision, uh, we discovered these uh, channels that are called trip channels, and they're activated downstream of a signaling cascade in the fly's eye that starts with the activation of rhodopsin, and then you have this amplification cascade, and it results ultimately in the activation of calcium and sodium influx through trip channels. And then uh, we subsequently show that uh, trip channels are conserved uh, from worms to humans. And then uh, we analyze their roles uh, in many different senses. In fact, this is a whole field, uh, including, uh, we'll hear about work from Paul Garrity, uh, that 
They're in one animal or another, they're involved in every sense, including thermal sensation. In fact, this past October, uh, David Julia shared the Nobel Prize for his work on mammalian trip channels because there are, uh, there are thermosensors in, in mammals. So it turns out that one of these trip channels, uh, trip A1, uh, is expressed at the very end of the antenna. Moreover, if we clip off the end of the antenna, just surgically, that absolutely eliminates the ability for these mosquitoes to sense IR. So they need the end of the antenna exactly where trip A1 is expressed. Moreover, if you have a trip A1 mutant, you can see that eliminates their ability to prefer the side with IR over CO2 and odor only. Uh, we have also done uh, RNA and C2 hybridizations and confirmed that indeed uh, trip A1 is expressed at the very end of the antenna in these heat sensitive uh, sensilla. So uh, there's one other, uh, uh, again, let me uh, again explain why that's important. There 10 micro, uh, 10 to 12 micrometer radiation is incredibly low energy. The lowest energy electromagnetic radiation that can activate a redoxin is about 650 nanometers. So that was way too low to activate any known protein. There had to be some other mechanism like what I described. But in order to directly activate trip A1, to produce enough heat to activate uh, trip A1, you have to have a high amount of IR. In other words, the person has to be fairly close to the mosquito. So the question is, how would they sense IR that's at a distance? And we thought maybe there's an amplification cascade. Close source of IR generates enough heat to directly activate trip A1, and a low source of IR could then activate maybe a GPCR that is initiating an amplification cascade and then indirectly activating trip A1 rather than directly activating by heat. So what might be the GPCR? So those of you who are familiar with Redoxin know that it was discovered over 100 years ago and thought to only have roles in light sensation. For over the last 10 years, um, we've been finding other uh, light-independent roles for Redoxin, such as in temperature sensation, taste, uh, smell, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we also found a Redoxin that's in the fly brain. Um, and it senses light there, but these are all light independent roles. So we wonder if there are any redoxins that are involved in sensing low amounts of, uh, of heat, uh, essentially sensing the low amount of heat that are produced by the IR in the lymph when a person is far away. Now, there are, I just told you there are 10 redoxins, and it turns out that the same two redoxins that I just told you when we mutate from the fly eye inhibit the ability of mosquitoes to find people, it turns out that both of these same two redoxins are also expressed at the end of the antenna. So now we did these uh, two-way choice assays again, and we found if we mutate either uh, uh, OP1 or OP2, there is no effect. But now if we make a double mutant, which in OP1 and OP2, it doesn't completely eliminate uh, their ability to sense IR, but it greatly reduces it. And so, in summary, uh, we think there's a dual detection, there are two dual detection modes for sensing IR. We think it's a new cue that, uh, well, it's been around for a long time, but a new cue to us uh, that mosquitoes use uh, to find us. And uh, when there are high levels of infrared, for example, when a human is close to mosquitoes, that produces enough heat to uh, directly activate trip A1. But when the person is far away and there isn't enough uh, heat generated by the IR to directly activate trip A1, it goes to this amplification cascade, sort of analogous to the amplification cascade in the eye, where a single photon of light will then activate one redoxin, which we can perceive through the amplification cascade. So finally, um, in addition to these known cues, I'd like to add IR. IR radiation is another cue, and we think it's really important because it's the uh, it's the first really reliable directional cue that Aedes aegypti can use to find people. It doesn't matter if there's a wind, you can, you can move, um, and uh, they will still find you. So finally, uh, uh, this is um, the uh, picture of my uh, current lab. Uh, my lab is here in the UC Santa Barbara uh, campus in this building right here. 
And uh, there was a graduate student a few months ago who came in early in the morning and shot this picture uh, right outside our, our lab. And uh, yeah, I'd like to stop now and take the questions. Thanks. Great talk. Both, uh, both are. So my question on the first part. So you're showing the modeling um, that just releasing more you know, mosquitoes doesn't doesn't help actually increase this mating um, success. So how can you explain that some of the proxy test trials are then quite um, uh, effective? Are they just releasing even more? Yeah, exactly. I, this modeling was done uh, based on <clears throat> releasing a million males against 20,000 females. I don't know what the how many animals they're releasing. Yeah. But clearly, even for what OxyTech is doing, uh, if you increase the male courtship drive, that would make it so you don't have to release as many males. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, it, uh, having males and an increased courtship drive Will improve uh, any kind of release strategy, not just SIT. But of course, the nice thing about SIT is you have, um, because they're sterile, you have less concerns about releasing animals that you've genetically modified, right? So I would be a little bit loath to combine that with other approaches, but certainly with SIT, it would be very, uh, I think, very helpful. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So, so the movies you showed. Where you did the comparison with Eve and Odor and um, kind of infrared. Have you considered uh, replacing the infrared there with the heat source to, to compare it with some different between convection and infrared? I did similar things with an opposite scheme. Yeah. Um, and I think their odor is more important relatively than for the heat. So it's nice to do. Yeah. So um, we already know from other people's work that heat will increase their attraction. Um, so, but what we showed is that the side with the infrared was exactly the same temperature within, a, at least within a hundredth of a degree. So we didn't do the control uh, that you said, because that's already uh, that's already known, I suppose. But, um, but uh, what I wanted to establish is that it's infrared and not uh, convection here. And because the application, of course, would be nice because now we want to Add heat to the to, uh, other tracks. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and the infrared can be detected at this. Uh -huh. And I want one question. And, uh, actually, three questions online. Uh, one from Julia Slew in Is it possible uh, that infected people? Uh, that is to say, with dengue, emit more infrared due to high fever. And this makes them more attractive to mosquitoes. So the answer to that uh, is no, because what we did was we used a, a Peltier device that was at a range of temperatures uh, um, where we varied at every single degree, and the peak attractiveness was at 34. Now, of course, our skin temperature isn't exactly 34, even on a single person. It'll vary depending on where it is. But still, it was really interesting to us that the peak attractiveness was at normal. 34 degree skin temperature. When you went up to 35 and 36 degrees, uh, it started going down. He said there are two more. Yes. Or, uh, there is a place. second one from Frederick Sima, the director of Midejek. Are females and males equally responsive to infrared? So, um, yeah, so we, we only could test the females because um, the, uh, the males are not going to respond. Uh, you know, to the uh, uh, CO2 uh, very effectively. Now, of course, as, you know, there, there is evidence that males are attracted uh, uh, to, uh, to people, but if you act, they're, they're not very responsive uh, to the CO2. Do you check the that? And the last one is from Chris Porter, and we'll be with us literally tomorrow. Really great work. He's simultaneously knocking out both, and I try to. DH44R1 genes in IDES have an add additive effect on main mating sector. Um, yeah, that's what I showed. Oh, oh DH44. Yes. The GH44, not yes. DH44R1. DH44R1 genes in IDES have an additive effect on main mating sector. Yeah, uh, yeah, I showed the data for it. 
that. Um, when you knock out DH44 R1, R1, one of the two homologs, when it is a chip dot, it increases the uh, male mating success. Yeah. Hello, Chris. <laughs> <laughs>
So you might be familiar with IRs. They're very important for olfaction and taste. And what we found is that a subset of these are not, do not appear to be chemically activated receptors, but respond to other cues, which I'll focus on today. And this work was done by Lena Neem, when she was in my lab, and Gonzalo Videlli. They now have their own laboratories. And we got a lot of help from our collaborator, Richard. And you can work on IRs now. So what we decided to do was to look at, well, maybe IR21A is really important for these things. And so to do that, a graduate student in my lab and a postdoc, Willem Larson, decided to work on this. And we did this in collaboration initially with Flaminia Cataruccia, because my lab was not a mosquito lab. So we basically converted ourselves into one based on this project. Actually, Chloe helped me design and build the insectors. So it took a while. It was as much a home renovation project as a scientific project. In any case, what we did was we made some knockouts in the IR21A gene, and we found that they got rid of all the IR21A expression. Okay, now that we've got some mutants, what are we going to do? Well, what we decided to do was to do some electrophysiology to really look at cellular level at what was going on. And it had been known for decades that there were heat receptors and cooling receptors, thermoreceptors, at the very tip of the mosquito ant. So we stuck an electrode in there, actually Gonzalo did, and what we found was that indeed, they actually contain cooling activated sensory neurons that we tip. And you can see here that we're looking at spiking. And you can see they have a phasic spiking, and they begin to speed up. They fire more and more. Now, we saw that these cooling cells express this IR21A molecule. And when we knock out IR21A, the neuron is still there, still fires, but it no longer responds to changes in temperature. Now, at a molecular level, then, it functions much as it does in Drosophila. Which is it basically it powers a cooling activated neuron, which has an incredibly cool structure, but I don't have time to tell you about it, but I'm happy to talk about it in a second. Now, the next thing we decided to do was to look at heat seeking behavior. And so basically, what you do is you put mosquitoes in a box. This was developed initially in Leslie Bossel's lab when she sent me the blueprints, right? Put the mosquitoes in a box, give them two peltines to choose from, puff in 4% carbon dioxide, makes them think they've gotten some breath, that activates the mosquitoes. And then they very quickly accumulate on the hot side. Okay, and you can see that here after that. Two minutes. Now, 21A, what happens is that this heat seeking goes way, way down, it goes down about four or five fold. There's still a little bit of residual there. We suspect there's another heat sensing pathway, it could be the AAA1 like pathway, something like that. But it dramatically reduces their heat seeking behavior. And I'm not going to go through all the details of this uh, because this is published, and so I'm going to just talk about most of the unpublished stuff there. But if you're curious, I'm happy to talk more about it. So, what this basically told us was that uh, uh, the role of IR21A in the mosquito was to promote heat seeking, and that really indicated that at least a huge chunk of what we thought of as heat seeking behavior is actually cooling activated repulsion. They get hit with CO2, I'm anthropomorphizing, they feel cold, and they run around until they find a fly around, I guess, because they have wings. And so they get close to you, and then they feel better, and they come and bite you. Okay, the problem is, is that even though in isolation is fantastic, if you actually provide a more ecologically relevant cue, like my hand, not the other 21A does almost nothing. What you're looking at here is a, an experiment where we stuck a bunch of mosquitoes in an open cage, we breathe on them five times, stick our hand on the top, we leave a little gap so we don't get bit. And what you see is wild type mosquitoes very quickly. Come to your hand and will stay there for minutes on it, trying to try to bite you. IR twenty one A mutants are a little bit slow in finding you, but they're perfectly fine hanging out there. I should also mention that when we do blood feeding from like a peanut test filter or something, as I'll show you in a moment, they're totally fine. We're almost totally fine. Okay, so what that means is heat is a really important cue. You can get it. You know, mosquitoes really pay attention to it. They love it. But they have enough other cues around that normally in the wild, you really don't probably not in the wild in my laboratory. If you stick your hand on the cage, there's enough other cues coming so they can compensate. This actually got us thinking though, clearly close range, they probably might be using close range style information. So might there be other cues at close range that could also be really important and potentially even redundant with the heat cues? Now, this is um, an average of two people from my lab, their hands. Okay, we just take a little heat measure. Uh, what you can see is that there's a very steep thermal gradient. What you might not be as aware of is that there's also a very steep humidity gradient. I'm nervous, so I probably have a really big humidity gradient. Okay, so what it means though is that the mosquitoes, when 
which are currently, well, I'm get the sense. These used to be mosquitoes. Basically, can use either of these paths of information you can imagine to find you, right? They can use both, they can be working in parallel. Now, so what this discovery, what this is not really a discovery, right? Because it's been known for like 60 years that humanity is a really important issue. And actually, there's a lot of work in the 50s and 60s and even earlier that gave the sense that humanity was indeed a really important issue. And this is a, a review from Brown, which summarizes a lot of his field studies. And in fact, he found at the time that moisture was actually the most important or the most attractive airborne factor for drawing mosquitoes when he was setting up these robots in the glade. Amazing experiments. We've never seen it. Now, despite the fact it's really important, we almost we know very, very little about moisture sensing or humidity sensing in mosquitoes. What we know is it involves the antenna. Because if you tear off the antenna, that screws it up. But beyond that, it really never got localized very well. So we don't know what the sensory neurons are, don't know what the sensilla are, don't know what the molecules are. Now, fortunately, uh, work from a graduate student in my lab, Zach Necht, and parallel studies were done around the same time in Marcus Stansmeyer's lab, identified the humidity receptors for the software. What we found was that actually they use a very similar, they use related mo molecules related to the cooling receptor to sense moist and dry. They use IR40A to help sense dry air, and they use IR68A to sense moist air. The other thing, you can see Zach is very excited there, is that there's one receptor called IR93A, which functions as a co-receptor for all three of them. You get rid of this receptor, and you get rid of the ability of each of these receptors to signal. So what uh, Willem in my lab decided to do is to start to say, well, maybe if we knock that out in a mosquito, what we'll do is we'll create a mosquito that doesn't respond well at all to temperature and can't sense humidity. And maybe we can use that to try to get around some of the redundancy that's built into the system. Anyway, so we tried it. So basically, you knock in, uh, we knocked down some markers and knocked out the iron 93 a gene, and the first thing to notice is that basically it's expressed at the tip of the antenna, and those neurons actually are also positive for IR21A. So just like we had thought, IR93A was co-expressed with this cooling center, right? And then when we did the electrophysiology, we stuck an electrode in there. What you can see is in blue here is when we drop the temperature, you can see the spiking speed up. When we raise the temperature, the spiking goes down. Again, an important thing to note here is that these are not acting like thermometers. People always think about thermosensors as thermometers. These aren't. These are more like a thermometer with a video camera, right? They really just tell you if the temperature's going up or going down, and they can actually respond to hundreds of a degree. In fact, in Drosophila, we find that 0 0.003 degrees is sufficient to cause a 50% change in uh, effect. So they're incredibly thermosensitive. Okay. So like IR21A, IR93A is also required for thermal transduction. Okay. Now, what was unexpected is we got IR93A expression in a place that we didn't know about, right? It was kind of like my, this is my first trip to the south of France. This was certainly my first trip into the first flagellometer of the mosquito. What we saw were these pairs of neurons that look much better on my screen, I trust you. They go to these things that look like little golf holes. Right, like your mini golfing. Right? What these are, are these are things called sensilla antilacea. Now, these are essentially terra incognita. What they are, they're sensilla that are buried in the middle of the antenna. You can't get an electrode to them, so no one's ever studied them. Okay? Now, what's cool is this is a, 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 from Susan's review, like 40 years ago, where she describes them. They really just sort of guessed that they were probably heat receptors because they don't have any pain, they don't have any pores. Right? We thought, well, maybe these are actually. Hyper receptors. So to do that, by uh, using some mosquitoes we got from Chris, thank you, Chris. Uh, we basically expressed uh, the genetically encoded calcium indicator G camp in these neurons, and then we looked to see what was going on. This is the raw fluorescence, and in wild pipe, you can see that one neuron increases its fluorescence in response to dry air and decreases in response to moist air, and the other cell does the exact opposite. Inhibited by moist, excuse me, inhibited by dry. Activated by moist. 93A, they're present, but they don't really respond. So, what this tells us, right, is that basically mosquitoes do sense humidity. It does involve the antenna, the snail was right, uh, but it's, there are these pairs of moist and dry cells that innervate these previously uncharacterized cellular cells, so like Andalusia, and then it depends on IR93A, just like it does in Drosophila. Okay, so that's exciting. 
So what happens when you provide it with an ecologically relevant sequence? Again, what we do is very simple in my lab. We just breathe on the cage, stick your hand on top, and make sure it's always the same person. Right? So you breathe on it, and what you see is that in wild type, they go to the hand and they stay there for the length of the time until we get bored, stick your hand, pull your hand away, and then it drops off. Now, in the RN93 A mutants, they actually do go to the hand. So presumably they're responding to visual cues, maybe some of the motor cues. But once they get there, they do something very strange, which is a decent fraction of them sort of peel off and start basically flying around the cage. And now I'm going to try to show you all a movie of what this looks like. And otherwise, I'll, I'll end up just uh, let's see if I can do it. Okay. So here's what the assay looks like. I can't click on this. Oh, there we go. Did I click on it? Darn it. Um, shoot, forgive me. I don't have a mouse. Forgive me. This is totally worth it. You'll, you'll, you'll love it. So there we go. Okay. Can you not hit the other one? So on the left hand side, you'll see what an assay looks like. It's sped up to minimize the border. You'll see there that the mosquitoes love your hand and they keep flying around the camp. On the left hand side is what it looks like with 93A gone. There we go. What you'll see is that there's a decent fraction of these mosquitoes that just keep flying around the cage. It's like they, they, they know they're supposed to find something, but they can't land anywhere. Okay? So there you go. So it's, it's somewhat different. I'm not saying it's the, you know, you know, and all clearly there's some mosquitoes that are still off top there, but eventually they fly around. Eventually they get bored, I think, and, and land. Okay, so basically 93A seems to be required for them to maintain very close attractions to them, which is consistent with this idea that heat and moisture are coming from your hand, and that's what they're sensing. Now, what about blood feeding? Now, this is an example of this is a hematech feeder. This is not my arm, right? It's a hematech feeder. And what you can see is that wild type mosquitoes, or at least G3, that's what we're using as wild type. I know it's not really wild, but they're tight. Um, if you knock out IR21A in them, it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. On the other hand, if you knock out IR9, Pre-A, bingo, we now have serious problems, and only a very few mosquitoes can we get to feed them. And so that suggests basically that there's likely to be potentially some sort of synergy between heat and humidity that helps drive them to feed when they get really, really close. Now, this is not the greatest experiment. This is just one initial, it's a decent experiment. Okay, basically what we decided to do is to ask to what extent is temperature driving things, to what extent is humidity driving things. What we noticed is that Collagen is water permeable. So if you use, uh, uh, what you can see is that it actually creates a, a moisture gradient that's quite similar to the moisture gradient from your hand. Okay, it probably has odors and other things, we're aware of that, but it certainly generates a moisture gradient. But if we mask that by using paraffin, you don't get that gradient at all. In fact, the gradient goes in reverse. What we see is that if we use, uh, if we get rid of the heat with the water permeable membrane, we still get some blood feeding. If we use paraffin, and we use heat, we still get some blood feeding. But if we use room temperature and paraffin, these G3, these mosquitoes, which are wild type, will not feed, which is consistent with this notion that heat and humidity work together to drive this behavior. And it's really important. Okay, so this is our working model. Basically, it's what I was suggesting before, which said both of these cues are working together to help drive blood feeding behavior. Now, the other thing you, that we noticed, and I was thinking about it when we saw the, 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 the vertical forest is that humidity sensing is also important for other jobs. So even though I think of mosquitoes as host-seeking animals, they do have a life that is beyond that. And so they have to find water to maintain hydration, and they also have to find water to overpass it. Okay? So what we started to think about was well, maybe we could look at water-seeking these animals. So we set up a very simple assay where we have two trays, a very tight mesh on top of both, so they can't really see through it very much, or they can't see through it. You know, their vision probably isn't so great either. We fill one halfway with water, the other is dry. And then we ask, we let them sit there for an hour, ask where they go, and eventually we make sure they're not dead by breathing them and making sure they take off. Okay, so what we see is that wild type and IR21A, this is the heat seeking defective mosquitoes, they're perfectly capable of finding the trail of water. 93A is really bad. Well, they can't, okay? But they're still alive. So they can still. So then we started thinking, well, these are non-blood-fed females. What happens if we blood feed the females and let them get gravid for a couple of days? What we saw is um, the gravid females simply can't find water. Okay, so we thought that this was pretty clear. So the other thing that we decided to do, 
And I don't have time to talk about this whole thing. As we wonder, of course, there's multiple families in CDLs. God knows whether it's convergent evolution or divergent evolution, but it would be interesting to think about evolution. So what we decided to do was to knock out the same receptors in the 80s and ask them. I won't have time to tell you about all the experiments we did. I'm just going to focus on the overposition effects. Okay. So what we decided to do is we created a very simple of a position assay, I think it's simple, which is basically we blood feed them, we let them sit for a while, we, you know, we make them, let them blood feed, and then we ask, let them lay eggs. The way we do it is we have just two containers, one that's half full of water, one that's empty, and then we put a mesh over the top so that the water can get through, <laughs> but we cut a little tiny hole so that if they're really motivated, they can crawl in and lay eggs. And then we ask, what happens? What we see is that in wild type, and I need your program for counting because we're going crazy. But, so they lay eggs on the filter paper. You can see that here. And also, you often see lots of the CEOs that are inside, right? Because, of course, they have to get inside. The dry container, they just completely ignore. In our IR-93A knockouts, on the other hand, they don't go in at all. They completely ignore. And you might say, and, and as we often say, well, maybe they just don't have any eggs to give. Maybe they're screwed up for the behavior. So what we did, well, first of all, before I tell you the control, I'll tell you the experiment. How about that? Uh, the basic idea is if we look at how many eggs they laid, it's actually very easy to quantify the mutants because they almost never do it. We think one female got trapped in here and just laid a ton of eggs, right? Basically, they just can't find their way to the container. To make sure that this was not because they were completely screwed up, what we did was we did the same kind of assay, but we just didn't use the mesh. So we gave them open access. And what we find is that open access, they're not quite normal because we think they don't blood feed as much and they don't seem to have as many eggs, but they're certainly capable of laying lots of eggs during open access. So we'd like to think now, take home lessons. What did we learn? Did we learn anything by doing this? And I think we did, right? I think we learned that these humidity sensors live in poreless and cellar that are buried inside the antenna, which is why they hadn't been described before. They have opponent moist and dry cells, which actually resemble lots of other insects that have moist and dry cells. Like Drosophila, they rely on the entire 93A receptor. Um, it seems that temperature and moisture are potentially overlapping in their roles in host seeking uh, and blood feeding, and um, that these hypersensors are also really important for water seeking. I didn't show it, but the males are also unable to find water. And that seems that they're likely to be really important potentially for seeking out places to lay eggs. Um, also, and I haven't given you all the data on this, but a lot of the functions of iron 93 m appear to be conserved between anopheles and Aedes aegypti, even though they've been separated for a long time. So anyway, I want to thank my lab. I've tried to show photographs of all the people that actually did all the work and did most of the thinking. Uh, this is my lab, uh, and I want to thank uh, all these people, as well as my collaborators, especially for many of you here and Richard. Uh, We've been funded uh, by a lot of different agencies of the U.S. government, which is fantastic. And uh, we're all hiring. And I work at Brandeis University, which nobody knows where it is. Even people in Boston don't know where it is. This is the Northeast Coast, really cold, but a lovely university town. And Waltham is out. So with that, I will be happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, really nice. Uh, um, in your essay, where you, uh, you know, put, you, the people in your life put their hand yeah. above the cage, and uh, there, you know, you showed a phenotype on the right where the numbers in the students are at the top were reduced. But I wonder if the essay would work better if, if the hand was on the side, so you can get rid of, you know, the uh, uh, the, the negative geotaxis. So that might make it work better. The problem we have is that we actually do things this way because remember that image I showed, the Schlieren image? The problem is, is that your hand, once you get these currents, it gets completely chaotic above the hand, but below the hand, you get a very steep, straightforward heat gradient. So it might work better that way, but we just were really not comfortable because I don't have a fancy humidity, I mean, fancy airflow rooms or anything. And so you just get chaos because you get all these plumes that form. So it's a great idea, but you know, we minimize the phenotype, but still we believe it because, because it's below, so that it's a more consistent grade. Maybe that's the best way to say. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was very intrigued about uh, the mechanics of the enormously small gradients in the temperature. I 
I can't, but I can tell you that, um, so we've done a lot of this work with a physicist, Ari Samuel at Harvard, who has very precise control of the temperature. And so those measurements were made on the larval version of the burnout receptors. So what we did was we could actually measure, what we found really was that three milli, so again, these are differential sensors, not absolute value sensors. What we found is that a 0 0.003 <coughs> degree per second change in temperature is sufficient to activate these cells 50% as measured by GK. Now that's basically amazing. That's one in 10 to the fifth, right? Because we're basically 300 Kelvin. And this can test, can detect 0 0.003 Kelvin changes. So we have no idea how that works. The neuron itself is unbelievable. Um, you can look up our neuron paper. We have a lot of EM in there. What's really fascinating is that the cold cell has this enormous lemelated dendrite where you actually have probably at least a dozen membranes and the membranes don't touch. They form these things called bosons that were originally discovered by Steinbrenner. Okay? And so there's hundreds of these structures that are about 20 nanometers. When we get rid of the IRs, that completely disappears. And if we ectopically express these IRs, they will form those junctions <coughs> with the cells we express it. So it looks like there's a cell biological element to this that we don't understand, that there's got to be some kind of physical structure that seems to be transducing that tiny, tiny change in temperature. So this incredible sensitivity. We can't measure the differences with our thermometers, but there's basically fluctuations in temperature that are sufficient to drive those responses. But it needs to reset for something over time. So actually, super interesting. So it is, it actually is a very slow relaxation point. So there was, a, for our first paper, we had to really go through this detail because everybody refers to them as phasic tonic receptors. The thing is, those people were all impatient. It takes about a minute to reset. But if you actually let it reset at a constant temperature, what happens is it transiently goes up and then it relaxes very slowly over a minute back down to the rate. In fact, the cooling cell is actually, if you drop the temperature, its baseline firing rate goes down. It's just a simple Q10. Okay, so these are not phasic tonic. They're basically phasic with a very, very slow relaxation. So it resets over time slowly. But it's basically like, like a weighted measure of the activity of the last minute. Um, one question. Yeah. Quick one. Do mosquitoes really get bored? <laughs> <laughs> not in my lab, because we're always knocking out other teams. They don't have we don't give them time. So yeah, uh, thanks. Of course, wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if you try to track down these cells to the brain and know where this information is being delivered. Is it a, of a, a three yeah. structures or is it some other? Excellent. So two things. One is um, we actually have been doing a lot of connectomics with Greg Jeffers. So we published a paper in Current Biology where we did the connectome of the thermo and hydrosensory systems and so what it really is, is actually, it's just a region of the antenna lobe okay. that is hydro and thermo. And the other thing that's super fascinating is that it's actually the second order neurons. You can actually see how the animal is integrating information physically because you've got projection neurons that take information from this guy and this guy. And another projection neuron will take information from the moist and the dry. And so there's lots of information combined. But the only other thing I will say is that I, I know that olfaction is fascinating. I think the olfaction is boring. What I really think is exciting is that all the olfactory information goes based on lateral horn, mushroom body. The second order neurons coming out of the high growth thermal go everywhere. And so I suspect they're controlling heart rate, they're controlling all kinds of different stuff that olfaction can't touch. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, a question. Yeah. Uh, since we're all waiting for coffee, you're of a position expert. Yeah. You do test wet against dry. Have you done the control dry versus dry? Would they ever lay eggs in that? It's a great test? question. You know, I don't think we've done that, and we should. But we haven't. I mean, certainly our mutants don't lay at all no. if we do that. But if we open up, if we open things up, they always go. Yeah, but is it relevant, a relevant essay to test the drive? Would they ever lay egg in a dry area? Yeah, I don't know.
That's a great question. Well, yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't know. Also, I suspect that this is probably many of you studying local position keys, which I'm sure are very, very important. My guess is this is just to get them in the area. And they probably have other keys. I think that's probably what we're seeing when we open up open up the containers, is that we're just giving them access and then they use other kinds of visual cues and, and, and other kinds of things. So again, like he, like Jose, you know, keys important and moisture is important, but they're not the only thing. So uh, good. All right. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I remember three years ago I was invited to the same um, conference um, or the same meeting. Um, and there over dinner, I sat next to Matt and De Niro. Um, there was a call to work on skin bacteria and attractiveness. Um, we got in touch, we kept talking, wrote a proposal, and got a grant. Um, and I think that shows how important these kind of meetings are. This is very uh, much more difficult if you do these things over Zoom during COVID. Yeah? So uh, it's great to be here um, in person. So host and temperature preferences. Well, people have been talking about host and temperature. So I think I can skip some of my slides. It'll be very short. So let's see if I can catch up some time. OK, so this is, of course, uh, what all our work is about to um, lower the Biological vector transmission. Now, if I explain my students what air R not is, I don't need to explain it anymore because of COVID, which is which is great. Huh? Now they all know R not is above one, then COVID is increasing. If it's above below one, is decreasing. Um, and then I show them that of course R not is not only linked to COVID, um, but we can also um, use it to um, look at vector transmission, for example. And then here, the A stands for the daily biting activity or the host preference, which is part of that. So, of course, um, a vector can only transmit the pathogen um, if a person or an animal is being bitten. And for that, first, you need mosquitoes. If the mosquitoes are all around, you will not be bitten. And the more, the more you will be bitten, but also there is host preference. Uh, and sometimes this is um, very specific. Uh, and sometimes we have generalist or opportunistic species. Well, as you can see in this R0, um, most of the vectors um, um, in this formulation are formulated are entomological vectors. Then the second part um, is um, temperature. So temperature affects almost all of them, directly or indirectly, on the of survival of the mosquito development, for example. Um, but it shows how important temperature is. Um, and of course, in the light of climate change, this is even more important at the moment. So many people have been working on temperature. However, um, this was mainly based on micro microclimatic data, so the mean ambient air temperatures. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of fitness and performance data of insects and vectors um, with these temperatures. The problem is, in all or almost all of these models, temperature is measured over here. So this is a typical meteorological station in Switzerland, um, two meters high in the middle of the field, where temperature and humidity is measured. And that is then used in these models. Well, I can tell you, you will not find any mosquito hovering at two meters above ground over here. You will find the mosquitoes here in the bushes, for example, uh, below a leaf, on top of a leaf, uh, but not over here. So it's not realistic for uh, insect vector habitats. So behavioral thermal regulation is not considered because in addition to this, what do they do if it's a very warm day? Do they stay in the in heat in the sun? Or do they see the cooler place? And the other way around, if it gets too cold, do they try to move to a warmer place? And this can then influence, of course, the transmission of the pathogen, the development of the pathogen, because this is all temperature dependent. So maybe in the future, we should think of the preferred temperatures um, and also measuring these temperatures on a microclimatic scale. There's a, a good example of a blue tone outbreak. Um, um, in Scandinavia, where it was modeled 
that this outbreak could not take place. Then it took, it, it took place, and then they modeled it, it again, but with these microchromatic temperatures. And then they showed that indeed it was possible to have this outbreak. So I think that's a good example of how we should look at this. Okay, so um, in my group, we've studied these temperature preference in uh, the laboratory, in the semi field, and now we're moving into the fields. Um, we do this in a thermal preference uh, setup. So it's very, uh, a very simple setup, actually. On one, so, um, uh, on one side, you cool, on the other side, you heat. There's an aluminium plate, and you create a gradient um, over this plate. Then in this box, you release uh, your mosquitoes and they can choose um, to the warm or to the cool side. We can control humidity by putting salts um, in here. So these salts balance the humidity, but we can also leave them out. We did both. And then um, what we actually found in some of the first experiments, that the mosquitoes would prefer the cool um, side. Um, and then we thought, well, can it be that it just end up at the cool side? Because it's cold and they're slow. Huh? So this is known insects, they cannot thermoregulate themselves. They have to show this behavior. And they get slow when it's very cold. So that's why we started to film this mosquitoes to show that this is the case. And here you see we um, track mosquitoes. Some of them are sitting still, sometimes they move, but in the end, more of them um, were present at the cold side. And then what is what was cool is that a uh, PhD student Alec he um, yeah, spent a lot of time um, doing the same thing for biting witches. And biting witches they are like one millimeter in size. Size so this was quite uh, difficult to get this working, um, but he managed. And interestingly, he saw the same effect. So again, he saw in a gradient from fifty to twenty five that they were spending much more time at the cooler side. Both the blood fed and the sugar fed uh, mosquitoes. So, this didn't really depend on the feeding state. And we are now also testing uh, non fed mosquitoes, but we see the same trend. We don't see uh, any difference. So, this was, um, this was very cool um, because so they rest longer at colder temperatures. Okay, then the question okay, do they also, are they slower then? Yes, they are a bit slower. But not so much slower that you can really say, okay, this affects um, their presence, or this explains their preference being on the polar side. And we did similar experiments uh, in, in ranges from 20 to 25 or 20 to 30. Then they still choose the cold side, they're much more abundant, and then there's no difference at all um, in their walking or velocity or flying velocity whatsoever. So it really seems they prefer these two sides. So there was no what we call a cold trap. Okay, so then we started to move to the semi field. Huh? So this was um, under laboratory uh, conditions. Um, we tried to, to keep things stable, but then the question is, okay, how does this work outside where there's more influence as well? Still, this was quite a, a not a very natural situation, but at least there was wind, there could be sun, and it could rain. Um, and then in this cage, we would place three boxes. One had the mean um, ambient or had an ambient temperature, one we cooled down a couple of degrees, and one we heated up a couple of degrees. Just to see, okay, where the mosquitoes go um, when they have the choice. This is, of course, not an extremely natural situation. You could do the same with plants, etc. But at least here we put influences and see this on a larger scale. And then what we see is that, especially at the high temperatures, they really prefer prefer a resting temperature that is um, much lower. Um, here, maybe even up to seven or eight degrees. Well, of course, if you think about factor competence, how fast pathogens uh, develop, then this can make a, a, a real difference. This can be the difference between the development of a virus uh, of a couple of days up to a week, for example. Uh, so I think in future we should take this into account. 
But why? Uh, one more slide, and then um, so here, um, if we see this is another graph, more or less the same, but it shows a bit better that here there was some difference between non-blood fat and blood fat. So these were sugar fat, and then we see that especially the, the blood fats they seem to um, avoid the warm and even the ambient, and they really go for the cooler boxes, especially when it's warm. And here we see the same, but the difference, uh, uh, there's, there's then no, no difference anymore between ambient and the cool. It's just the heat and the warm box that they avoided. Oh. So at high, at the outer temperatures, we see the resting place at the lower temperatures. So why would a mosquito seek a lower temperature? Well, we can talk about um, um, about how many, how fast they develop their eggs. Some mosquitoes lay more <laughs> eggs when it's a bit cooler. So these are all interesting things. Uh, but we think it has to um, do with fitness. So this is a typical curve for all insects and also for mosquitoes. There's a very nice uh, review paper on this. That um, if you look at fitness, this is a typical fitness curve. And then fitness we can define as um, as survival, we can define as offspring. Basically, it's the same curve. And then you see that this curve slowly goes up and then quickly goes down. And there's a maximum and a minimum temperature um, in which the mosquitoes are still healthy. I would say, and we see fitness is still good. Well, then you can see if you would go for the optimum temperature and it gets a <coughs> bit warmer, a couple of degrees, then it drops dramatically. So also in Drosophila, it's known that, that um, going for a bit cooler temperature can also be a safety strategy. So they avoid this optimum because there might be the danger that suddenly it, it, it gets too warm and they die. This could be one explanation for this. Like I said, next we're now moving to the field and we're doing more semi-field um, uh, experiments to see that we see the same effects later. So in general, animals, especially of course, and of course, and I'm talking about is that insects mainly prefer these temperatures that are lower than often. Okay. So I think how do mosquitoes find Well, we've heard a lot. Um, maybe we should add some compact, some some components here. Um, we've uh, made this. Uh, we didn't include visual cues here because it really depends on the mosquito species. We wanted to make this general. But of course, visual cues also play um, a role. I want to focus here on the body odors, because if we think about host preference, what's the main difference between a cow or a human or an animal and a human, um, then it's, it's the body odors and not just the, the, the carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide levels would maybe explain a bit, um, but not all of this, this, and we see that body odors are the most important part here. And then much of the human and animal odors um, on our skin are produced by the skin microbiota. So most of the volatiles, for, or most of the compounds that are released from our skin are not really volatile. For example, long chain fatty acids, they get converted into short chain fatty acids that make us smell, that make us smelly. So it's really the bacteria. If we do sports in the beginning, we do sweat, but we do, do not smell that much. It takes a while because our bacteria make us smell. Afterwards. And then this is something I can quickly go through because Marika also explained it. So um, we tested these 50 volunteers. We took their odor samples. Then, and still from the feet, because they produced a lot of odor, there were still some indications then that this body part is more attractive. But, but now we don't. In another study, I showed that this is not really true. Um, but it's, a, it's an easy place to collect a lot of odor. And then we saw that there's a group of highly attractive and poorly attractive volunteers. And then what we also saw that the group of poorly attractive volunteers had a much higher diversity of bacteria on their skin. So maybe the bacteria on your skin, a high diversity, protects you a bit from mosquito bites, and a low diversity does not. And then we also um, could identify some bacteria, Pseudomonas, that was much more abundant at these poorly attractive individuals and started to focus at highly attractive. And what was, not, what was nice, if we, when we did the same, we find very common bacteria on the skin, but then in vitro, so in these tubes, 
we saw the same effect. Sapnococcus was very attractive, and Pseudomonas was not attractive at all. So it, it confirmed both um, experiments. And then, of course, you can take older samples. You can do that from the human skin, but then you get like 300 compounds from the bacteria. It's much easier. You get like 10 or 50. So this is what we did. And that was then also developed into an older plant. What was nice was a recent paper this year, a group of James Logan, and they more or less showed um, um, the same. Um, so they also showed that some bacteria correlate to attractiveness. That was staphylococcus again, and some bacteria correlate um, to non-attractive uh, or less attractive individuals. So this was a great paper, I think. Okay, then we, for the, for the project together with Matt, um, we started to work on in vitro community models so that in the future we can easily modify some things. We can, for example, work with bioengineered bacteria, see if we produce something. And then we started to work, um, so we developed uh, what we call a sweat media. So it has these fatty acids, for example, in it. And then we added the, um, the bacteria staphylococcus on top of this. We tested that in a, in a landing assay, so we just counted the number of landings and how long. And then you see that they landed much more often, and they also spent more time on the bacteria than compared to the control. But this was just, I would say, a basic experiment. But then we started to mimic, or we tried to mimic what's happening on the skin. So we um, uh, had models with increased uh, complexity. So the first one just had the staphylococcus. And then we started to add other bacteria species. Mm -hmm. And we tried to mimic poorly attractive and highly attractive individuals. So I took from the first study the four most important bacteria um, from poorly attractive and highly attractive. And we just differed the ratio. So the, the species are the same for this one and this one. Mm -hmm. We just changed the ratios um, for the poorly attractive compared to the highly attractive. And then we got a nice result um, because if we just would apply, have the, the, the single bacteria, then it would be um, attractive. And then the attractiveness lowered when we increased complexity. So complex models were less attractive uh, to mosquitoes than the symptom models. So is this this diversity? Well, we do not know for sure, um, but it could be. And then, um, secondly, we could also reflect this highly attractive individual um, compared to this poorly attractive individual just with these four species of bacteria just changing the ratio. What was interesting is when we um, put the bacteria on the plate separately so they could not compete, then the whole effect was gone. So we mixed the bacteria on the plate and then we saw these nice effects. When we put them on separately, then the effect was gone. So it seems competition matter. We did the volatile analysis, um, and then also the blend seemed to increase with increase in complexity. So this was a collaboration with, with um, ETH, uh, where we did volatile collections of all these bacteria. Okay, then the question is, okay, how could we use this? And can we maybe think of a way to use probiotics? I mean, we are using probiotics for our gut now to, to solve things. Could we even use probiotics maybe on the skin? Maybe not of humans, but maybe of animals, for example. Um, so could we just increase the number of repellent bacteria? An advantage would be that these only work for one day. Well, what if you would apply bacteria? They will stay for longer, um, up to two weeks, um, and maybe they keep producing repellents. There are already studies, for example, with cancer patients that have a very rash skin, and they get supplemented uh, bacteria, and this works very well. I'm not saying that we will use this in the future, but as a, as a, as a, as a theory. Or can we increase diversity, which I think in general is often a good thing. Um, or maybe even bioengineer microbes. So we just finished a project where we, where we tried this and had some additional, some um, initial hints that yes, this could also work. But I will want to focus on uh, another study where we try to add repellent bacteria. And we add these repellent bacteria to repel biting leeches. So just as a reminder, so biting leeches are these very small insects, they are a nuisance, um, they cause this summer eczema in horses. So especially horse owners, the horses are very expensive uh, animals. And they really don't like this and put these uh, horses often in these, these suits to protect them. 
And then, of course, they are vector of, um, for example, blue zone virus, small and virus, and the more system sequence. So what did we do? Um, we sampled um, sheep. We took their bacterial sample. We took their odor sample to determine, okay, are they then more or less attractive? And can we identify bacteria that make these sheep less attractive? Well, here you see some first results um, on uh, the effect of farm, body size, and breeds on the, on the composition. And now, what we've been doing, we now uh, are working in a wide tube where we release the vitamins on one side. Then they have the choice um, between our bacteria and the control, or between our odor, from, between the odor of the sheep and the control, to see, okay, can we identify bacteria that may be interesting to work as a rebalanced bacteria? This is not the best rebalanced test, um, but all our initial studies we do in here. And then, um, this um, is a very nice result of last week that we now have some bacteria that could be interesting as rebound bacteria to be applied to the skin. Last slide. <laughs> and then, uh, so here you see what we're now planning to do. Now that we have identified these rebound bacteria, we need to do so, uh, a couple of more tests. We want to treat one ear of, of the sheep with these repellent bacteria and the other with the control, and then see can we um, prevent biting or biting niches. So can this be a treatment of these sheep? Because at the moment, there's not such a good treatment. Uh, vaccination is not always possible, and repellents often don't work or work where well. And then we hope it lasts for longer than just a normal repellent. Well, many people to thank. But I've listed them, many of them, but I hope all of them over. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned uh, that uh, Sigmonis is more abundant in the core of attractive individuals. Yeah. You referred to Sigmonis origin, I said, because that's a pathogen. Yes, but uh, what is interesting is that many of the uh, bacteria of our skin are at least potentially pathogenic. Sure, but you, you wouldn't want to introduce... <laughs> no, no. So this one, I mean, that was also not one of the five A, B, C, D, E bacteria. Huh? So all these uh, bacteria, for example, for the sheep that we screened, indeed also um, um, uh, had to be non-pathogenic, even uh, uh, even though they often occur on the sheep anyway, or on our, uh, on our skin, for example. Most people have pseudomonas you know, so most of us have Staphylococcus aureus, which are uh, pathogenic bacteria. But yes, of course, we would never select them for uh, for studies. Yes. And even then, we need to monitor what happens exactly then if right? we apply these bacteria. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Very nice. Um, I was when you presented the gradient uh, results that we prefer the cooler parts of the gradient. Yeah. Um, have you checked the temporal component of this? So whether they move they, they, in a daily way through the gradient. We, yeah. we have done experiments like that in environments, and we see that they have very clear preferences, like you've seen. But we also see that it, it is they, uh, there is a daily cycle of movement in the gradient, so some kind of component that uh, they, they, they don't, they, this is not a, a permanent choice. Yeah, yeah, very good suggestion. And yes, we did experiments first always over 24 hours, mm -hmm. but then we saw it, there was no difference. And this, I think, is in the, in the first uh, paper that we didn't see a difference between 15 minutes and 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So they stayed. However, then in the, in the box studies, we did see some differences, uh, but there we didn't, um, we had the feeling it was more because the temperature was increasing over the day than that it was really an effect of being the day uh, and, and, and the daily change. Um, because we, um, we, look, we used TLM to look at the, at the effects. And then of course there was a high correlation, but the effect of the temperature was much stronger. Uh, so I understood you like um, when you had the mixture of bacteria on the face, you could by manipulating the ratio, making them attractive and non-attractive. 
less attractive, I can say. Because we always say that no one is not attracted at all. Everyone, if they stick their arm in our cage of mosquitoes, they will be bitten. Okay. Um, it's but just that someone more attractive. But if you had them single, there was no clear negative or positive effect on each of them. There, yes, there was. For example, in that mix, there was Staphylococcus and Pseudomonas, and then Staphylococcus was attractive, but Pseudomonas was not. Um, but it could not explain all the effects that we saw, so it was not that Pseudomonas just reduced it. Did you measure the emission of volatile and zinc colonies? You could imagine that this is all about bacterial competition. Yes, yes, so we did measure the, the, the volatiles, and I have no time to, to present this. Um, the problem is that the results are very difficult to interpret because there are so many compounds and the ratios change um, so much that it's very uh, quite difficult to find a clear pattern so we could identify some bacteria that we think okay these cause attractiveness because we always find them in higher abundance in these attractive ones um, but it's difficult to say what exactly happens what we did see is that um, there's an increase in complexity and maybe that makes these complex models less attractive because it's more difficult for the mosquito to find or to sense the right compounds. Uh, but this is more a theory than we could, uh, that we could really just confirm this. So you're <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me here. I remember attending a very similar conference a few years ago when I was doing my PhD. So I have to say it's it's quite a privilege to be back and actually be presenting some of the data that I collected during my PhD. So I hope you will enjoy it as much as I enjoyed my PhD, which was uh, sometimes I really did enjoy it, sometimes I hated it. So um, <laughs> so yes, the presentation is Houston. The mosquito has landed. Why is that? Well. Um, after a whole day of talking about mosquitoes and all the diseases that they cause and how we can prevent them, I'm not going to bore you about all the methods that we can use to prevent mosquitoes, but uh, I will mention that as uh, the insecticide resistance trait is uh, spreading across mosquito population, we really need to think about alternative methods that we could use alongside the current ones so that we can better tackle the mosquito problem. And these alternative methods could be traps um, or could also be other devices that could deliver lethal <laughs> substances, for example. But what they have in common is the fact that traps or these devices will need the mosquito to get very close to the device to actually be caught or to actually be in contact with the surface so that it will acquire the legal substance. So we really need to better understand um, the short range and the landing behavior of the mosquitoes. And I felt that a lot of work have, has been done on the long range attraction, but there was really something that was lacking on the landing thing. So what drives mosquitoes to really land on you, right? So that's why I decided to look into that with my PhD. And um, for the very first experiment, I uh, wanted to quantify different host associated cues and see what was their effect in driving landing. So to do that, I used a large wind tunnel and I released the mosquitoes on the upwind side of the wind tunnel. On the downwind side, I positioned the trap and the trap um, was either transparent or black because I wanted to test the visual cue. The surface of the trap was either at room temperature, human body uh, temperature, or 45 degrees, which I thought was quite hot for a mosquito. So thermal cue was also tested. And of course, I also either present all body odor, um, sorry, body odor, <coughs> CO2, or um, the host odor was absent. So I tested all these different cues singularly, but also in combination, which gave a total of 12 different treatments um, with all the possible combinations. And for every replicate, I counted how many mosquitoes were landed on my target. 
right? So these are the results for that part over there. And the bars indicate the mean number of mosquitoes that I recovered on each, each trap. And the, the solid color bars indicate the uh, traps where the body odor and the state <coughs> was present. And the striped bars indicate the traps where the host cube, uh, the host odor was absent. And as you can see, you can agree with me that um, clearly uh, host odor did uh, play a major role in, in driving the landing, right? Um, so, yes, so host odor is crucial. However, if we look at this bar over here, which is at room temperature and it's also transparent, we see that although mosquitoes are landing, they're not landing as much when, as in when other host cues are also presenting. So these mosquitoes over here were activated, host odor was present, but there was no other host cue, which led me to think that, of course, host odor is important, and it's mostly because it activates mosquitoes and it drives them to, land, to, um, to fly a lot, uh, but it's not actually a key mediator of the landing, which makes sense, right? Because mosquitoes will actually need other cues to initiate landing because the whole area around the body will have body odor, so they will need other cues. Perfect. So the other thing that this graph is telling us is that if we look at uh, this green bar over here and this black bar and this black bar over here, we can see that um, in this case the um, odor is present and the temperature is uh, human temperature, so it's quite nice. But um, the addition of the visual cue, so having the black target, did not actually um, drive more mosquitoes to land compared to the transparent surface, meaning that um, the presence, so host odor is crucial. So without host odor, mosquitoes are not flying. But given that you're giving host odor, adding one, um, one other cue or adding two cues doesn't make much of a difference. So mosquitoes are able to bypass the absence of one cue if other sufficient cues are given, which is something very much related to what the uh, previous presenters were saying. So landing behavior is very complex and can be very flexible depending on the cues that you're giving the mosquitoes. And they're able to modify that behavior depending on the environment and the cues that you're giving to them. Another interesting point is that I was expecting for no mosquitoes landing over here. However, we didn't find any difference at 45 degrees or 35 degrees. So we didn't find any avoidance behavior for high temperatures. <clears throat> Perhaps the most important results of the first experiment were that we were able to actually quantify the effect of the landing. And I would like to stress over here, the landing phase. So we're not measuring the attraction, we're measuring the landing behavior. Um, and with that, we were able then to predict what will have been the effect of the different cues when we're presented together, if they're effect was just given by a simple combination, simple addition of their singular effects. So for example, over here, we predicted that odor plus thermal will give this much landings. However, if we look at the recorded effects of so the real number of mosquitoes that we caught, we saw that um, they actually we got a lot more mosquitoes. And when you run the stats in it, you find that uh, there is actually a synergistic interaction between the cues. And you find that when all the three cues are presented together, and also when thermal and odor are presented together. So odor is crucial, thermal is also very important to drive landing. Visual also, uh, the visibility plays a role when combined with the other two. Uh, to and that took me 
to conclude that host order is crucial. The three host associated stimuli when presented together were having a crucial effect. And of course, they interacted in a synergistic manner, which from an application point of view means that it's actually very useful because if you want to get more mosquitoes attracted and landing on a device or a trap, you could use the addition of one cube to increase the addition, uh, to increase the response of the mosquitoes to the other cubes. From a neurobiological perspective, it's also super interesting because it means that landing is a very complex behavior and they can flexibly modify that behavior, they can adapt the response depending on the different stimuli that they receive. So there is definitely some kind of integration at that central uh, level. Which took me to the second experiment. So in this case, I said, oh, all right, so we're having the same three cues. So all right, the, the target is heated. It's in present of body odor and um, it's, uh, it's, it's visible. So what will it happen if we position the traps in different ways? Or what will happen if we have traps in different sizes? So I had the same setup. In this case, we also recorded the mosquitoes so that we were able to see their uh, approaching flights. And we studied the size and the spatial orientation intended as vertical targets or horizontal targets. And we did this in a choice assay presenting two traps at the same time. And then we also wanted to see what was the threshold of the size of the, um, of the heated area that needed to present the thermal cube in order to drive landing. So we had a positive control with all the uh, target area heated, a negative control where no area was heated, and then a range of different heated areas in between. And in this case, we actually just had, for this last experiment, we only had one target at a time. And because of time constraints, I really tried to squeeze in my whole PhD into this presentation. So for time constraints, I will only cover the size and the size of the heated area, but the paper is hopefully coming out soon. So please be on the lookout for that. Um, but, but there we go. So this is for the size, uh, yeah, for the size of the target. So we see that when uh, large targets are presented together with large targets, so there is no competition, they normally catch more mosquitoes than the small targets when small targets are presented alongside small targets. So clearly large targets catch more mosquitoes. And very interestingly, when large targets are presented alongside small targets, so there is that kind of competition, large targets catch way more mosquitoes, um, or as in Scientifically, you will say significantly more mosquitoes than uh, small targets. So um, over here, it looks like it's quite striking. Large targets uh, perform better, which is not a surprise because they also have a larger surface, so they have more chances to catch a mosquito, right? But if we look at the density intended as the number of mosquitoes caught per centimeter square, we actually saw that small surfaces caught three times more mosquitoes per centimeter square, meaning that they are somehow more efficient. Now, if we look at the flight analysis, so we wanted to look at the visit, number of visitations, so how many times mosquitoes approach the target. We see that in the competitive assay, small uh, targets are visited less compared to large targets which reinforce the fact that large targets are preferred. But at the same time, if we look at the non-competitive assays, so the number of visits of the small targets um, compared to the large number of visits on the large targets when they're not competing, there is no real difference. Meaning that mosquitoes visit small targets exactly in the same amount of times that they visit large targets. So, Small targets are still very much attractive to mosquitoes, but they're just not catching as many, so they're probably lacking another cue. 
And this is the same for other uh, flight parameters. So the amount of time that mosquitoes spent flying around the target or the flight distance that mosquitoes covered around the target. And not surprisingly, the tracks around the small targets were also more convoluted, which goes back to the idea that mosquitoes approached the small target and then started hoovering around that small target. So they visited more, more tracks more convoluted and flew back again. So for the size of the heated area, our data showed a strong um, division where the positive control caught the same amount of mosquitoes as the target that was only halfway heated, um, while all of the other treatments clustered together with the negative control. Meaning that basically one could be able to just heat half of the surface of the trap or the device, and will uh, still get the same amount of mosquitoes as if it, the whole surface was heated. And this is a, um, it has quite a, a lot of implications from the application point of view because, so heat is one of the cues that cause the most to produce in the field and being able to half the area that you need to produce that cue without altering the performance of the trap or the device will actually make a big, a big impact in the cost performance uh, of the track. From a neurobiological perspective, though, um, it's also very important because it indicates that it's not only the presence or absence of a cue, but it's also other aspects of the cue that are playing a role in driving the landing. So it's not only is there a cue there, yes or no, but is it how it's there, what's the temperature, what size it's, it's covering, etc. So all that kind of information is integrated at a central uh, level in mosquitoes. And if we look at the flag analysis, we saw that uh, negative control targets, so unheated targets, um, were more visited compared to the positive control targets, um, and they were absolutely um, very much visited by mosquitoes, which kind of reiterates the fact that um, the negative control target, so a black target in presence of host odor, is still attracting mosquitoes, it's just not driving mosquitoes to land on the surface. So it's very nice because it indicates that to do a behavioral study, you really need to look at the different parts of the behavior, because if you end up looking just at the end point, for example, are they landing, yes or no, you're, you might be missing out important information about the attractiveness of, of the surface. So that was really important. Um, yeah, so to conclude for this experiment, the size does play a role in elusive landing, with larger surfaces being more suitable for mass wrapping possibly because they catch more mosquitoes. Small surfaces are more efficient in terms of density, so for small sampling projects there might be uh, better. Small surfaces remain attractive, but they are outcompeted by large targets, which indicates that it's very important to um, Look at the surrounding, wherever you're positioning your device or your target or your trap, because other things that are in the environment might influence the catching. And the size of the heated area plays a major role, and helping the heated area could reduce the cost of the trap without actually altering the performance. And of course, it's important to have full behavioral studies rather than just study an end point because otherwise you might you might be missing out some important information. All right, so for the third experiment, I thought going back to the first one where mosquitoes were landing in equal manner on um, temperature on, on surfaces at body temperature and surfaces at 45 degrees, so quite hot temperatures, I thought, all right, they might be landing. But what are they doing next? Are they still feeding? So let's look at the post landing behavior. So that made me spend my, an entire summer basically staring at mosquitoes, 
where I had the, the one individual mosquito in a cage with a, a blood feeder, and the feeder was set at different temperatures, and I, um, I basically recorded all these different behaviors, so the landing, the foraging, the probing, feeding, etc. And I recorded not only if those behaviors were happening, yes or no, but also how many times, for how long, and at what, po uh, what point of their behavioral chain was that occurring. After the mosquitoes were kept in the cage for 10 minutes and being stared by me, I uh, put them in individual vials, kept them uh, for two weeks, recorded their open position rate, survival rate, I quantify how much blood they had ingested, <coughs> and I um, I also did a side project where I recorded the different quality of the blood at these different temperatures. I've also repeated the experiment, but instead of keeping the mosquito, I basically dissected it, kept this, the head separate from the bodies, and I am in the process of doing a transcriptomic analysis on that data. So the data on the behavioral part is super large. So I had to squeeze it all in in one slide. So again, there is so much more that I can tell you. Please do comment and chat with me if, if you're interested. But um, the main point is that if we look at the positive control, 36 degrees, mosquitoes land on the target and they start the foraging behavior, which is the sensing and the probing, they don't spend much time doing it, and they normally uh, start feeding straight away after a few probings, and they feed to repletion, after which they just fly away and they just stay on the cage. Surprisingly, their behavior is very uh, much the same when fed that um, high fever temperatures at 42 degrees, there is not much difference, um, which is um, surprising. However, their behavior is radically different when you present them with the two different extreme temperatures. So at 30 degrees, mosquitoes land on the, on the, the feeder and then they start foraging, which is most mostly uh, sensing. So with their palpi, they just touch the, the feeder surface and they do it for a long period of time. Sometimes they fly away, sometimes they um, start feeding. But if they do start feeding, not always take, that takes them to full rotation. So most of the time they just partially feeding. If we look at the 48 degrees, we see that mosquitoes land and then what I will say fiercely start probing. So they, they land on the surface, but they don't lose any time. They just start probing uh, quite aggressively. Um, normally don't start the feeding part and they just fly away and they come back to the feeder. So that is why we have more landings, but for a very short period of time, and they probe a lot. If we look at the number of mosquitoes that actually end up feeding, non surprisingly, at 36 degrees is um, the, the optimal temperature. Um, similarly, at 42 degrees, we have most of the mosquitoes feeding uh, fully and just a few feeding partially. That is not the same with mosquitoes feeding at 30 degrees. Um, on blood at 30 degrees because most of the mosquito well most of the mosquitoes still fully feed but there is a big chunk that only partially feeds and a big chunk that don't feed at all and at 48 degrees most of the mosquitoes don't feed which is not surprisingly but it's very to me it was astonishing seeing that even just eight mosquitoes fed at blood at 48 degrees which if you think about it is very very hot. So the fact that mosquitoes feed at 48 degrees was um, was quite surprising. And although they normally just feed uh, just partially, there are a few individuals that went on. There were a few individuals that went on and fed fully. 
So I'm not going to tell you anything about the composition. I'm just going to say that uh, we found no difference in the mortality. So even for those mosquitoes that fed at 48 degrees, they survived and they, uh, they were just fine. Uh, we didn't find any difference in the volume of the blood that they had imbibed. And that, together with the feeding speed, uh, showed that uh, that together with the time that they took to feed showed that there wasn't a really um, a, an increase in the feeding speed, but um, more, more data is needed to validate this. So to conclude, temperature plays a role in the post-landing behavior and mosquitoes showed equal preference for blood at normal uh, temperature and high fever temperature. It is surprisingly that mosquitoes were able to survive after imbibing blood at 48 degrees, which shows a great plasticity and a lot of um, uh, different mechanisms that come into play. And they had similar feeding speed. And this is the last slide. <laughs> so, but what to remember? Well, the take home messages are the synergistic interactions in driving landing and the really the, the need of studying the landing and the post-landing phase. Most of the studies have focused on the pre-landing and the attraction, but I really feel that there is a need to study uh, the landing phase and all the different complex interactions that cues might um, uh, might have. So heat cue is a key mediator in, la in driving landing, but also post landing. And it's not just the presence or absence, but it's also the size of the heat cue and the magnitude intended as what is the real temperature that you're offering them. And I feel that I'm preaching to the choir when I say that we need more studies that encompass multiple aspects and not just uh, one endpoint because the behavioral the behavior of mosquitoes is quite complex, so you need to find the whole uh, the whole story. And with that, I thank you. I use both, and when I saw your slides, I, I just completely agreed with it. Um, I see that if you use parafilm, if you are you know, basically mosquitoes are more reluctant to feed on, on the feeder. And uh, what I ended up doing whenever I had to use the parafilm was just uh, put some moist on it, so uh, just tapping water around it. But of course, it depends for how long you leave it, because if you leave it for a long time, then it dries out and it's exactly the same. And I, I used, for the other uh, part, I used solstice skin. So it permeates. Uh, so all the temperature experiments, so you do the detailed analysis, that was all done with a lot of temperature. Yes, that was, uh, it's solstice skin. <laughs> yeah. oh. Common than increasing. Um, we were running some uh, tests with RAS wall spray to my pressure, <coughs> and we couldn't understand that the mosquitoes were not sitting on the wall. And we tried to analyze function of the uh, tech design, we thought maybe it was really better than the tech design. We got told it was really great. Mm -hmm. And then we found out that in the, in the mornings, the same walls would be okay. So the afternoon we would not when we measure the temperature on the wall. So when the when the sun was heating the wall, the mosquitoes would not sit on the wall, and you got false low values of or impact on the insecticide. So very practical because most people once they feel they were on the whole day. Mm -hmm. yeah, very valid very yeah. yeah, very valid point. Yeah. And there is a very brief question here now. Yeah, two questions from Julia Jacob online. Could increase in temperature result in an increased volatility of your odor and landing with increase in temperature? 
Uh, yes, so for, for the first part, um, the temperature of the body definitely does uh, impact. Even if you think about just convection currents, how convection currents move uh, body odor from your body. So temperature might play a role in uh, convecting or like transporting different uh, uh, different body odors. So it, it might be it might be that. In my experiment, though, I presented mosquitoes. Um, so the, the target was here, and the body so the, the host odor was even close to the trap, but not on the trap itself. So it was a constant. Um, uh, distribution of, of the body odor and it wasn't altered by um, by the temperature. And the second question, I don't remember what it was. So that was the first. And the second is, was there a difference on how much they were diuresing to cool off at high temperature? Um, so, <laughs> so uh, I didn't report that, uh, but um, that is something that I would like to do. So there is definitely uh, some potential uh, in trying to, to understand how are they able to cope with such a high temperature. So even if we think only about 42 degrees, which is high, temp uh, high fever temperature, it's, it's very hot for mosquitoes. So they might be using different mechanisms and so the plan that I have right now is to do the transcriptomic analysis and pairing that with possibly some thermal uh, imaging of the mosquito while it's in white the blood. But for that, I um, yeah, I, I need um, time, <laughs> collaborations, money. <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Marcelo and David for organizing this wonderful meeting. Thank you, guys. You have done a wonderful job. Thank you very much. So, uh, you know, I am originally from Argentina. And in Argentina, we have a serious sanitary problem, uh, which is the Chagas disease. Um, the vectors of the Chagas disease are these guys, uh, the Chatumin insects, we are also known as kissing bugs. There are 130 species and all of them are able to uh, transmit the disease. But I'm working with Rodmus prolixus. These bugs live in close contact with humans. They live in rural areas, inside human, human dwellings and in animal pens. The Chagas disease is distributed all along Latin America, is endemic in Latin America, and is affecting 10 million people. Um, the, age, the causative agent of the Chagas disease is the Trypanosoma cruzi. The Trypanosoma cruzi is deposited in the feces of these uh, bugs while, while they are feeding on a host. And when the host grabs um, the injury caused by the bite, the parasites enter into that system. In the past, we have studied how these animals find us in time and space. We know that they uh, reach us following um, chemical and physical cues. Uh, among the chemical cues, uh, they use CO2, lactic acid, fat, uh, short change fatty acid. This is a long distance, but when, when they are close, um, it is mainly the thermal cells and the, and the humidity emitted by the host that allow them to do the final approach. But once they uh, have greeted the host, what do they do? Well, they have um, made a decision whether they will bite or not, whether they will eat or not on the host. So, in order to make these decisions, these animals use the taste cells. Um, we use all we use the taste cells to make predictions about the quality of a food source. So that this um, sensory modality signals the presence of nutritious food, but also signals the presence of um, toxic food. 
And there are two moments where the taste cells become very important to make this decision. When the animal uh, explore the surface of the host skin, and when it takes it takes a sip of blood and it says the blood internally. Okay, so when the animal explores the host skin, they will use external structure, boosted or cilia that are located in the tarsi and in the antennae. Particularly in the antennae, uh, we have found or identified gustatory sonsilla, which have gustatory receptor neurons that are sensitive to um, different gustatory stimuli that include salts and bitter compounds like caffeine and quinine. So when animals detect caffeine or quinine, for example, the um, biting and feeding is prevented. Also, when they detect oops, well, um, high amounts of salts, the, the biting and feeding behavior is prevented. And we have identified the, the genes that detect um, high soil concentration and illicit feeding avoidance. But once, uh, but if they do not find any negative stimuli over the host in, they will take a sip of blood and they will analyze what they are ingesting um, to internal organs that are located in the pharynx. So we wonder where and how incoming blood is evaluated. And there are very few studies of the pharyngeal internal and gustatory organs in insects because they are very inaccessible for neurophysiological studies. <coughs> so in this um, talk, in this work, we characterize this internal organ. We look for gustatory sensilla, gustatory receptor neurons. We look for all the gustatory or some gustatory stimuli that trigger feeling acceptance or feeling avoidance. We also look for the brain centers where the gustatory information is processed and also search for the genes that could be involved in feeling behavior. So this is a kissing bug. Uh, this is the proboscis. The, here comes the, uh, the blood. And we look at here where this pharyngeal organ must be. So we, if we open a window in this part of the head, we will see the pharynx. And if we open also <coughs> a hole in the pharynx, we will find eight costatory sancilla, which are here, that are bathed with the incoming blood. We say that they are a gustatory sancilla because they have a pore and teeth. So we uh, have a closer look to this part of the head of the pharyngeal organ to see this sancilla in more detail. This is the pharynx. And here we have the sancilla, the gustatory sancilla. And inside we have dendrites that reach um, sensory bodies here, or sense bodies. So this is where the um, gustatory information present in the blood must be analyzed. But what are those gustatory stimuli that these bats perceives while they are feeding. So here we have a kissing bat, uh, which is feeding on a mouse. This is the promosis, the then and the rest of the body. And I will let you show you first how it feeds. I don't know if you can, the video is still like that. Well, it doesn't matter. I I wanted to show you that when no, okay, it doesn't matter. Well, when this bag starts feeding, um, uh, the blood the blood comes. Uh, 
comes through the pro process and reaches the, the, the science. And it does it in a precise way, you know, this pumping, because they have big muscles in the head. Okay, so we are able to record the activity of these vessels while the animal is feeding. So we have an artificial feeder here. We have a bag um, in close contact with the artificial feeder. This is the membrane the animal can pierce easily. The animal is connected uh, to an amplifier with a wire, and there is a second electrode inside the solution. So when the animal pierces the membrane, the circuit uh, is closed, and we can measure the activity of these muscles uh, whenever we offer an appetitive or an aversive solution. So this is the sort of recordings we have when we uh, offer them an appetitive solution composed by ATP and sodium chloride, which are the main power stimulants of these animals. So the animal bites, and there, there is a proving phase, which is characterized by irregular pumpings, okay? And then the animal decides to start the true ingestion. So the peaks are quite regular, okay? And each peak represents uh, a uh, pumping event, okay? But however, when we give them an aversive solution, in this case, it is caffeine, which is bitter for us. The, the feeding pattern changed completely. So we have uh, many insertions and withdrawal of the proboscis in the feeder. There are numerous also proving phases and very little ingestion. This also happens with, uh, with other bitter compounds like vitamin, barberine, and salicin. But then we wanted to examine it, um, or examine in close uh, detail the effect of salts in feeding behavior because salts produce opposite behaviors depending on the concentration. So low sum concentrations uh, elicit feeding acceptance and uh, like high concentrations of salt to the contrary. And this is true for all animals studied so far. And uh, we found similar results for both views. You know, uh, there is a salt concentration which is preferred and the feeding pattern is regular. This concentration is uh, equivalent to the concentration of salts we have. In the, in, the, in the plasma. So when this concentration of salts is increased, the animals show an, an, aversity, an aversive feeding pattern. However, when there is no salt, animals do not feed neither, but the feeding pattern is different. So the animals um, do not uh, take out the proposal, they uh, do regular pumpings, but a very low frequency, like, like if there were something continuous in, in presence of no salt. But here we wonder how these animals could discriminate uh, between uh, low salt concentration and high salt concentration. In other words, how can I explain this balance change? And here where it comes uh, in the scene, the nitric oxide. The nitric oxide is a neuromodulator of many different sensory uh, systems. Um, it affects also the um, response of gustatory neurons in insects. So we wonder whether the nitric oxide could be involved in this change of balance. So, uh, the nitric oxide, when it is produced inside sensory cells, it activates a soluble vanillate cyclase, which in turn uh, produces cyclic uh, GMP. So we uh, stimulate this uh, pathway by using pharmacological agents, or we inhibit it. While we offer a uh, different feeding uh, solution, appetitive offset solution or aversive offset solution. So here we have the feeding pattern uh, triggered by both solutions. So we ask what would happen if we offer animals an appetitive low salt solution while at the same time we uh, stimulate this pathway. And when we do that, We observe that an appetitive salt solution now turns to aversive. 
when we are stimulate when we decrease this pathway, even the animals are scavenger of NO. And we offer an aversive high salt solution. Now we observe that an aversive salt solution turns to a positive. So this is why we think the uh, anode pathway could be involved in this balance change. So um, going back to the gustatory receptor neurons in the parietal um, organ, we wonder which would be uh, those uh, stimuli uh, that are relevant for behavior, whether these neurons are able also to detect them. So we carried out electrophysiological recordings here um, by placing an electrode in the pharyngeal organ and an orange and, and we stimulate uh, we stimulated the animals with different um, gustatory stimuli, including ATP. <coughs> and we observe for the ATP that uh, there are neurons that are firing. Pharyngeal neurons also are responsive to the other um, important uh, gustatory stimuli, including uh, sodium chloride and caffeine. Then we ask where these neurons project in the brain. So uh, we carried out atrograde backfills um, by using rhodamine dextran, and we trace these neurons up to the brain, we uh, found that they, they arise mainly in the esophageal ganglion, and some neurons continue to the proterastic ganglion. So the esophageal ganglion must be the gustatory or the primary gustatory center for um, these neurons or these things. So what are the two <coughs> families that are expressed in the lung and the pharyngeal organ was the next question. So we carried out RNA sequencing of the pharyngeal organ, this tiny, tiny, tiny uh, tissue. We did the transcriptome <coughs> of this organ and we found out many different uh, genes, genes families. Many of them have been related to the feeding processes in these bags and in others. We also found chemosensory receptors, including gustatory receptors, anotropic receptors, big pocket channels, um, transient receptor prevention channel, all the binding proteins, uh, and also opsins. And we first we became interested in these three um, genes, um, and we examined, uh, we examined whether they would be involved in the in, in feeding decisions. First, we um, look for the um, we were interested in a trip A1 because they have been associated with uh, chemical laboratory responses among other functions. And when we stimulate uh, or we offer animals with different agonies of the trip A1 uh, in the artificial feeding, we observe that uh, feeding is prevented when compared with an appetitive solution. Then we um, examine the, the, the role of these two PPKs in, in, in feeding because these genes have been associated with cell detection in these imbalance. So we carried out uh, RNA experiments in order to uh, reduce the expression of them while we offer uh, to the animal solutions, um, low salt appetitive solutions. So the, the, the idea is if we knock down the expression of these genes and they are involved in salt detection, they will not feed on uh, low salt appetitive solutions. So we had four groups, intergroups, uh, control of injection, and the two uh, um, uh, groups against uh, the, 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 these genes that we are going to study. We check that the expression of both have uh, Used and we did the uh, um, behavioral experiment. So, this is the normal response to intact to control animals to real cell solution. This is an appetitive feeding pattern. And then, when we uh, knock down the expression of this gene, um, the change the pattern change completely. Um, animals do not feed and they pump, they do pumpings at a very low frequency. 
in a similar way that did anim intact animals exposed to no salt solutions. So this, uh, this PPK is involved in salt detections. So to summarize, um, I have started asking where and how feeding decisions occur in these animals. And I showed you the pharyngeal organ that is composed by gustatory sancilla that are located here in the, in the, in the uh, this anterior part of the pharynx. This uh, sancilla house gustatory receptor neurons that are responsive to uh, relevant gustatory stimuli, which express relevant genes, some of them uh, involved in uh, the detection of relevant stimuli. The, um, this information coming from gustatory receptor neurons, which the subesophageal ganglion, when the, the information is processed, and a message could be sent probably to the muscles uh, in the head to elicit an appropriate behavior whether they will eat or not. So that is all. Uh, this is the people of my lab. I would like to uh, acknowledge and all the people that participate in this project and the funding agencies. And uh, thank you for your attention. In addition to the pharyngeal, in addition to the pharyngeal uh, GRN, do they have like uh, GRNs like the, you know, the yeah, they have, No, no, we didn't. We didn't find all the um, GRNs any gustatory sancilla in the proboscis. Yeah. yeah, I'm talking about the labium or the stylus. And the stylus neither. There are mechanosensory uh, receptors in the stylus, but there are no, there are no uh, dose mm -hmm. mm -hmm. no. That's different, like, no yes. no. yes. It is different, yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, it seems that only on our the parents, the, the evaluation of what. <clears throat> How do the manipulations of nitric oxide signaling impact the GRN responses? Sorry. How do the manipulations of nitric oxide signaling impact the GRN responses? I don't know. My, my idea, or oh, it's not important, I'm a hypothesis, is that uh, while the GRNs are uh, made with normal sodium, uh, they trigger the, a normal appetitive response. But whenever the, um, the sodium chloride increases in the hemolymph, um, the uh, reservoirs of calcium increase. I mean, there is a lot of calcium signaling uh, is, uh, what is happening. And this increase in calcium triggers the synthesis of NO internally. And in turn, it is produced the cyclic energy of E, which could modulate uh, the response of the neuron. But it could be different. I mean, in Drosophila, uh, there are two neurons that one signals a low salt and the other high salt. It would be interesting to test in another model also if this is true. Um, when, uh, when they taste the host and they don't like it, do they change host or they try again to buy it somewhere else? They try, they try and try and try. Oh, yes, <laughs> they do. Yes, they they do for um, many many minutes. They try uh, several times. That's why they they um, they pierce the, the membrane and they withdraw the proboscis and do it and do it once and once. So when they bite the humans, uh, uh, do you feel that they are biting you? No. So they, they release some sort of yes, anesthetic. Yes, okay. Exactly. So it's so like an anesthetic that you don't feel the, the, mm -hmm. the bite. Yes. Okay. And they mostly um, um, 
uh, light uh, in, the, in, in the face or in, 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 in the places where the, the, the skin is uh, uncovered. So when yeah, so that's why they are called kissing bugs. So, uh, no? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 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 No, in all Latin America. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you can visit Latin America. <laughs> 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 yeah. well, it happens in rural areas that if you go to a city, you will not have it. <laughs> 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 Next question for Shah. Uh, this is probably a naive question, but uh, we're all going to get blood groups and we're bleeding on blood. Which we are assuming we keep very good regulation of the amount of salt we have in our blood. Can you comment on why we would be such a sensitive for high and low salt concentration in red R? Yeah, I don't know. They they even um do they are able, um, able to detect beta compounds, but there are no beaters in the in the in blood or even in the skin, but they, they are able to to, to detect it. I don't know. I don't know how. Uh, yes. Can I comment on that? Yes. We are getting more and more information suggesting that they are able to, to um, eat uh, human chromatin. So it could change our way of yeah, yeah. If we think that they could take wrong email. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They're wrong email, but the they um, uh those no up to a point two molar. I'm thinking on beta Ah, beta compounds, mm -hmm. yes, but for salts, uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. The beta compounds are usually alkaloids. So having an alkaloid, did you try other alkaloids? As alkaloids, we tried no, just uh, just just these two. No. But yes, They're typically here. Yeah, for us. No? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> We test um no we test uh, different compounds but not more than those alkaloids yeah you know? no yeah but would be interested yes, yeah very interesting how large are the families of GRs and IRs in mixables compared to mosquitoes and flies ah yeah well you you know that. Uh, the GRs are about twenty eight in the pharynx and in the antenna I don't remember. Uh, the genome is 20, 20. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And the IR 33. And the IR 33, and the, um, what else? Trim are about 14. And, yeah. and, uh, and what else? Um, yeah, big pocket uh, channels are about 10. Uh, 10. And how many GRNs are in each one of these eight? How many uh, GRNs? And how many GRNs are in each one of these eight since so? No, we don't know, but um, there must be uh, many because when we do uh, electrophysiology, um, we we couldn't be able to do spike sorting because of the amount of uh, the neurons fired. Um, we still don't know. Yeah. yeah, but just anatomically, from just looking at uh, the sections in the gel. The section. Yeah. Yeah, so it's hard to tell from what your physiology, but how about from morphology? And from morphology, we still don't know. We, we need to, to get deeper on that. Right? So we still don't know. Okay. I'm curious about um, your, what's your opinion on, on the salt, uh, the PPKs that detect salt in these neurons? Why are they different from the ones that detect salt in, in, the, antenna? in, the, antenna? I mean, in the antenna? The neurons require. Uh, I mean, both have an effect if you not them down, right? Yes, this was uh, quite different for the pharyngeal organ. Yes, in the antenna uh, to detect high salt concentration, two two PBKs are necessary, and not in the pharyngeal organ. Uh, I don't know. Yes, yeah, it's curious. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you.